Um, um, okay, um, I, I think uh, I think let's start. Um, just yeah, maybe uh, people will still be coming in because I think the, there's a bit of a line with picking up the badges and stuff, and it's hard to find. Um, um, but but yeah, but it's a it's a full program, so uh, so, so let's let's get started. Um, so, so yeah, so welcome to CVPR and especially welcome to the uh, this our workshop on continual learning and computer vision or uh, CL vision. Uh, so it's it's already the the, the fourth edition of this workshop, um, and and yeah, we hope that sort of just like the the last three three workshops, um, it's going to be an again an, uh, an exciting and inspiring workshop. Um, so uh, so my name is is Guido van der Ven and I'm one of the organizers and I'm. Um, yeah, going to have five or ten minutes, um, share some opening remarks uh, to kind of give you a taste of, of what to expect today. Um, and, and yeah, maybe to, to start with, uh, maybe it's good to uh, um, kind of as a practical announcement to say, uh, so the, the main purpose or the main focus of the workshop is in person, uh, but we do uh, also live stream all of the talks on uh, on Zoom. Uh, so yeah, you might uh, might need to be aware of that if you want to ask a question. Um, okay. Uh, so, so then let's get into it. So, um, the workshop is on continual learning. So, what what is continual learning? Well, firstly, as you can see on the, the graph on the right, uh, the continual learning, the topic of continual learning, has been getting uh, more and more popular in the in the last couple of years. So, I guess it's fair to say it's a, it's a hot topic. Um, but then, what is continual learning? Uh, like, how would you define it? Uh, and I think. Like if you look at different papers, there, there can be quite some differences in sort of the interpretation or the definition of continual learning. Um, but I think typically uh, there are sort of three core ingredients, although not, not always, but, um, uh, but, but yeah, typically continual learning deals with uh, the problem of, of incrementally training uh, machine learning models from, from a stream of data. Uh, and, and usually in continual learning, there's also uh, a change in, in either the data distributions or the task classifications over time. Uh, and then finally, uh, typically, uh, uh, forgetting is an uh, uh, forgetting of, of past knowledge is an important issue to be dealt with in uh, in continual learning. Um, um, but but then, as I said, the sort of the definition of continual learning is is not is not uh, not not very clear or, or very fixed, uh, and and that's that's also kind of reflected in uh, in. In, in, yeah, the list of topics that we considered suitable for this workshop. Uh, so this list ranged from, for example, future learning and transfer learning to uh, to bio-inspired learning and, and even curiosity. Um, and then, uh, and then again, sort of this this slide again uh, drives home this point that continual learning is, is very diverse and interdisciplinary uh, because basically there's uh, yeah many researchers from different fields are um, uh, are getting interested in the topic of continual learning. And then, in addition, there's also uh, researchers from both academia and industry that uh, sort of increasingly uh, do research on, on this topic. Uh, and so we, we we tried hard to uh, to reflect this this diversity of, of of the topic of continual learning in in, in the program that we put together um, for the workshop today. Uh, and well, as you can see, we've got uh, we've got six, uh, excited, uh, six six great invited speakers. Uh, we've got over uh, 30 contributed papers that will be presented as as posters and, and some of them as oral presentations as well. Uh, we've got a panel discussion and um, uh, and and part of the of the workshop uh, we also organized a challenge for for which we'll we'll have some reports uh, at, the, at the end of the day as well. Uh, okay, so then the uh, these these are the six invited speakers today. Um, so. In, select, in selecting them, we try to uh, uh, yeah, get a, a selection of speakers with uh, sort of uh, diverse perspectives on continual learning, um, uh, diversity in, in sort of the, the places around the world where they work, um, 
the uh, well, the diversity in, in terms of the, the 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 career stages that the different speakers are at, uh, and also uh, to have both speakers from industry as well as from from academia. Um, and oh yeah, and so so all of the speakers will will give their talk uh, live in person, uh, unfortunately with the exception of uh, Stao Ping Hong, um, because uh, yeah he has issues getting his visa on time, so he will uh, he will give a remote uh, remote talk instead. Um, okay, so then the, the contributed papers. So uh, for the workshop this year, we had uh, 42 submissions uh, and uh, uh, we, had, we had two tracks this year. So on one hand, uh, an archival track uh, for which the accepted papers um, um, are, are being published uh, in the, uh, the TVPR workshop proceedings. Uh, and then we also had a non-archival track. Um, uh, which kind of the point to, uh, to, to, to give authors a chance to, to present some recent work uh, without it being officially published at this workshop. Uh, and then um, in, in the end, um, for the archival track, we had uh, 14 accepted papers, which uh, which gave an acceptance rate of around 56%. Uh, and then for the non-archival track, we have 20 papers. And all of these papers, they will uh, they have the chance to be presented as a, as a poster today. Uh, we've got two poster sessions. Uh, and then in addition, three of these papers have been selected for an oral presentation as well. Uh, and then the, at the end of the day, we will also announce um, uh, one best paper award for, for one of these papers uh, in, the, in the closing remarks. Uh, okay, then, then the, the challenge. Uh, so as I said, um, uh, just like the last three editions of, of the CL Vision Workshop, uh, there was again uh, a challenge um, organized as part of the workshop. Uh, and this, this year, the, it was organized around the theme of class incremental learning with repetition. Uh, and so the, the challenge was made, uh, the main organizer of the challenge was Hamad Hemati, uh, and uh, he will later give an, uh, a, a more detailed introduction of the challenge. And we'll also have um, brief presentations from the, uh, the, the four best performing teams in this challenge about what strategy they used. Uh, okay, and then, uh, yeah, so, some practical information. So, uh, so yeah, so all of the talks will be uh, in, in, in this location. Um, which well, at least all of you found, uh, and then uh, the, the the so everything except for the poster presentations will be here. But the poster presentations um, they will be in the exhibit hall in the west building, so that's in in the other building. So it's it's, it's quite a walk from here, um, and uh, yeah, and, and the the coffee breaks uh, will be will be catered there as well, uh, or I think like in, the, in at least in the, in the same building there. Um, so. What is a bit unfortunate is that um, so so basically yeah, there's multiple workshops today and um, in the exhibit hall um, all of the the workshops will have their poster presentations in that hall. Uh, so it's it's important to remember that the posters for our workshop will be on, on poster boards uh, 163 to 191. Uh, and then secondly, um, because we we actually share these boards with other workshops as well, so that means that uh, as a as a poster presenter. Uh, you can only um, put your poster up at the beginning of each session, and then at the end of each session, you have to take it down again. Uh, so that's a bit unfortunate, but yeah, that's that's just the way it is. Uh, okay, and then um, so well, we we can um, ask questions live um, dur during the uh, at the end of each talk, uh, but um, you can also ask questions through through Rocket Chat, uh, for example, if there's not enough time to ask questions or uh, or as if you're uh, following us virtually. Um, okay, and then uh, quickly, I want to uh, uh, thank a couple of people. So, uh, as I said, uh, I'm one of the organizers, but I'm uh, uh, I'm not by myself. There was there was actually a whole team of, of people that helped uh, to prepare the the program for this workshop. Um, and uh, unfortunately, in the end, only uh, most of the organizers were not able to. Uh, uh, to be at this workshop in person. So it's actually only me and, and, and Paolo Rodriguez. Uh, but luckily, uh, uh, there's also James Smith who, who kindly uh, uh, agreed to help us out uh, with organizing today as well. Um, and, and then also a, a big thanks to, to all the reviewers that, that helped review papers for this workshop. Uh, so yeah, many, many thanks. Some of you might be here. Uh, and, and then thanks to our sponsors. Um, uh, so thanks to their support, uh, we, we've been able to, uh, to provide a nice, uh, a nice best paper award and also 
an award for the uh, the top team from the challenge. Uh, and as I said, they'll be announced in the in the closing remarks. Uh, okay, and with that, uh, let's let's get started. Uh, with, with the first speaker, and that's uh, Salt Kira, and he's going to be introduced by by James, who will also chair the, the first session. Way to get this moved. Good morning, everybody. I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker of the day, Dr. Jolt Kira. Dr. Kira is an assistant professor at the in the School of Interactive Computing at the Georgia Institute of Technology, and he is also affiliated with the Georgia Tech Research Institute and serves as the associate director of Machine Learning Center at Georgia Tech. Dr. Kira leads the Robotics Perception and Learning Lab at Georgia Tech with his research of area specifically focusing on the intersection of robotics and perception. Uh, in particular, he has been interested in moving beyond supervised learning, including semi self supervised learning, continual lifelong learning, category discovery, and open world multimodal learning. Uh, we are looking very much to hearing your insights on continual and lifelong learning today. So, everybody, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Jolt Kira. Okay, uh, awesome. Uh, thanks uh, for the organizers for putting this workshop together. Uh, it's a great forum. Um, and today I'll be talking about um, continual efficient fine tuning of foundation models. I should say largely this is work by James who just introduced me and he's gonna be on the job market team. So hire him. He's awesome. Um, let me see if I can figure out how to. Uh, how do I increment this slide? It does not work. Okay. Um, so the first thing I want to acknowledge is the elephant in the room, which is that the ground is kind of shifting below us. There's lots of things changing across not just language, of course, you've heard of language models that, that are the hype right now, but also computer vision, where these methods that take self and semi-supervised learning um, and scale it up um, really can learn effective representations, models that we can leverage for a lot of different things. And one of the interesting things is that these methods or models are not just good at the tasks such as classification, object detection, and so on. They also have some nice properties in terms of outer distribution robustness and so on, which I think, as was mentioned, you know, are very relevant to continual learning as well. And so there's a question here of how should continual learning community respond to these? Um, and in the spirit of this is a workshop, I'll try to take a strong stand. We can have a discussion and feel free to disagree. Um, so before that, I'll start by some background. Of course, you're all here, so you probably know what continual learning is, but I'll give a brief background. Continual learning tries to move away from this notion of being able, of, of training on a large training set and freezing it and then deploying on some test set. Of course, the real world has many different distributions of data that come through time, things change. In robotics, for example, we know that once you deploy a robot, it's never going to encounter the same environment. Things change over time and so on. And so the key question is, what do we do when we have new data that's of different distributions? Of course, we can train only on the new data. We know that that results in catastrophic forgetting. That is, you're wiping away the weight of prior things that you learned. We can train on everything again. That is, the old data plus the new data. Of course, these days when we're doing things like large scale pre-training, this is gonna be super um, inefficient, right? So we don't really want to have to retrain all of our models on all of the new data as it comes along. Um, and there's also kind of an underappreciated aspect of privacy here. We don't necessarily wanna keep around past data because it may have things that are, are not great in terms of privacy. 
And so continual learning is kind of the correct approach here where we want to, over time, continuously update the models and be able to adapt to new things while not forgetting old things, but also not having old data or retraining everything. And so, um, you know, why does it matter? There's, like I mentioned, efficiency and scalability issues, especially now that we have very large models, very large amount of trainings that computes intensive. We want robustness to distribution shifts in particular, and we want to be cognizant of privacy issues. One of the exciting things about continual learning is that it's one of the areas that's both scientifically interesting. We can acknowledge humans are continual learners. It can hopefully give us insights about intelligence, or if nothing else, allow us to replicate it. But it's also practically relevant. So I teach the deep learning class and do office hours with industry. One of the often, you know, mo most often uh, asked questions is, how do you update your models across time? The answer that industry gives is, we have hundreds of models. Each of those models has a team dedicated to that model and decides whether to update it every hour, every day, every month, every week, and so on. Um, so it's an ad hoc process. Lots of people basically babysit these models and figure out when I, should I retrain once things have changed. And so, you know, the, this is especially relevant, I think, in the days of large language models, but I think it's tricky um, in terms of making impact, that is, when can we make models that industry can use such that they can continuously learn is, is a difficult problem. Um, and I think largely one of the issues is that there's a question of how we should set up these settings when we study these problems. So if we look at the anatomy of a continual learning setting, we have, again, a distribution shift over time. And there's a bunch of questions. So what kind of distribution shift? Do we have new classes or categories, semantic shift? Do we have changing covariates data, covariate shifts with data? That is, the things that are in the data are the same, but the statistics, the input statistics are different. And in the real world, I think it's a mixture, right? It's a messy mixture of things that change over time. We can ask, should we use pre-training? Should we leverage these large foundation models or should we just train, train from scratch? If we do leverage them, how do we fine tune them? Should we replay data from past tasks? Should we have task labels during inference? And so I think all of these questions have to be answered when we actually study this problem. So again, in the spirit of making a strong stand, I'm gonna kind of commit to some things that I think should be studied. Again, not to say that other things aren't valuable, but I think this, this kind of intersection is really kind of the more impactful areas, which is I think we should use pre-training. I think we wanna leverage foundation models. If you were at the AC meeting yesterday, there was a large discussion, you know, are we beholden to companies that hold these large models? But in reality, these models are effective. And so pre-training from scratch does not make as much sense anymore because we already have a lot of useful initialization. How should we fine tune them? If you're on Twitter, you know language models have just a plethora of parameter efficient fine tuning that you can run on your laptop. So there's a lot of cool methods these days and I'll show us using those methods. What should the distribution shift that we study be? And this is actually one of the more complicated questions that I don't really have great answers to. There's lots of different settings that people have come up with, but I think this should be really answered because this is what will make it practical in the real world. And then should we use replay data or task labels? And I'm gonna say no to those. Um, again, I mentioned why replay you know, might not be a great thing to do um, over time. And clearly humans might do some feature replay dreaming, things like that, but clearly we're not retrieving past data from things that we've seen. So in the spirit of this, I'm going to really cover one part of this, which is our work on fine-tuning pre-trained foundation models. Um, but I think all of these questions are, are interesting questions to answer. Okay. So again, that's going to be the research question for uh, my talk today, which is how should we um, fine-tune these large-scale models? I'm going to do two works, um, one, two, or actually three, um, one of which looks at prompting-based methods for vision transformers to update them for continual learning. We also have a CVPR uh, poster on 
uh, multimodal tasks, so vision and language. I won't really talk too much about that, but check out the poster um, during the conference. And then I'll, on the second part, I'll talk about uh, continual generative models, that is continual diffusion. Okay, so starting off from the first part, which is how can we do fine tuning of large pre-trained models? So the setting here is we're going to have a large pre-trained transformer. Again, I believe that these exist. They're awesome. They have lots of cool properties. Let's use them. And so there's been a lot of prior works that have come out very recently, such as dual prompt or L2P, that have taken transformers that have been pre-trained and essentially optimized prompt for our new task over the sequence of tasks that we learned. So the setting that we're doing here is rehearsal-free continual learning. That is, we're not using replay. This is purely all we have is the model and the data for each task as the task becomes available. And again, the prior methods learn these optimized tensors that are sprinkled throughout the transformer. And that is what we're learning when we're learning the new task. And people have shown that this actually results in very competitive performance both in terms of accuracy on the new task, but also reducing forgetting over the sequence. However, there's some limitations to these methods. And namely, obviously, if we're starting from an ImageNet pre-trained model, we often use these distribution shifted data sets such as ImageNet R. If you're familiar with it, it's really just adding different kinds of covariate shifts to the data. And we find that these methods can don't, don't perform as well. And we identify specifically one area for why, and that is they have this dual optimization um, that I'll talk about in the next slide that's not end-to-end -end trained. And so what we are going to do is, in our work, is do the standard deep learning principles. Can we make it end-to-end -end optimizable? And can we have degrees of freedom in terms of scalability that we can increase over larger models, larger data sets? and so on. So this is what we're going to do. If uh, Just to kind of give a very brief introduction, I'm not going to go through transformers, but if you're familiar with them, the key components that they have is this multi-head self-attention, where you have these, um, the, the queries, the keys, and the values. And you have this attention function that essentially weights the uh, values as, as, as a weighted summation, and that forms the output of this module. What we're going to do is what's called prefix tuning. That is, we're going to optimize, we're going to keep most of the model frozen, that's pre-trained, but we're going to sprinkle these optimized PK and PV, that is the prompts. And the question is, how should we select and tune these particular prompts? So prior work, such as L2P and dual prompt, approach it using this standard kind of query key value mechanism. You have a query function, which is often just from the standard pre-trained mo frozen model. That gets compared with a set of keys, and these keys are optimized, and I'll talk about how. Given a chosen key that is the best, closest key in terms of similarity, we choose the corresponding value. And that is what forms our prompt that we insert into the um, into the self-attention module. And then, so that, that gets inserted into the model, and then we have an output. During training, the values are optimized using the standard gradients coming from the loss function. However, they have a separate optimization for the key functions here. So the key elements are optimized using a clustering-like objective. That's a separate optimization process. So again, we're deep learning people. We love end-to-end -end optimization. So our key contribution is how do we change this architecture to make it optimizable? So what we do is specifically we have the same query that comes in. We have an attention mechanism that focuses on particular aspects of the query that hopefully is relevant to the data that we're looking at. That gets used to generate a set of weights. So these are attention weights, very similar to the notion of attention in, in transformers. And these attention weights are going to be weighting our prompt component. So rather than have a pool of prompts that we select from, we're going to have a set of components that are used to, through the attention weighted summation mechanism, generate or create our ultimate prompt. So we're going to combine the attention weights 
with the prompt component. And then that through a weighted summation is used to generate our prompt. And those prompts are then inserted into the transformer block. What's nice about this is we've made it end-to-end -end differentiable. So now we can optimize the whole thing. We can optimize every part in here. The second thing is we've added this dimensionality of the components. We can add as many components as we want. And then it's some weighted, you know, the prompts get formed from some weighted summation. So it allows us to increase capacity as we want to scale things up. So that's the key kind of idea. Let's take a look very quickly at kind of more details. So specifically, we're changing rather than having a prompt pool and selecting from those prompts, we're taking the query. We have a learnable attention component. We have a learnable key prompt keys that are used to compare, that are compared to the um, attended queries. Those attention weights, um, the component weightings are going to be combined with our learnable components. And then there's that weighted summation that gets used to form the prompt, and that's used to modify the transformer. By the way, this is sprinkled across some arbitrary hyperparameter team set of blocks across the transformer. And so again, this is all end-to-end -end optimized. So let's look at, look at the results. So here we can look at the offline results for ImageNet R is around 77%. Um, the dual prompt method, which is the closest state of the art, gets around 71. We actually have two methods, two, two variants of our method. One is sort of um, the, the number of parameters is roughly aligned to the prior methods to make it fair. Others, the, the other method is a scaled version where we can show that the scalability power of our component idea. And so the key takeaway is that here, this is achieving state-of-the-art results, close to offline accuracy. And what's interesting is that, um, you know, we do this without any replay at all. So why does it work? And again, one of the key intuitions that we have is that we're really looking at this based on a expandable sort of set of components, where rather than taking the prompt pool, which if you increase, for example, the prompt length, it doesn't continue to give you performance gains. We take our prompt components and we can continue to increase them. And then now all of a sudden we have, you know, um, increased scale. So you can, you know, do the standard scaling law kind of thing um, that you like to do in deep learning. Okay, so that's, that's for image classification. So again, I think the idea of using pre-trained models and fine tuning various aspects of those pre-trained models is, is, a, is a great new area for continual learning. We're gonna show a variant of this for a different task, which is um, generation. So here we're using you know, the standard stable diffusion. Given some text input, you wanna generate instances, images that contain or reflect that input. What we want to do in particular is something called custom diffusion. That is, you're a human user, you have a cell phone, you want to take a picture of your dog and or several pictures of your dog and insert that somehow into the diffusion model such that it can generate new instances. We also want to do this through time. So now later there's a picture of your mom that you want to take and then you again want to insert that concept through again prompts that you learn and you want the model to be able to generate it. But then there's also the very hard problem of compositional generation. That is, I want to generate an image with my dog and my mom together. Um, this is a very hard problem. And you know, there's been several variants uh, that have tackled this. One does it sequentially um, by fine tuning to each particular concept. There's also other methods that are more, much more complex, which do this kind of closed form optimization. So they do a separate model for each concept and then they do some closed form optimization um, in order to be able to compose the two models together. And so there's several issues with this, of course, catastrophic forgetting if you sequentially do this and there's increased compute and, and even still catastrophic forgetting and interference if you do the second approach. Um, and so what we wanna do is again, leverage all the nice things that have come out including parameter efficient fine tuning of transformers to make this happen. And so in particular, this is the model that we use. So we have a 
So stable diffusion, I'm not going to go through it. It's very complex. It's got an autoencoder. It's got all sorts of other components. The key thing that we're going to look at is it's got this text encoder, of course, um, and there is a projection of the text encoding through these to, to these K and V values that's in the cross attention of a UNet architecture. And so based on prior works, that's what we're going to modify in particular for new concepts. So given these new concepts that we're introducing, we're going to learn new prompts here, new, new, new inputs here, um, customized tokens that for each concept. One thing is we do some things differently. You should read the paper. There's a lot of details. For example, prior methods initialize these with rare words, whereas we just initialize them randomly, but we do a bunch of other tricks as well. So take a look for details um, of how this works. But then to actually update the projection, the key value projections here in the cross attention, we use this notion of LoRa, which if you're not familiar with, just decomposes you know, the matrix into a multiplication of two components. Um, and we are gonna do this for each concept that we learn. And so this is kind of a kind of factorized component-wise LoRa that we have, where for each new concept, we're now learning, learning not just the customized token, but also um, the new LoRa deltas here. The other aspect is you can still have some interference between these different components that you're learning. And so we're going to introduce a regularization approach as well. And in particular, rather than use replay, we're going to have these two, again, you know, you're introducing two concepts, a dog, new dog, your, your mom, and then you want to prevent interference between the parameters that are learned here. And so if you don't have a forgetting kind of regularization, then you could potentially have interference and still have forgetting. So this does not solve the catastrophic forgetting problem. So in order to ameliorate that, we're going to not use replay. We're not going to store past models. We're going to make things very efficient in terms of memory and compute. All we're going to do is have a simple self-regularization. And in particular, we're just going to use this component-wise multiplication. That just says penalize things that are changing a lot in both components. Um, and so you add this to the loss function, and now again, we can optimize. So then we have our new weight matrix, which is, again, a combination of these different components that you've learned. So now we can see how well these methods work. Um, and in particular, we're looking at various different data sets for generation. Faces for generated models are very popular. So what we want to do is, again, insert new faces, new people, and then have instances generate from that. Prior methods, if you just do like what's called custom, you know, offline and custom diffusion, they of course require retraining, giving all these different concepts at once. They do well, but they, they're not a continual learning paradigm. There, if you kind of make a lot of these existing methods like dream booth and text inversion continual, then they just don't do well. In some cases, if you notice, it's hard to tell maybe, so look at the paper, but they catastrophically forget. And so our method in particular is able to now generate very nice resolution or, or in terms of uh, quality of, of generation, many different concepts that we introduce continuously. So I should note that what we're showing here is generation of different concepts that we've introduced at the end of the continual training. So um, again, we're learning something in sequence, these different new concepts in sequence, now we're showing how well does it generate all of the different concepts across the sequence. So that's a standard continual learning paradigm. We can also do this with like landmarks. So we've shown generality to many different types of data sets. And again, we do much better. And I should say we have a bunch of, of course, ablations, analysis, quantitative evaluation to show that our method is indeed better. I think one of the exciting aspects of this is though that we can generate composite images. So we can do generation of, you know, not just one different person, but 
multiple people together. If you look at the prior methods, they actually, you know, sometimes do okay. Other times, if you look, they just catastrophically fail. They either just don't produce things that sensically they look like weird people or they replicate the same person. They're not actually combining two different concepts together. Whereas our method does really well across the board. Of course, there's limitations. So in the paper, we show various aspects of that as well. Okay, so in particular, um, you know, again, what, what we showed is that we're, we can use this idea of LoRa, which is a kind of parameter efficient fine tuning of large scale transformers. We actually show that this is good, not just for generation, but also for image classification. So again, we show state of the art results, even improving upon our CVPR that's this, you know, shown in this conference. Uh, so we already have a paper that's in submission that's, that's feeding that as well. Okay. I should say we also have components uh, that shows use the same idea of kind of parameter efficient fine tuning of large scale models for vision and language tasks. We are not learning new categories, but you're learning new skills in a vision question answering kind of method. Please check out the poster. James is the, the architect of all of these things, so he can answer questions for all of these different work, including the new ones we showed. Okay, so I'm going to conclude to allow um, for questions. But um, before that, I want to emphasize two things. One is, again, you know, our work shows that learning and adapting to evolving data is, you know, really um, fundamental and can be really leverage, can leverage a lot of these advances that have come out. I know there's a lot of uncertainty over foundation models. Are they solving problem? You know, everything. And the answer is, let's leverage them to improve things like continual learning. If we can beat, you know, offline for image classification, let's move to more complex distribution shifts, more complex tasks, and so on. There's always, you know, new research horizons to explore. And the second thing is, let's leverage this pre-training rather than throwing it away. So, you know, if you look at this overall set of setting decisions that I talked about, there's a lot of parts that I didn't talk about. I talked about one part, which is pre-trained models. There's a key question that I don't necessarily have a good answer to, but there's lots of potential answers that you can have, which is what is the distribution shift that we have? What's interesting is sometimes when you make it more realistic, it actually removes the challenges of catastrophic forgetting, but maybe there's other challenges. So for example, I know there's a cool like clear and other data sets that take temporal distributions of data and things like that. So I think I really think we should put a lot of effort in thinking about what are the proper settings that we should look at. There's multimodal. I think vision and language is again, you know, something that's hot, but it's also very interesting. Language gives us this compositional generalization, even when dealing with computer vision. And so how do we leverage language and or multimodal models? There's a lot of research, interesting research questions such as how do we mitigate forgetting in both or even the alignment. So clip and other models align the two. How can we mitigate forgetting in the alignment itself? Um, efficiency. So we showed parameter efficiency. To be fair, that's not necessarily compute efficiency. So how do we do this in a manner that's actually, you know, going to save a lot of compute and trees and carbon emissions? And then finally, I think one thing that maybe is not mentioned as much, but I see, you know, is a relevant practical problem, which is safety and some sort of guarantees. I think ultimately, if we want industry to adopt these models, it's hard to say, okay, just continuously learn these models and hope for the best that it doesn't break other things, such as, for example, bias fairness considerations or all sorts of other things that we care about. So I think there's a lot of really exciting, you know, research avenues for this. So with that, I'm going to wrap up and thank especially James for doing all this work and, and putting together more of the slides. Please do visit the posters um, and I'm available to take questions. Ask them. Hi, I'm interested in how the team would like to 
Well, I have a question about the technical detail about product uh, In my understanding, the key value mechanism in LTP or DEPOMS was parameter isolation, which negates getting. Uh, the changing to the uh, limbo extension breaks parameter isolation. How do you negate getting? Okay, uh, and and you know again, James can answer these uh, um, in in depth at the poster, but really the, that is a true point. And one thing is, I did not um, cover every kind of technical detail. We also have some orthogonality and other kind of constraints or elements that also try to prevent forgetting. So, so, so yeah, yeah. So so you know again, like these prompt components, we have some regularization of orthogonality to also prevent some of these forgetting aspects. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. The second, uh, the second test uh, the second word is uh, the continue the signal with this with that weight categorization. In my understanding, the solution model is so complicated that uh, the weight in size is very hard to place all so we can't locate what the knowledge is to the representative in space. This weight categorization, the weight categorization, is the weight categorization and the depth of approach um, in the way that we don't understand weights that can be very clear. So I guess, I mean, there's two kind of entangled things there. One is interpretability, one is forgetting. Um, I think, again, the key idea is we're not modifying all you know the entire model for stable with diffusion for example right like there are and again this is from prior work you know they have shown like which as which parts of the model should we actually you know update and which parts not so for example there are parts of the transformer block that are um, like more more or less sensitive to new concepts and so I believe like for example you know they chose the 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 key value parts because they were more sense they had some sensitivity whereas other parts were much more stable um, so if you try to change like stable parts that then you might you know introduce more forgetting or more more concept drift um, so again I think the answer to that question is don't update all parts of the model figure out which parts of the model we may we may still not have I mean of course you can try to interpret them right and like visualize the attention mechanisms and things like that. Um, but I don't know that it's necessary, you know, to have perhaps interpretability. We can also empirically, you know, try to understand which parts of the model empirically should we change in these continual learning settings. Yeah. Any other questions? questions? Yes. Thanks for the talk. The very interesting. Um, one question I had is: Did you observe some kind of backward transfer to the sense that you train a new theory and kind of background, and then you can generate images with previous values in this new background? If you didn't do the experiment, that's all right. Just curious. Um, that's a good. I don't believe we have the backwards transfer. Um, experiments, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I could try to guess <laughs> whether we will or will not, but probably yeah, I don't want to guess wrong. Um, so that would be interesting. Yeah. And again, I think that comes back to there's a lot of continual learning metrics um, that we may care about. Um, I think backwards transfer is always, you know, some of the harder things, and so yeah, uh, we we yeah. didn't yeah measure it so. Yeah. It'll be interesting to yeah, take a look at that. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Now we will do a brief transition.
I just okay. yeah. Thank you, everybody. Uh, now, please welcome our next speaker, Dr. Ian Laluz. Uh, Dr. Laluz is a principal research scientist and team lead at Naver Labs Europe. She's also the head of the Lifelong Learning Representation Chair with MEAI Research Institute. Her research focuses on self-supervised learning, incremental and online learning, and continual domain adaptation. Dr. Larluz has made notable contributions to instance level, semantic, cross modal, and multimodal visual retrieval. We are very honored and privileged to have you today with us, Dr. Larluz, and we are very looking forward to your insights and valuable contributions today. So please, everybody, help me and give a warm welcome to Dr. Larluz. Thank you for the introduction. And Thanks a lot for the invitation. Thank you for putting uh, together such a nice uh, well, uh, list of topics for this workshop. It's, uh, it's an, an honor for me to be able to present some of the research we've done in the team recently around the lifelong representation. So let's start with one of my favorite computer vision tasks, cat classification. If you happen to want to train a model to, cat, to, to classify images of cats, so you need examples of what cats can look like, which is surprisingly diverse. You need images of what cats shouldn't look like. And then you take your favorite architecture and loss, and you can train a model that, provided with a new image it has never seen, can predict if it contains a cat or not. And as you all know in this room, this very simple recipe, it's not loving. Yeah. It's very annoying. Is it, better? Is it better like that? Can you hear me better? I don't know. Okay, so in this room, you all know that provided with a very large collection of images, ideally with labels, a powerful architecture, and lots of compute, you can now classify very easily thousands of categories. And um, even if this recipe works extremely well, if you start moving towards a very large collection task, and, um, and exactly as I <laughs> presented in the previous um, talk, well, then you start having trouble because you probably don't want to do this over and over again. So that's when the notion of lifelong learning comes handy. And this is how I would define it for the rest of this talk. I would define lifelong learning as um, not solving a single task in isolation, but many, and trying to make sure that when you're trying for one task, it's going to be useful later for another task. If we isolate only, um, if we isolate two tasks, already a certain number of research questions arise. So first, how should we pre-train on the first task, task A, so it will transfer better later to task B? Once we have pre-trained, how should you do the adaptation process itself? And finally, when you do the adaptation, how do you make sure that you don't forget about what's happening in task A? I'm going to cover two scenarios in this presentation. The first one we're going to spend a bit more time on, this is a pre-training scenario. So the idea is that we have a task for which we have enough information to train a strong model. And we would like to make sure that this model is going to be useful and to transfer well later to multiple tasks, potentially very different. So how should we pre-train for this? And on top of this, what is a bit annoying is that very often when you do the pre-training task, you don't know yet what you will be using your pre-trained model for. So how do you pre-train when you don't know yet what you will be using your model on? Um, so let's have a closer look at this uh, training of transfer of visual representation. As we've seen before, um, when we have large collection of images, such as ImageNet, if you pre-train for the classification task using images and labels, you can obtain a model that, as you all know, are extremely good starting points for dealing with other classification tasks, but also object detection, instance segmentation, or image retrieval. So fully supervised classification can be seen as a proxy task to train visual representation. But now we know that um, having an image net size data set with labels for your domain of interest is quite a strong assumption. 
This is why um, there has been lots of effort into finding alternative proxy tasks for training visual representations that are less annotation demanding. So what do we have there? Um, let's take a closer look. The most annotation hungry pre-training methods are the ones that require, require fine-grained annotations and typically expert knowledge, such as the one we have on the image in the data set. At the other end of the spectrum, you have self-supervised learning methods. They do not require annotations because they fabricate the labels from the data itself. But now, independently of how this, um, this proxy task is built, maybe it's fully supervised classification, maybe it's self-supervised approach, then how, you, how do you evaluate the visual representation that you obtain? How, how do you know that it's going to transfer well later? So we need some kind of measure to evaluate the quality of a visual representation. And if you look at how this is done in general, uh, well, very often you use this model as a, as a way to extract visual representation as a feature extractor. And you use these representations um, directly combined with a, a classifier, something like this, on many other tasks or many other data sets. And this already gives a very good first intuition on the quality of these uh, representations. But what about something slightly more principled? So if we try to look at what can vary between the proxy task and the target task, um, a number of aspects can vary. So let me try to disentangle those into multiple dimensions. So first, uh, the most obvious one, the task can vary. For example, you pre-train for classification and you want to use the detection loop. Another dimension that can vary is the domain. If I take the example of outdoor images, maybe my images have been taken under different weather conditions. And um, a last dimension that can vary is uh, the concepts. And while the two first dimensions have been studied quite a lot in the past, and the, the notion of concept generalization or generalization across concepts, at least, has been more seldomly studied. And this is what I would like to talk about now. So let's evaluate visual representation and let's narrow down the task, uh, the, um, the evaluation to concept generalization. The question I'm trying to look at now is when training a model on a set of seen concepts, how well does it generalize to new and seen concepts? If I go back to my simple example of a cat classifier, how should I train my cat classifier so it's going to transfer better or at least faster to a new category, for example, catacorns, a class for which we have very few training samples and rarely photographs. So to evaluate properly concept generalization, we need a proper benchmark. And the first thing we need for this benchmark is to be able to measure the semantic distance between concepts. What I would argue is that tiger cats and European wildcats are more semantically related to say a tiger cat and a cabbage worm. So how do we measure the semantic similarity? There are several ways, but the way we, we chose here is to use the lean similarity in the WordNet graph. The WordNet graph is this ontology handcrafted by linguists that is underlying ImageNet. And once we have this semantic similarity, we can rank a bunch of classes from the most similar to the least similar to a starting category. And, um, and now we have this semantic distance, we can even extend this to a semantic distance between sets of concepts. And this is what is at the core of the benchmark that we built. A second, um, a second note I'd like to make is that if we want to evaluate concept generalization, ideally the concept should be the only thing which varies, the rest should stay the same. So one way to help that happening is to build a benchmark within a large data set. And for that, we use the full image net that contains many, many categories, classes or concepts, like we can name them differently. And on, within image net, we've selected the 1000 categories from the image net challenge uh, to be the scene categories. The models are supposed to be exposed to during training. And um, that's pretty convenient because that's anyway what most of the methods use for pre-training. Then we've extracted five sets of 1,000 categories, which are increasingly distant from the 1,000 categories of the ImageNet challenge. So this helps structure um, a benchmark that is composed of a training set 
corresponding to the images that are associated to these seen categories, the 1000 from the ImageNet challenge, and five test sets of increasing difficulty because they're composed of 1000 categories that are more and more semantically distant. So this is the COG benchmark we've proposed to evaluate concept generalization. And we've used it to um, compare a number of approaches. We've looked at approaches that are fully supervised, semi-supervised, and unsupervised. And um, among this whole study, I would like to point to a few observations that we've made. The first one, and this is really something that I, I guess is needed to, to ground the benchmark, is the fact that this is harder indeed for method to generalize to concepts that are semantically distant. So we can see that as the method are uh, evaluated on these five test sets, the, the performance are um, indeed lower and lower. A second observation that we've made is the fact that self-supervised approaches tend to generalize better. So on this benchmark, they have a, a very nice behavior that they degrade more gracefully across the different uh, concept, concept levels. And uh, finally, we've seen that label-based augmentations, when you use your label to do data augmentation, this indeed gives a great boost on the scene categories, but this boost is at the expense of lower results when you want to use this model to classify unseen categories. So you can find all the experimental evidences supporting these claims in the, the corresponding publication here. I'm not going to get into more details, but what I'd like to do is to go back to what I think is one of the most striking observations we had when performing this study. The fact that recent self-supervised approaches tend to generalize better than their supervised counterparts. And related to that, I would like to make a few comments. So first, because these approaches are unsupervised, they have access to the image net images of the scene categories, but without the labels. So typically they do not perform as well as supervised methods on the, the task of image net uh, classification for the image net challenge. And, um, and I would like to argue that a good model that we don't know yet where we're going to apply it, a model that we wish for to be um, versatile should shine both on the training task and on transfer tasks. I think both dimensions are important. On top of that, um, it's pretty counterintuitive, I think, that access to more information, in our case, the labels, actually hurt. So what about finding a way to use labels and still being able to transfer? And this is going to, well, this is what is going to guide the, the next part. So let's take a closer look at this trade-off between training and transfer. And let me explain what you were seeing here on, on, this, um, on this slide. So during the, um, you have on the horizontal axis, you have uh, the training um, task. So I'm going to display results on the ImageNet classification for the 1000 category of the ImageNet challenge. Um, on the transfer dimension, I'm going to display um, an aggregated measure of transfer that combines results on multiple transfer data sets. The five COG levels I just presented before and eight additional data sets that are more standard that are fine grain uh, classification sets. And to evaluate, we just assume that we've trained uh, a model on, uh, on the ImageNet uh, images and we keep this, uh, this model frozen. We use it as a, as a feature extractor. We simply train a linear classifier on top. And this is a protocol we use for both the training task and transfer tasks. So let's look at how the different um, uh, state-of-the-art methods behave on, um, on these two dimensions, at least a selection. So we see that uh, supervised methods, they're really good at the training task, image net classification. Um, and we see that self-supervised method or and self-supervised self method are pretty good at transfer, but yeah, at the expense of a drop on the training um, task dimension. So what appears is that if you look at, at this method, um, there's a trade-off between what you can achieve uh, depending on if you favor the training task or the transfer task. And what we would like to achieve is something that goes in this direction, something that shines in both. 
So how can you pre-train um, a model still using the labels if you have access to them? So you have good results on the training task, but you want that model to still have good transfer properties, generalization properties. If we look at what's happening here, it seems that the best method out there are self-supervised methods. So what if we borrowed components from self-supervised learning in order to improve supervised learning? So what we try to do are taking some of these standard components. Uh, let's take a model. We can apply multi-crop data augmentation. This is a data augmentation approach that takes random image crops at very different resolutions, and it's been successfully used by the method Suave and Dino. We can also use an expandable projector head. So this is again a standard self-supervised learning technique where you um, add this projector after your um, uh, UL encoder in order to avoid overfitting to the training to the proxy task. In our case, it will be the training task, and this projector is discarded afterwards. And then on top of this, you can learn class weights, or uh, we tried an alternative version where we train prototypes using something that is inspired by the nearest class mean um, classifier of uh, mentioning in colleagues. Okay, so I've described the pipeline with fairly simple modifications of what you can do. And let's see how this behaves on our training versus transfer uh, trade-off. We see that um, a bunch of the, of the variants that, um, that are built according to the, the recipe I just described indeed improve either on the training dimension, on the training task dimension, or on the transfer dimension, uh, some better on one and some on the other. But generally, um, this helps uh, pushing the convex um, health of this uh, training versus transfer a plane. What we've done is out of all these models, we've extracted two models, T-Rex and T-Rex star, that are um, the best on one of the dim dimensions. So T-Rex is based on transfer and T-Rex star is based on training, but they still have decent uh, property on the other dimension. So if I want to summarize what we've done here, um, I guess I would like to argue that you can still use labels and build um, a representation in a supervised way that transfer well to a number of transfer tasks. We've obtained this using multi-crop data augmentation and an expandable projector. What I didn't have time to show today, but I would like to mention quickly, is the fact that the projector design can vary. It can be um, deeper, it can be wider. And actually by playing with these parameters, you can kind of control the trade-off between the accuracy on the training task and the accuracy on the transfer task. So let me go back after this to the, um, what we're trying to do here. We want to build a proxy task to build visual representations that transfer. And we've seen that um, what we would like to achieve is like reducing the annotation cost of this proxy task used for training. We've briefly mentioned two things that lie at the end of the spectrum. You have fully supervised using fine grain annotation on the one hand, you have self-supervised approaches on the other one. And I'd like to mention an alternative approach that consists in using images with companion captions. So if you have access to images together with text, um, that's something you can use. And I would like to argue that those are weak annotations because they do not require expert knowledge. And sometimes this text can be automatically mined from, uh, from the internet or another source of information. So, okay, I'm sure you know how mask language modeling works. If you have some text, you can mask token in the text. And by um, training a model to predict the mask token, you can have a, a fairly good language model. Well, in our case, we have access to something that is um, a, bit, uh, a bit more. We have an image together with a caption. But I'd like to follow an approach that is very similar. Um, we can mask a token in the caption, and then we can use the remainder of the caption and the image to predict the mask token. And 
what we hope is that by leveraging the visual representation that is extracted from the companion image, then it's possible to predict that what the little girl is holding is an umbrella. Now that we've defined the proxy task, uh, we can um, we can um, we need components to actually solve this proxy task. So what do we need as a component? The first one is obviously a visual representation. We train visual representation from scratch. This is what we're really interested in and what we want to transfer. The rest is just a pretext. We need a text representation. And what follows, I'm going to assume that is provided. So we can simply use a text representation that has been built according to what I showed in the previous slide. And then we need a bunch of multimodal modules to tackle the proxy task. Let me state again that this visual representation is what we want to train. And this is what we will transfer later to purely computer vision tasks. The rest is just a pretext to train visual representations. And the pretext task, um, I'm going to call image condition mask language modeling, or SMLM in short. So in the team, we've used this, uh, this simple recipe to uh, train visual representations on clean image caption pairs, on standard benchmarks, the Flickr 30K or uh, MS Coco datasets, if you know those. And these are really curated datasets. So you know that um, there's not too much noise in what you train. So even with smaller sets of these image caption pairs, we were able to train visual representations that transferred pretty well to a number of computer vision tasks. Um, concurrent work via tech used more or less the same approach on exactly the same data set and uh, reach the same conclusion. And shortly after that, um, we have the CLIP method that pushed the idea at a much, much larger scale. So CLIP is training a visual representation and a texture representation from scratch on a data set that this time is much larger, but composed of unfiltered image plus, uh, plus text. And, and if you allow me, I would like to argue that what's happening here um, in a simplified version is we've put um, internet in a box and we've seen that with all this unfiltered information, we could train a visual representation that is fairly generic and that has been uh, applied to many, many possible downstream tasks. And, um, and, and you've seen how already in the original paper, they're doing zero shot recognition fairly well. But on top of that, many people have used uh, visual representations produced by the CLIP model for their, their uh, downstream task to be success. And going even one step further, um, these large models have led to building text to image generation tools, such as DALI, that is built on CLIP itself, and more recently, Stable Diffusion. So now with tools such as Stable Diffusion, provided that you have the, um, the right prompt, you can generate high quality images. So for better or for worse, you don't even need actual cats to flood the internet with cat images. And, um, and you can do that with many categories you can imagine. So now what I would like to do is to take for granted that we have access to this, uh, these tools, such as Stable Diffusion, and ask you a provocative question. Do you think we need actual images to pre-train visual representations. So let me clarify what I mean by that. If we go back to this slide that I showed you many times already, where we want to have a proxy task to train visual representations that transfer, and very often we do that by pre-train on ImageNet or something of that sort. What if we removed ImageNet and we used stable diffusion to generate a synthetic clone of ImageNet composed entirely of synthetic images? would the visual representations trained in this way still transfer for some downstream task? And that's something that is fairly easy to do. You just need to use the class name to prompt stable diffusion in order to generate a synthetic image. So you can do that for Papillon or Loriquette or PyChip that are three ImageNet classes. And we did try that and obtain results like this. So as you can see, we have images that are visually pretty appealing and that seemed to correspond to what we wanted to achieve. But when we started getting, uh, giving a closer look at these images, we noticed some errors, mostly of three 
nature. The first type of error um, are semantic errors. For example, on the class Papillon here, what happened is that the model has confused Papillon for the French word for the butterfly instead of the dog breed. Uh, we've seen a number of domain issues. For example, the bio chip is generating mostly toy images, uh, uh, toys or cartoon-like images. And for many of the, of the classes, we've seen a striking lack of diversity. So what we did next is to try to find some simple class agnostic ways to improve the prompt. So based on the class name, we try to combine the class name with um, the parent class in the WordNet ERP. We try combining the class name with the description of the class that is also available in this, uh, in this ontology. We've tried combining the class name to ask to generate the, um, the, the class inside a random background to improve diversity. And we've also played with a number of table diffusion parameters and in particular a guidance scale. And we've observed that some of these issues were disappearing visually, but how can we evaluate this in a more quantitative manner? Well, we can do what I described before. We can use these prompts to generate synthetic clones of ImageNet. And for each clone, we can train a model to classify the 1,000 categories of ImageNet and then apply this model on real images to see how well these models classify them. And we've seen that these different steps of class agnostic uh, prompt engineering indeed improve the classification accuracy on real images. I'm showing results on uh, on um, ImageNet 100, but we're still far from what we can be achieved by training a model on real images. So now I would like to um, study a bit more all these models that have been obtained with all these different possible prompts, so, so all these ImageNet clones with more dimensions. So how can we properly evaluate them? One thing we can do is exactly what I showed you on the 100, but we can do it on the full image net. How well do this model classify real images from image net validation set? And we see how our prompt in, um, engineering already improves and closes part of the gap with the accuracy obtained with uh, models trained on real images. But we're still, um, we're still not there yet. Let's look at more dimensions. Um, now we're going to look at alter alternative versions of ImageNet. So ImageNet v2 is another test set, but it's still fairly similar from ImageNet. We have ImageNet R that is composed of other domains, for example, paintings, patterns, and so on. We have ImageNet Sketch, which contains sketch version of the classes. And we have ImageNet A that is uh, using um, adversarial images. So let's see how the, um, the different models behave. Uh, if we compare a model trained on purely synthetic images to a, a purely synthetic ImageNet clone, we see that uh, it's, it's not there yet for the, the ImageNet and ImageNet V2. They are fairly similar, but that part of the gap is closing for other domains, such as the ones we have in ImageNet R and ImageNet Sketch, and also for the adversarial ImageNet. On top of that, um, we've decided to evaluate the, um, the models we obtain as feature extractor for transfer, um, transfer uh, learning. And there we've seen that um, the models are surprisingly um, resilient. So what I would like to, to show you on that slide here is really how good when we use models trained on synthetic clones of ImageNet, how good they are as feature extractor when you're going to use them for a transplant task. So to, to summarize um, and answering the question, do we still need actual images to pre-train visual representation? I've shown you promising results on the ImageNet variants, but more, more importantly, I would say strong transfer results. Yet, um, this is just a proof of concept, and this is only scratching the surface of what can be done uh, with, um, 
with this um, tool, Stable Diffusion and other text-to-image generation tool. And, um, and I think they need um, a deeper study. Fully understand that their potential, but also their issues. And I'm running out of time, I know, but I would like to spend two minutes just mentioning another scenario that I think is, um, is also related to lifelong learning. But in, this time, instead of changing the task, what I would like to do is to keep the task, for example, cat classification, and change the domain and try to adapt models across domains. So this is what I'm going to call continual domain adaptation. So let's take this very simplistic example of a self-driving car with equipped with a visual system. And let's assume that we want to update the visual system as new domains are encountered. Maybe snow images, maybe fog, uh, maybe sunset. If you simply update the model, what will happen, and um, as already discussed before in the, in the previous presentation, is catastrophic forgetting. The model will forget everything that has been learned. So what can you do? One, one night solution is to retrain from scratch every time, but this is something you don't want to do because it's intractable in, in practice and poses a number of privacy concerns. So what I would like to describe is what you can do when you cannot store uh, samples for retraining. So let's assume that you have samples from a current domain and that you want to adapt that model later to a future domain without forgetting too much, but this future domain is still unknown. One thing you can do is simply randomize the appearance of your samples in the current domain. The intuition being that if you have more diversity in the training samples, then you have a model that generalizes better and in turn will forget less when adapting. But something else you can do is to formally define as meta domains the transformed versions of the current domain for a given transformation. And if you do this, then when training, you can extend your training loss, your, your standard way of training, with multiple aspects. The first aspect and the most important is the standard one, training for the current task with your current sample. But then you can also train to adapt faster by applying the MAML uh, meta-running approach of Chelsea Finn and colleagues. And that would propose is to combine with a way to mitigate forgetting. It's again something based on meta-learning, uh, meta but the idea is to try to do a, a gradient adapt step on each meta domain and favor solutions that tend to forget less. And because everything happens during train time, um, you don't have to change your pipeline. You can simply apply this trick every time a new domain is encountered and it will mitigate catastrophic forgetting. So this brings me to the end of the presentation and I've covered quite a few things. So I would like just to summarize the research question we've looked at and the conclusions. We've looked at um, how should we pre-train visual representations? And this has now become entirely standard, but we've seen how self-supervised learning methods shine for concept generalization. Um, of course, other works have shown that they shine also for transfer and uh, domain generalization. Text is a formidable source of supervision. So again, with examples here, but many other, many other works have shown that if you have text, you can pre-train extremely strong, strong multi-model models that have this nice property of transferring easily to new tasks. Um, what I would like to argue today is that even if you want to build a model that transfers, you can use labels. There's a way to train in a supervised manner and still transfer. We've looked at how we should pre-train visual representations so they transfer better. We've seen evidences of the fact that if a truck box task is more difficult, it seems that the model tend to generalize better. We've seen an example with domain randomization for continual domain adaptation. And we've seen this also through the lens of a multi-crop and expandable projector that were used for improving um, uh, supervised training. We've seen how meta-learning facilitates transfer for continual domain adaptation. And finally, we've explored ways of mitigating forgetting. Again, we've seen how pre-trained models that generalize better tend to be also associated to models that forget more slowly. And um, we've seen techniques based on meta-learning to reduce forgetting. This time, this is really the end of my presentation. And um, before taking questions, I would like to take a few seconds to really thank my amazing collaborators 
I'm extremely lucky to work with them and most of the credit for everything I presented today goes to them. Thank you. Thanks for Yeah, I think this is a great question, and I think I can only partially answer that question based on what we've done so far. Because these synthetic images, you can study and evaluate them across so many potential dimensions, right? On the quality of what is generated itself, or if you use the images, how these images are useful for something else. Already there's two, these two things. In our case, we looked at how can we, we're not really interested in the images generated themselves, but how good they are as training material for training a model, right? So we've looked at this distillation, image-free distillation through this text-to-image generation tool. And because we really narrowed the analysis um, of what I showed today on how well do these images can be um, used for pre-training a visual representation for a number of classification tasks. We don't really care if we have a diversity of view or of angle of appearance, if this has no impact on the pre-training aspect, because we only evaluated pre-training. And for that particular application in mind, that is, again, very narrow, we've observed that, for example, the quality of the image generated doesn't really matter. Actually, the one uh, bar plot that is the highest on the, um, the evaluation on real images is not the one that is producing the better looking images. And it was by forcing diversity at the expense of less look, uh, good looking images that we improved the transferability of the, of the model. So it's, it's a bit counterintuitive and it is because we really narrowed down what we evaluated to how much can we replace ImageNet with synthetic noise. So I think your question is great. And there are many works that I think I've seen that I'm planning to go to uh, during the conference that are answering part of this question on what really matters on what is generated, if we need to care about the viewpoint that you mentioned, the domain, and so on. Thank you. Great talk. Um, I was just wondering in general for the first part of the how much are you looking to how do you affect the capacity of the model? Because if you have some more diverse images that could be made more realistic, it could tend to enable the learning filters and you know like. I don't know if some of those related to better performance could be related to or because some of the settings that were artificially generated especially require much to be able to perform. Again, a great question. I will have a hard time to answer because we haven't exactly studied that in detail, but this is very interesting what you're asking, and I would love to discuss that further. But what I forgot to mention is that. Yanis, who is here, who knows so much more than I do. And I will present this work at uh, the conference. We'll have a poster, so I would love to chat more about um, what these models can do and, and, and like what else we can do on top. Because um, this is really scratching the surface of, uh, of the, the analysis that, we, that are needed with these models. So 
we haven't really studied if what is extracted is uh, is different. We've seen how much this helps for free training. That's it. You can do one more. Yes. Great. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, there's so many get images in this talk. I have a question regarding the talk. So you have this graph where you showed the performance on cache class and on the class. Uh, I'm just curious, how do you interpret between these regimes? I think you mentioned it's about uh, different types of projectors. Yeah. I wonder if there's anything else uh, that allows you to do that. So out of the all the components we tried and benchmark and and really, like in the papers, there's an extensive study that, of course, I didn't have time to go through today. But the number one thing that had a, an impact for this uh, trade off is really the projector. So, by having a deeper projector, we could have something that would transfer better, but at the expense of a reduced results on the training task. If a shorter, uh, um, a shallower projector would behave super well on training, but is not the one that would transfer best. So we have, so we, we could really play with that, and we have a graph that shows like how the, the impact uh, of this projector really is something that you can control when you design your feature, depending on what you have in mind. If you very often you don't know what you're going to apply your model to, but sometimes you have an idea. So you know if you want to favor transfer to something that is very different. maybe we can play a bit with these parameters. Thanks. Skipper, one more thank you. Thank you again for the talk. And <laughs> stop sharing the screen because I'm going to put the system. Okay. Oh, oh yeah, it's okay. Great. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot for the talk. Um, and so it's a, um, it's a poster session now and, and a coffee break. Um, so yeah, so I said during the, uh, the intro remarks, the poster session is in the exhibit hall in the West building, so in, in, in the other building. Um, and uh, Take a so, picture of that number. <laughs> yes, so our workshop has, has the poster boards 163 to 191. Um, so it's, I think it's basically, yeah, those are for our workshop, so there's no um, assignments to specific posters, so you can take well, whichever one is free. Um, but so unfortunately, that at the end of this session, you will have to take your poster down and then put it up again at the beginning of the next session. Uh, because uh, in between our two poster sessions, there's another workshop that uses the same poster boards. Uh, so and then another. So we start again at 10:50. Um, so yeah, you'll have to sort of keep an eye on the time yourself because uh, there'll be other workshops with all poster sessions as well, but they end at different times, so there's no announcement or anything. I believe like 10 minutes, more well, like 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Or oh, no, 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 sorry. So the, the poster session starts now, and we're back with the talks at 10.50 here. So like, yeah. they're, they're at 10.50 and they're both yeah. going. Yeah. yeah. So take sorry. 10 minutes to get there. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I, we didn't know that there would be, well, like a 10-minute walk, and that we would have to put it in the but, it, yeah. but yeah, we can't change. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry about that.
Okay, I need to unmute. Okay, so now I'm muted. So I can hear it, but just so you know, it's the uh, I'm hearing the speaker, which I think we'll have to do maybe. Yeah, yeah, of course. Just I've seen them recently. <laughs> I guess I could also. Oh yeah. So when we play this one. You hear you hear. Uh, okay. Wait right. for the first speaker we need because that's live. But then indeed, okay, so then we need to change we change the microphone, right? So then just the MacBook. Try that with you. Oh, oh, my System. Yeah, so it's still the microphone. Okay, let me try one. There's one more option. Oh, so there's like a video option, but that's to yeah. do a file. I wonder. Okay, yeah. So, so for the next one, I have a file. So this one is on YouTube, but I don't think we can download it. Yeah. Can you download it from YouTube? <laughs> you might be able to do video, but you'll audio. But you'll need to update your Zoom to do it. Okay, uh, yeah, so now it just says it's sharing computer sound. It shares the sounds, but then can you share it again? It the, the... Okay, optimize for. Ah, yes, optimize for video clip and share sound, yes. Report accuracy and quality phase using the nearest neighbor performance. We contrast our work to instance label supervised variants. And with this work, uh, so basically, we perform an evaluation of label supervised incremental learning versus self supervised incremental learning. Okay. As a learning protocol, so I see on the we receive a single object instance per learning task, such as phone one and phone two, 
and continue learning. In our first experiment, okay. Sorry? It might be a little stressful, yeah. so, okay. but it yeah. works. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, um, so, so, indeed, so for that, I just do the share screen optimized for video clip, yeah. Testing, testing. Okay. Okay. So, so, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. And now, let me try to share the screen. So, and then, if I now share just the PDF, I do not want to share sound. Great. So, you just want to share your screen. Yes, it's great. Uh, continue uh, running to the break. Yeah. Yeah. We start in ten minutes. Technically, the poster session, but that's on the West. Actually, it has it. This is good as you can get it. Yeah, you probably hit okay. the X on the participant and if it was capturing just during the clip. Yeah, and this and thing. this one, I think it goes. Yes, yeah. I think that one will go away. Big click on the slide. It's sometimes you need that. No, okay. If not, you can always push it. Hide floating control. Yes. Great. Do you need to use the restroom for the next session? I know I'm all.
No okay. light. Okay. Um, okay. So this one should be fine now. Yeah. So now and I'll, then, just, I'll then, share the slides somehow with you when we get on the other person. Yes. Yeah. And then and then so then and then for the video. I think I remember, but maybe yeah. Yeah, we have to share. Maybe. Yeah, we'll have, yeah. Well, first we'll share the audio, and then we'll share. Um, yeah. And so, and so, so he he won't do questions. Right. So that makes it a little bit easier. Yeah, exactly. Um, because yeah, that's in the next session. So that's a video then, and then afterwards join on the Zoom. So if you could, um, just the person, the third speaker for the session, if you could. Ask if she's here before you start, and then if she raised her hand, I'll go talk to her. Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Do you mind if I run by the restroom? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah. washroom, whatever you call it, in Canada. <laughs> so I went that way, but I think there might be one closer here, but I'm not, not sure. I have this strong feeling that many people will. So, you know, I find the book very, especially in the time that I feel fine. Like, what? But I couldn't find the room. Like, in the no one did. Or no one did. I don't know. Let well, he didn't. He, did. he was looking for his. Do you go down to the main? Do you go down to the main? Or are you upstairs? Should we go upstairs? Yeah. We can only just keep it. should be big. Um, and people didn't know either. I see the giant escalator downstairs. Who else is there? And we didn't have the slides. Yeah, I think it's downstairs. I think. Uh, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not yeah, yeah, no, I think so. But it's yeah. at the end of today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't myself, yeah. but there's a because giant escalator behind yeah. the station. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Really deep. Okay, we asked that woman at the end, and she sent us up. Upstairs. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. left. Okay. Well, I have no idea where it is then. That's fine. Right. I haven't even picked up that for the <laughs> Yeah, we just uh, sort of, you know, doing YouTube video. Yeah. 
So we're sharing the computer. Mute to now. Wait, last thing, never turned the video on. I tried and it didn't show up. Didn't know that we have a minute. They want to try one more time to turn the camera on. Ah, the, oh, yes, yes, I, yes. I tried yes. between the talks and it did not work immediately. Yeah, I, I mean, it's kind of. Well, I was trying to do the should be. Yeah, no, but, but, that, but like. Because because the camera is here, so it's going to be it's like okay. it's not going to be great. Be because I can't. Uh, By the way, I found how to raise the volume of this. Yeah. I don't know. It's a hard solution to do it. So I turn off the volume of my computer. I don't think it matters. Okay. Yeah. No. Okay. I don't know if I should raise it. This is for the speaker. Oh, serious. Yeah. yeah. So I think it was fine. Okay. But maybe you want to, once uh, Adol starts, you maybe go out and check. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Can you see something? Yeah. Okay. Um, like this? It doesn't work. Okay, but maybe it's because this one isn't uh, fully turned off. Uh, but this is for the eclipse thing through zoom. Right yeah, yeah. Test. Yeah, it works, but you have to really get into it. Yeah, if you have to really be close, otherwise it doesn't work. No, but but here because it it can go. Now it's on maximum, I think. Uh, so. Oh, but this is not for this. Okay. This is for people that speak through Zoom. Like, ah, okay. You know, it's the speaker. Oh, the... Is, is it this one? No, like this one goes to the yeah. another. Okay, so it's uh, all set up. So you, yeah, uh, you can just. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Uh, and so yeah, so there's no video, but so the audio. Should be close yeah. to this mic. Yeah. Yeah. We think it's a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So did you find closer? I think it's like left a bit delayed, so I think we need to. Okay, but you did find the uh, I went to the, yeah. yeah because yeah, apparently some people. Because Where was it upstairs? Or I wasn't in the room, but it's the, what I understand it was in the other room. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I went to the outside of the area, I think it was just one. So some people got lost. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody successfully present their poster at the right spot? Has anyone been to the poster session? Okay, so no. <laughs> yeah. One hour. Yeah. 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 I can join lunch on my interior. Can join the table. Okay, but you did try to find. I did try. Yeah. And then we're doing a
that's why the first is not a part of the the part of 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 the So, so it's only some of the parents who Okay, so you're in Okay, so you're in Okay, so you're in Okay, so Senior, senior, senior. Okay, yeah, so, oh yeah, so let's start a back with his signs. I don't want to show it for. I'll put also a time where you're looking, but you could show me once. Yeah, I don't need it for like 15 minutes. Oh, that's the time. Only the time. Okay, Let me also put this down. Um, <laughs> okay, um, I, th I think uh, we sh should get started again. Um, so, so yeah, okay, so maybe first. Maybe a quick note about the poster session. So apparently it, it was quite hard to find. At least some people didn't manage to find room. So, I, but at least some people did. So it's in the, the other building. And then if you're in sort of the level where the um, the lunch and the breakfast is, you have to go down one level. Is is that is that correct? And that and then it's it's obvious. Yeah. Um, okay. So hopefully next session everyone uh, finds it. Um, Okay, so then we're gonna um, uh, start the next session. And so the, the next speaker is, uh, is Adal Bibi. Uh, so um, he's uh, he's a senior researcher in, in machine learning and computer vision at the University of Oxford. Um, and um, uh, yeah, before coming to Oxford, he, uh, he got his PhD from the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, he's interested in large scale and, and private continual learning um and um yeah i should maybe say um he was invited uh, quite last minute and so we're really thankful that he uh sort of at very uh, short preparation time was still uh, willing to to give this talk uh, and his talk um today is about the the need for budgeted computation in continual learning thanks all right um thank you very much for the nice introduction and for inviting me to this workshop um, so I'm going to uh, do uh, something slightly different from the common practice of presenting 
one or two particular works, but rather I want to say some of my concerns about uh, uh, the, some of the problems that happened uh, that I noticed in continual learning, and I'd like us to, to uh, address some of these issues. Um, um, yeah, so I'll get started. So um, when I first started doing continual learning, I wanted to find a good consistent definition for the problem. Um, so I went on, I looked up the literature and um, there have been quite a number of those. And it wasn't very satisfying at the beginning. Um, so there has been some tautology in some of these definitions uh, where continual learning is learning continually or some vague notion of definitions of some of these problems. Um, however, there is something consistent um, among them all is you would hear the word stream, you would hear the word tasks, and you would hear the words of not being able to rehearse previous samples over and over again, and you want to somehow uh, preserve all this knowledge. In these definitions, there seems to be some few uh, clear takeaways. Task is very important in continual learning, and that they need to be presented in a specific order. And then there is an inherent assumption is that we cannot revisit all previous tasks at once. So it seems like we have all the components to build up my continual learning system, right? So the components are, I'll first define what the task is. I'll construct the stream. I'll put those tasks right next to each other in a sequential manner, and then I'll train. As simple as that. So what is a task? I really like this definition from Langtel. It just says that a task is any choice of partitioning in your data, whether based on domain, whether on output space, but it should be something uh, very distinct and people can tell the differences between them. And this is where you see in literature, people split the task based on you know, images of cats and then images of dogs, or a task is all the images of cats with white background uh, and so on. Um, so there's uh, 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 anything that is sort of distinct to the human, right? But this definition is still very, very generic. So does this mean that I could just take my data, random shuffle and randomly partition it does this still make it the task or not? Well, in none of the experiments we've seen this type of setup where you do random shuffling and then define a partition as a task without having to have any particular uh, visual uh, uh, distinct uh, properties among them. So this means that continual learning is about breaking the IID assumptions that usually happens when you scramble up the data and sample it uh, sort of uniformly. So breaking this ID assumption in task fashion is extremely important. All right, so this is what usually happens. I need to partition the data in terms of ways of it's visually different to, to humans. So people could look at this and say, yes, clearly this is the beginning of the task, this is the end of it, right? And then I will order it in that sequential manner, train a model on the first, forget about this data completely, train on the second, forget about that, and then train on the third, and then forget about it. All right. Uh, seems to be uh, quite simple. And now, if the definition is very clear, then I could ask, well, can we tell exactly what is the difference between continual learning and, class and, and classical training? Let us see. So let us assume you're doing a single epoch. So you're allowed to see each one of these for one single time. You sample a batch, you do exactly one iteration, and you throw it away. So one single epoch. Well, in that setup, the only difference between classical training and continual learning is the order. I cannot just arbitrarily say, I'm gonna reshuffle the order in an IDD fashion, do single epoch. Classical training and continual learning in a single epoch are exactly identical. There is no difference between them. The order is what matters, which seems to be the case that if I'm speaking about continual learning, really in a single epoch setup, it's about this adversarial ordering of these samples. This is what the problem really reduces to. However, in the multi-epoch setup, where in continual learning, I'm allowed to see the first task, reiterate over it for uh, hundreds of times if I wanted before seeing the next task, really the key difference between um, um, classical training and continual learning essentially is that you are not allowed to see the previous task today. So there is a, the, the distribution is no longer IID because I don't have an equal probability of sampling this point at any given time from the stream. If I sample it uh, twice and I'm, point, I'm going towards doing two epochs, it has zero probability of being sampled again. So in a single epoch, the really difference is the adversarial ordering of these samples, but the multi-epoch difference is um, 
uh, the order of the task as well as that I can't see the uh, previous samples that I've just went through. Okay, so everything seems very, very nice, very organized and clean, and the differences to classical training um, is also uh, very clear. However, things got to the wrong direction all of a sudden when we started introducing some form of resources. Um, so the early works was purely based on rigorization because they assumed we cannot access anything from the past. Uh, but now we said, okay, maybe we can do something slightly better. Let's pretend that I can store some of these samples uh, in my memory. There are several problems with that, and I want to go through uh, each one of them. The first problem is the moment we introduce rehearsal, it becomes extremely difficult to define what is online continual learning. Why is that the case? Because among many definitions for online continual learning, it is the single epoch thing. The moment I see a sample and I'm going to see it only once, I'm not allowed to see it another time. But this specific definition breaks in the presence of rehearsal. If I were allowed to see the sample more than once, then what is online continual learning at that level? So, yeah, so the definition for online continual learning uh, reverses because at, at any given time, there is a probability of sampling those previous samples. The other problem is uh, the GDOM paper from 2020 that shows, well, in fact, memory is all you need and you can just do classical training on the memory. You don't need to worry up, about updating your model parameters in a sequential matter. And it will, always, always, uh, it will outperform the existing models or algorithms at the time. This was a bit uh, um, alarming. So just to highlight for those who, who don't know uh, GDOM, basically says at any given time, train from scratch your model on the memory and do predictions. And this already performs very well. And that problem will only, this degenerate algorithm has already only existed when we allowed ourselves to rehearse some samples from the past without any limited computation. So I could train on this small memory if I wanted for months. So this algorithm, a degenerate one, does not have any notion of a CL setup. There is no class incremental, um, sorry, there's no uh, task ordering in the data because I sample say IID from my memory, um, but I'll give it enough amount of compute and it still performs very well. And it was still comparable to the continual learning algorithms. The argument in the paper was that the memory has to be sufficiently small. Um, what is sufficiently here is up to the reader to decide, but this is not the right way forward. Because obviously, if the memory was one sample only for GDump, it will already not work very well. So um, th this makes a problem of having algorithms in the presence of rehearsal, not doing continual learning, but outperforming continual learning algorithms. The last point I want to highlight, which I focus mostly on in the next slides, is that there is no real validation or justification for why to use a tiny memory. It is okay to rehearse memory, but why do we have to make it tiny and small? Well, the common reasons you would see in papers are cost, because it is too expensive to store everything. Number two, privacy, like uh, the uh, GDPRs or the California Consumer Privacy Act. Or in many cases in industry, um, once you get the data, the data get, has to be deleted after six months, right? So this is usually, these are the arguments for limiting memory and continual learning. All right, so let's uh, dissect them one at a time. Is using the cost as an argument um, the, the, the reasons to limit our memory? Um, yeah. All right, so if we really look at that, um, so here is a table. Uh, I'll, I'll help you walk, walk through the table in a second. But this shows how much it will cost us to host data sets in, in a, an online cloud storage and how much would it cost us to train the models, right? So if I look at the uh, storing, say, ImageNet 1K, training continually in ImageNet 1K will cost 750 times more than actually paying the money to store ImageNet 1K. So if we really are after storing memory, we are saving uh, money, we better save the money on the computation, not in terms on the memory. Well, interestingly as well, sometimes we restrain the memory to tiny ones, um, how, but still use a model that uses more memory 
then storing the whole data set together. So CIFAR 10 is one to 25 megabytes and say training ResNet 50 with large patch size will cost 22 gigabytes. So it's not really about saving memory or saving money because you better save that on the computation. And also why would you use a model that uses more money than actually uh, uh, uses more memory than actually the data set. So maybe perhaps using the, the argument for a cost to restrain a memory is not a good one, but maybe privacy is. So the question at hand is, does really limiting memory solve privacy considerations? And I'll walk through a series of arguments here that this is actually not the case. So there has been lots of works in, in uh, robustness, uh, certification, differential privacy, in which people show that you can reconstruct the data from the model parameters, right? So here is a, an example from this 2015 paper where you can reconstruct uh, the images only using model parameters without even uh, looking at the data itself. There is a whole class also. Um, so if we, really, sorry, if we really care about privacy, we need to make sure that we cannot reconstruct these images from the model parameters. They're already stored in the model parameters. All right, it's actually even worse than that. Um, so a recent uh, paper by uh, Michael Irani's group showed that you can reconstruct images at the class level. What does that mean? So some of the previous art uh, work has showed that an SGD optimizer over neural networks converges to SVM type classifiers which means that uh, the support vectors of the classifier or the neural network in this case are fully characterized by the model parameters themselves. So what they showed is that actually looking only at the parameters, you can reconstruct the whole training data set or a big portion of the data set at the class level that you're interested in. So the images on top are reconstructed images looking only at the model parameters. The images on the bottom is the closest sample in my training data. And you see there's a close resemblance. So if I am able to breach the privacy consideration by just looking at the model parameters, what is the point of limiting um, the memory? All right, it's even worse than that because there is a whole body of literature in differential privacy that looks at inference type attacks. And what is that about? Here is a model parameters and here is a training sample or here is a sample, in this case the cat. And the question is, was this sample used to train the model? So, and there has been a successful, lots of work into how would you show this consi uh, consistently across models? So again, we are able to pre uh, preach uh, privacy um, without even looking at the samples. And the other argument is, why do algorithms get to choose what samples to store? If it's really about privacy, it should be a stochastic process as part of the stream. So imagine you are a, a Facebook user and this data has been trained on your, with your model parameters, but then the user at some point at a random time decides to delete their profile and all traces of it online. The algorithms do not get to decide what samples to be stored, but rather the stream independently from time to time will say, here's a bunch of data that needs to be deleted. And this is another aspect that is not modeled. So as part of the streams, we I think also need to look at ways at which um, do not allow algorithms to decide what samples to store in their tiny memory. Yeah. So this should be um, modeled as, as part of the stream itself. So we really need a, a paradigm also to capture this. The last piece I want to mention here is that putting the last two pieces together um, we realize we've seen some algorithms or models generally memorize the training data in the model parameters, but also that data could be at any given time be deleted from your uh, um, memory or from the model parameters. But this means also we need to, as much as we care about continual learning, we need to care about as well continual unlearn, because if some of these samples are already stored in the model parameters, and a user decides that you need to actually un, uh, forget this, we need to figure out ways to remove traces of these samples from the model parameters itself, not just removing it from memory if it existed. But this is sort of going against the flow that continual learning is about 
solving catastrophic forgetting, because in some cases you do want to forget some of these samples because of privacy considerations. Right. So the question is, why are we enforcing that tiny memory and continual learning? It might be, there might be causes for it, but I don't see specifically reasons using cost arguments or privacy arguments. And I think it makes sense to think about if it was cost, we better think about what actually burns the money, which is rather the computation as opposed to the memory. So what I will do is for the next um, 15 minutes or so, um, make the case for how would we introduce uh, um, computationally budgeted continual learning where all samples can be stored. We no longer should bother about uh, which samples to store. You can store everything, but computation is what we need to reduce because as we've seen it before, is actually where uh, uh, problems when it comes to money arises. All right, so let us speak about offline continual learning. And so this is paper is going to present um, in the coming uh, few days in, in the conference as well. And this is also in the poster session um, in this workshop as well. So here is the setup, as simple as that, three steps. The setup we're looking into um, is that there is a step where the stream reveals a batch of samples, right? That in this case, labeled batch of samples. And it comes from some distribution called that DJ. Now DJ is less than or equal to T, meaning that it doesn't necessarily mean at every time step, I get samples from a different distribution. So if DJ equals to T, Every time step, I get samples from a different distribution. As I mentioned before, this could be a different partition of the data, different domain, or different set of classes. So, but the algorithms don't have access to when does this split happen. And then you take this patch of data, you augment it to everything you have seen so far, right? Essentially, this is one key difference from what we have been doing in the past. I don't care about deciding which samples to store. I could store them all in my infinite memory. Uh, there is no issues with that whatsoever. But then the key element here is that when you update the model parameters, you should be only allowed a fixed computational budget to update your parameters from t to t plus one. That is really the key for uh, that we're doing for for this specific work. And I think will be helpful also um, for next steps. So I'm not going to go into so much details on the on the plots. There is the paper of that, and there are um, also the poster session. And I'm happy to discuss that. But I'll tell you some of the key findings of these um, experiments. The first thing is I want to assure you that this has been done on a large set of experiments, multiple data sets, different evaluations, varying budgets. That's the algorithm, and we want to test all these algorithms according to, um, you know, the setup. Right? We want to update the model and then do the evaluation. Unfortunately, the existing algorithms are not suited to run when you have a fixed computation. And I'll just highlight here the fixed computation is, is in terms of flops, uh, at least the way that we measure it here, or equivalently in, in some setups, how many iterations are you allowed to do under a fixed patterns every given time step. The performance differences does seem to be mostly attributed because algorithms use different amount of computation per time, which was a little bit worrying because we need to find ways to normalize compute for all algorithms when we're running the evaluations. And this is not, I would just want to highlight that this was uh, over a large set of experiments, so it wasn't a lucky sample. Most algorithms were fine tuned to the setup to gain as much performance as possible out of this. So this is like two months worth of GPU experiments. All right, so I highlighted how would we put computation in a, in a off continual learning setup. You don't worry about what samples select, augment everything, but you have a fixed compute to update your model parameters. I just want to highlight here um, that the fixed compute as well, I'm not allowed to go back, but um, maybe for one last bit, if the limited compute uh, already implicitly imposes a tiny memory rehearsal, right? So if I'm only, I can only do 100 iteration per time step, each one of them is a patch size uh, of, of size 100, this is already uh, an implicit memory of 10,000 images that I can see per time step. So computation already gives rise to um, uh, implicit memory as well. 
All right, so how do we do it for online continual learning? Um, there are quite a number of definitions for, for online continual learning. And I really like this from the online learning community in the form of regret minimization. And it basically says that I want to train a model now, and ideally this model should be very good at predicting future samples. So the top priority in this setup is predictions. So let us give an example, uh, a nice motivational example to what online learning would look like. Imagine you're trying to do misinformation detection online, right? So on Twitter, you around 350,000 tweets generated a minute. And then you have an online content learning model that takes these tweets, perhaps updates on these tweets, and then generates predictions whether it contains uh, misinformation, hate speech, in order to make a, um, a judgment whether this tweet has to go online public or has to go to an internal inspection unit or just get, getting blocked. All right. Um, so if the training was actually 10 times slower than the stream, means I can only train on 35K samples a minute. This is problematic because what happens during the remaining nine minutes? The stream will continue generating samples and the user won't to wait until you update your model parameters. So again, uh, if the model generally uh, trains at a rate, it usually trains at a rate much slower than the rate at which data comes in from the stream, and then users do not want to wait until you finish training your model. That means we need to generate the prediction irrespective if we are doing training or we're not doing training. So we need to always generate predictions first and then do whatever you want in the background. Train the model for months if you want it. So since you always need to generate predictions at the rate at which the data comes in stream, you can think of it as always trying to do, do a better job at forward transfer. All right, so how does the setup look like? Um, I would like to learn a function, f theta, just like before, over a set of time steps. And there is a stream I don't know anything about that reveals the data sequentially over time steps. So here's how the setup would look like. The stream reveals a set of images. They are unlabeled uh, from some unknown distribution. And then I need to generate predictions immediately for these samples. And the reason is because no one wants uh, their uh, query lines to um, uh, uh, be uh, lagging for so long until you train your model. So you generate your predictions on these samples. And then only afterwards, maybe two weeks later, you have annotated the data. You generate, you have the true labels. You go ahead, you compare those predictions, and then you train your model parameters. That's the uh, uh, recently adopted uh, online continual learning setup. All right, uh, this is the common crowd, but this does not really capture the rate of training. The ones that I mentioned, we want to introduce computationally budgeted to it. So how do we do that? Well, the first observation is the current evaluations and, and experiments that we do is that assumes that step number one actually pauses until we finish executing number step number five, which doesn't make much sense. The stream will keep revealing samples and just would need to have their predictions immediately, irrespective of how long it takes you to train your model. And therefore, step number five and step number one should not be uh, contingent on one another. So going back to our uh, stream setup, so this is 10 minutes worth of Twitter stream. You have one minute of data, 350K samples just been revealed. You take those, you train on the model and the common practices, you pretend that these, all these samples, nine minutes worth of samples, 3.1 million images or tweets would have been online waiting until you have finished training your model on this one minute data. And then we go back, uh, deploy the model and you know your, your users have been waiting for uh, um, nine minutes in the process. And this uh, does not make much sense. So we need to find ways under which we generate predictions as well for those nine minutes worth of things. So this is where we incorporate the computationally budgeted uh, setup in online stream, in which 
we have to define a notion of complexity of the training algorithm as a function of the rate at which samples coming from the stream. If my model is k times slower than the stream, it will be get deployed uh, every k sample. So step number five with this modification factors in how slow is the training as opposed to how um, 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 fast do we get the samples from the stream. So k here, which is the relative complexity between training at the rate of the samples in the stream, will tell me uh, you know, how slow is the training. But the larger the k is, that means uh, training is slower. But this means also less frequent deployment, because I'll be skipping lots of samples uh, before I deploy the model again. But this also has other issues, because if within those nine minutes, there has been a significant distribution shift in my samples, I'll be using an older model to generate these predictions, and that's also problematic. And this is where it becomes really important that we come up with algorithms in the setup that can very effectively and quickly update on the model to catch up with the stream predictions to, to have as um, fresh model as possible for those new samples. So this is how it looks like as a pipeline. So if I have the first row, if you have a, a stream model training complexity one, it means that you can train on every given sample of the stream. You get the first batch, you generate predictions, you take, you train on it, and then you will be able to uh, finish training just before the next sample comes in. But if the stream is twice more expensive, training is twice more expensive than stream, you have to skip batches for evaluation, for training, but anyhow, you have to generate predictions for all of them. And that is the baseline that we use to, to to put down uh, a way at which we can evaluate training algorithms or online uh, learning algorithms in a real-time fashion, incorporating the training complexity as part of the stream. Right? So we have multiple ways to do this evaluation, fast stream evaluation, slow stream evaluation, where fast stream indicates that the stream is just so fast and uh, the K has to be uh, the algorithms need to be extremely efficient to be able to train on every sample. But we also have a setup uh, for this evaluation, which is a slow stream evaluation, in which stream is very slow. You can spend so much compute per time step, but all methods have a normalized, the same exact amount of computation to update the model parameters. This is what we refer to as a real time uh, evaluation in the setup. And so the key point here is essentially that it turns out that when we normalize compute even under online continual learning setup simple algorithms still conquer um, um, this setup so the best performances usually are don't do anything special uniform samples from the past and train on those with the total budget you have per time step that's usually extremely uh, uh, the, uh, performs the best among them if you add any more extra complexity uh, you're penalizing a lot that doesn't actually generalize very well on these streams. So, uh, so this is the, towards the end of presentations, there's uh, Yasser, Hassan, and Amiya somewhere here in the, in the room. They'll also uh, be in it during this week. Um, um, if you had any more questions, we'll be happy to take those. Uh, but also, we have some few other works that I haven't spoken about today uh, in terms of domain incremental. Um, uh, uh, continual learning or problems with the current data sets for online continual learning, especially the clock data set. And that's all for me. Thank you very much. Um, thank yep. you. So, um, just any questions? Um, yeah, yeah, please, uh, if you can use the microphone, then... It's just, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you for your presentation. I have uh, just uh, so two questions. The first one is, can you define that the first or second slide for general learning? And I'm uh, wondering, because uh, I've seen the literature that there is uh, different types of machine learning, incremental, online learning, lifelong learning. What is the difference between them? If there is any, or not, or what is that? Yeah, 
the second question is about the memory and computations. So you said the other sort of activities in memory other than the computations. So, um, only we that because our own edge or other uh, application memory is can be even uh, longer time or more uh, expensive than the uh, computing the operation. So, if they're computing uh, 50 times more operation than store one data. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. So, uh, regarding your first question, uh, so the question was whether there is a clear difference between all those different notions, class incremental, domain incremental, as opposed to continual learning. I think there are all special cases of what do we mean by a task. If your task, which is the data partition, happens to be based on domain, then we call the continual learning, um, you know, domain incremental learning. And by domain, I'm referring to you have access to all the classes from the beginning, but the images have certain biases that change over time. You always have images of cats in, in snowy conditions and then images of cats in, in different conditions. So the big umbrella continual learning, which is about the data ordering of the samples. Now, how you order the data gives you all these different branches. You want to um, do the ordering based on classes, you call class incremental variant, but it's really, really boils down to how do you decide you order the data? There's nothing more to that. And I think about it as continual learning as finding these adversarial streams um, or ordering. Why is this specific order difficult for learning, specifically if we're doing one epoch? Because there's no difference from it from IAD. Um, now, going to the other question, I want to highlight the, the two comments. The one thing, I'm not arguing against tiny memory. I'm arguing against the reasons at which we use tiny memory are not valid. The reasons for at least costs and privacy are not valid for uh, tiny memory. I can imagine some applications like the edge devices uh, set up um, could require memory, but I think um, in some cases, these samples could be sent to the cloud where you do training on those, so you have no problems with these storages, and then go back and deploy the model directly afterwards. I'm not saying we shouldn't do tiny memory, but at least we shouldn't be doing, um, you know, using these arguments to use tiny memory. But even it is again in the um, embedded devices, perhaps one could make a case that uh, the samples are already on the cloud, being aggregated to the cloud where the model training does happen because the model training cannot happen usually locally sometimes, uh, it may do, but the, you could just also assume that the data is all available for you to use um, on the cloud and then you get deploy the model afterwards. Oh, yes. I have uh, two questions. The first one is about the memory. When on the slide that you did about the memory, uh, uh, it has to be you, you could stop me when you see it. Is yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. So some methods, the memory can fluctuate, right? So can, can what, sorry? Can fluctuate between tasks. So like when you task, you store a lot of data, and then the end of it, you do a step that then restricts back the memory. So the memory while we're training on the stream is not going to be tossed. So have you considered that scenario? Does this address how the memory is restricted? So let me con uh, just confirm your question. Are you asking whether the samples are revealed per step different? So NT here, which is the size of the patch, is different per time step? Or are you referring to how much of that I can store? So in this setup, I guess the goal is to restrict the memory, right? Or to have a constraint on it. But yep. depending on the task, maybe the task is very large, the fluctuation is not like there's no fluctuation of memory, so there will be something constant depending on the method. So my question is how I guess the way that uh, you're proposing this is uh, just to highlight, I'm I think no memory restraints at all. So step number two is about, so you see it's the union of everything in the past. There is absolutely no restraint in memory. Any sample you get, you can store. Per time step, you could get a thousand images, maybe perhaps 10 images, doesn't matter. You can store them all, but it's about how much can you spend? So now you have a large memory bank, infinite in size. You have a model that has been trained on this data. And then I tell you, 
you only have fixed number of flops to update your model parameters on this large memory bank. How would you do that? Um, so we're not advocating for uh, limited memory. Or in fact, we're advocating the rest that the memory has to be infinite. There's no worry because in many cases we can store it. Is that you have a fixed budget to update incrementally your model on top of this large amount of data that you have. All right. So in the setup that you're proposing, that there is an infinite number of steps. Yeah. Yep. My second question. Yep. Uh, in that way, do you consider how the memory would have to scale for it? So, like, if it's infinite amount of data, then it's infinite number, so that it doesn't scale so well. So, when we're comparing between methods, maybe that should be another. Yeah, maybe to highlight to that, so you can store everything. We're not worried about any memory considerations at all. But what you really need to care about is this last step here, is that if you have a fixed budget, so we're advocating for a fixed budget. And this means that, let us say you're training your model again uh, with batch size of size 100, and you can do only 10 iterations. That's the budget given to you, right? So that is a total of 10 samples, uh, sorry, 10, uh, 1,000 samples. You need to sample from this large memory bank and train your model of those thousand samples. Now we looked at how do we sample from this large memory bank to get a thousand samples to train the model of those. So we looked at different sampling strategies from this infinite bank memory bank towards our living model. The key element, the key difference is all methods should be given the same amount of compute. In this case, say hundred iterations, ten patch size, for example. It means that at any given time step, you cannot see more than a thousand images, not because you didn't store them, they're in memory, but rather because of computation. So you can have access to the samples that have arrived at step number one, that's absolutely fine, but you cannot see more than a thousand for every given time step. And this, pro is, this is problematic, right? Because effectively at the beginning, you might be seeing, say, 10% of the data if you have, you know, 1,000 images, but in the memory you have 10,000 images. But with time, the data keeps growing up more and more, and effectively you're doing fewer number of effective effort over the past data because the data keeps going up, but the budget is still fixed, which brings rise to several other problems of what if you're adding more GPUs? So what if your batch size goes up? How do you fix that as well? So it brings all these type of, uh, different type of questions as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think we, we need to move on to the next. I'll, yeah, I'll be I'll be available in the post session, so yeah. anyone. So, the post session, post session, session. So there's going to be a panel discussion where there's time for some questions, and you can also post questions on on Walker chat, so maybe then you can answer them. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and okay, so before we go on with the next speaker, um, th there's going to be now two oral presentations. Um, and th the first one is going to be uh, a remote presentation um, because the, the, the speaker, unfortunately, the, uh, was not able to get uh, his visa in time. Uh, but the second one is, is Lama, and I think she should be here. Oh, okay. Um, yes. So, so we yeah we should set up the um, yeah maybe if, if if James can if 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 someone can point Lama out to James then uh, he can arrange the uh, to get the slides up for a presentation um, okay and so so then we're gonna go ahead now um, um, yeah I'll I'll need a minute to uh, to play the video. Hello, everyone.
Um, okay. Um, it, hopefully, it should work now. Um, so, so the uh, so next, so it's uh, going to be the first oral presentation um, of today. Um, and so this presentation is by uh, Mert Pilekaya from the uh, Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands. Um, and he's going to present uh, this paper, Are Labels Needed for Instance Incremental Learning? Uh, and so unfortunately, as I said, uh, Mert is not able to join the workshop uh, in person because he, uh, he had issues getting his visa in time. Uh, but, but he has kindly sent us this uh, pre-recorded version. Um, and, uh, and yeah, unfortunately, afterwards, he's, he's, he's not able to join us on, on Zoom for a live Q&A, uh, but he, uh, he agreed to uh, answer questions either by, by email, so you can, you can email him, uh, or you can post them to the Rocket chat, and he will uh, asynchronously uh, try to answer them um, today as well. Um, okay. I am Mark. Today I will present our work, Are Labels Needed for Instance Incremental Learning? Instance incremental learning consists of sequential learning object instances as they arrive by, such as phone one, phone two, cup one, or cup two. To achieve this, researchers utilize instance images as well as their fine grained label, and then they use it to expand the linear classifier per instance. Such an approach is inefficient because of two things. First, the size of the output layer grows linearly with the number of instances so it is very inefficient. Secondly, the learner always depends on fine-grained instance labels, uh, which is limiting the label efficiency of these techniques. Today, in this paper, we ask ourselves, are labels really necessary for instance incremental learning? We present visual self-incremental instance learning, linear William trains an embedding network by extracting its own supervision signal directly from the data via self-supervision. Hence, vinyl is simultaneously weight and label efficient as it only learns a single embedding, no matter the size and the number of instances that the learner will observe through its lifetime. Vinyl is trained via combining two main loss functions. The first loss function is a contrastive self-supervised learning loss to extract representations. To do this, we basically generate two different views of the same input instance via rotation, color jitter, and every other augmentations, and then try to match their embedding within the feature space. To, com to combine extraction of self-supervised signal, we basically they uh, use uh, regularization or replay to retain the learned representation. For regularization, we basically force the weights of the backbone uh, to be similar or to change smoothly across different learning sessions. For replay, we basically store a subset of the previous learning tasks and then we replay them also via self supervision during learning of new information. We experiment with uh, two large-scale object instance datasets, namely for 50 and ILAB 20 million. And then, uh, to perform evaluation, we resort to the nearest neighbors and report accuracy and coordinate rates using the nearest neighbor performance. We contrast our work to instance label supervised variants uh, with this work. Uh, so basically, we perform an evaluation of label supervised incremental learning versus self-supervised incremental learning. As a learning protocol, we receive a single object instance per learning task, such as phone one and phone two, and continue learning. In our first experiment, we basically train and test on the same data set. And then our first observation is that Vinyl is more accurate and less forgetful across majority of the settings when you consider the, the, the performance of accuracy and the forgetfulness. Vinyl consistently leads to more accurate and less forgetful representations. Here, an important exception is replay. As you can see that label supervision outperforms same super, self-supervision within the same data set when the labels are present. To better understand this phenomenon, 
we basically perform another analysis where we train and test on different uh, data sets. Basically, we train on ILF 20 million and test on 450, vice versa. Firstly, we observe that replaying with labels lead to a strong drop in performance. As you can see, for example, replaying the labels leads to a 36% uh, drop with respect to the original written data set setting. This simply indicates that replay uh, generalizes by overfitting, or in other words, uh, replay overfits to the training source data set. Secondly, no matter what data set or setting or metric, vinyl consistently has the lowest drop in accuracy, meaning that it can extract more generic features across data sets and tasks, which gives us promise, considering that vinyl has, hasn't observed a single label throughout its uh, incremental learning stages. To understand the merit of self-supervision, we conduct a set of analysis. Here, we report the performance across all tasks as they arrive by. In this figure, x-axis denotes the incremental learning time step and y-axis denotes the in uh, accuracy per task. As you can see on the left, label supervised variant leads to a strong performance only for the current task, evident from the uh, high performance within the diagonal. This simply indicates that label supervision biases the learner towards the recently observed task, uh, uh, task data, and it cannot retain its performance afterwards. In contrast, when you look at the performance of vinyl or self-supervision on the right, self-supervision can leverage the increasing stream of data to improve performance well across all tasks, hence leading to high forward transferability. As you can see, as the learner starts to observe more and more tasks, the performance across all tasks begin to improve, which gives us promise that uh, to leverage a giant amount of uh, unlabeled data on the internet. To understand uh, better, in our second analysis, we focus on the activations of the penultimate layer uh, of our backbone, which is the ResNet 18. Firstly, when we can look at the label supervised variant, we observe that label supervision has a bias towards the background. So it tends to uh, pick up on cues that are present in the context, which is not useful for instance incremental learning. And hence, it basically fails to locate the target object of interest. However, self supervision generalizes by directly activating on the target object instance, helping to explain the source of high performance. To better investigate this, we also perform a, a retrieval analysis. We basically take the features from the penultimate layer and we look at the nearest neighbor, five nearest neighbor, either with the label supervision or self supervision via vinyl. And this phenomenon is more evident when we analyze the nearest neighbors here, as label supervised variant consistently retrieves different instances with the same background, which means the, the the feature space is highly occupied or distracted by the contextual cues. However, as you can see here, self-supervision is able to retrieve the query object instance without being too much confused by, by the background, which means self-supervision can focus on the instance. To conclude, in this paper, we asked ourselves, are labels needed for instance incremental learning? Our answer to that is no. We propose vinyl that can continue to learn from incoming stream of object instances via self supervision. Through extensive analysis, we show that self supervision can extract more transferable features and can focus on instance level variation. Here, I would like to thank you so much for listening and please feel free to ask anything. I will be very happy to reply. Meet Grammarly Go your go-to solution for getting quality work done quickly. Sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, so, um, so yeah, so he, he's gonna um, answer questions by email or, or Walker chat. So, so if you've got any, please, please post them there. Um, okay, so. Um, uh, I'll, I'll stop sharing.
and I need to change the microphone. Yeah. Just yeah, it's Okay. Yes. Sorry. Uh, so, okay. The, so, the next oral presentation um, is is going to be by uh, Lama Alsum uh, from the uh, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia, uh, and uh, so she will present uh, this paper, "Just a Glimpse: uh, Rethinking Temporal Information for Video Continual Learning." Thank you. Thanks. So, hi everyone. I will be presenting this paper, "Just a Glimpse: Rethinking Temporal Information for Video Continual Learning." So in this work, we focus on a special case of continual learning, which is class incremental learning, and we're applying it to videos. And since experience replay, where actually whenever you train on a new task, you have access to the data from this task and limited amount of data from previous tasks based on a buffer, have already shown superior performance in this class incremental setup. So we're adapting these approaches. However, if we actually take these approaches from image domain and try to apply them directly to video domain, we have like a big challenge. So if we just imagine like applying these approaches to images, and let's say we are working on sidebar 100, and we assume that we save 20 samples per class. So the memory size will be around 20,000 images. But if we try to move to another data set, in video domain that have almost similar number of classes, which is UCF, and it's actually a video data set that have videos of several actions performed by human and corresponding labels. When we try to actually see how much we will need to save this data, we don't actually just look at the number of samples, because now for every sample, we have an additional dimension, which is the temporal dimension. And this temporal dimension actually varies from video to another. So not all the samples have the same number of frames, and they are actually really huge. But if we try to approximately like calculate the memory size we will need using the average number of frame per video in this data set, we will see that we ended up with 369,660 images or frame. Even though we have followed the same assumption for both data sets, the video data set and the image data set, we ended with a really huge memory for the video data set. So, the question actually we are asking, do we really need to store all the frames? And if not, how much actually we need to store and we still can learn properly on this data? So one experiment we tried to do just to observe what's happening, we took iCarl, which is a classic continual learning framework, and we apply it to UCF 101. And in this case, we actually define the memory size based on the number of frames we can store. So we fix the number of frames to be 16,160 frame. And in every experiment, we try to push videos of different number of frames. So at the first case, we try to, sorry, here. Yeah. So we try to push videos where we have four frames per video, eight frames per video, 16 frame and 32 frame. And we can see actually the smaller the number of frames per video, we can fit more unique samples in the memory. And actually that shows, even though we think the temporal dimension is really important, we ended up seeing that the diversity in terms of unique number of frames in, uh, or of videos in memory play a huge role in improving actually the average accuracy results. So now we will start talking about the baseline we adapt and how we actually adapt it to work on a single frame. So now we saw actually with videos, we can actually reduce it to four frames per video and we still get good results. So what about instead of storing videos, we're just gonna store images, which is just a single frame from every video. So we use VClimb, uh, which is a framework that benchmark on number of common video action recognition data sets. And they adapt uh, approaches from classic continual learning 
and apply it to videos. So we use some regularization approaches, some rehearsal-based approaches, and we focus on rehearsal-based ones. So in general, when we actually train a, a task K, we will train on the current data, which comes in the form of videos, and whatever limited amount of data that we have access to from previous tasks, also in the form of videos. And when we actually finish training on task K, we push either the whole video or a downsampled version. But what we mean by downsample is temporarily downsample, not spatially, based on how we want to manage the memory, because the memory is defined based on the number of frames, not number of videos. So sometimes you need to downsample the videos when they are too long. So we took this framework and we tried to adapt it to train it on a single frame uh, memory uh, data. So what we have here, so similar to this, like v -Climb, we already have, whenever we train on a task, we train on a video data. We have also data that's in the memory, but you remember we said we want to save just a single frame instead of saving videos. So this actually data in the memory, if we want to feed them to the network, we have actually to take the frame, repeat it multiple times to create what we call boring video, which is a video of identical frames and feed it to the network. But additional to this, now we actually train on two different type of data, which is this boring video come from the memory and the original video we have in the current task. So to break this gap, we added this part, which does the following. For every data that comes from the current task, which is actually coming in the video form, we try to create a boring version of it. So we just sample randomly a frame, we replicate it to create a boring video and we train on it. And whenever we're done training on task K, we actually select the videos that we wanna actually put in the memory based on the framework that we use for the continu continual learning framework we use. And for every video, we will just select a random frame and push it into the memory. So, this is like to see them aside, the baseline and how we actually extend it. And the main part actually we add is this part, which is actually correspond to, we already calculate cross entropy on the current data and the cross entropy on the data that comes from the memory. But we also have this part when we actually create boring video from the current data and train on them. And this is what we call like a secondary cross entropy that we apply to the boring video. And we have a coefficient for every part of these. So when we want to run the experiment, we run the experiment on two setup that actually proposed by the baseline, the uh, big client. So we have the 10 task setup and a more challenging setup, which have 20 tasks set up on three like common data set for actual recognition. And we can see actually by applying taking iCard and back with a memory that is implemented by VCLIMB and extended it using SMILE, our approach, we actually can get improvement of an average accuracy of about 14.7 for UCF 101 to 0.87% for ActivityNet and 20.2 for Kinetics. And if we move to the 20 task, we can see that we also get an improvement of 18.50 for UCF and 4.61 for ActivityNet, 21.49 for Kinetics. And we should notice like by doing a single frame, actually we can store the whole data set, whole training data set for UCF, ActivityNet and Kinetics in the memory, but we still actually reduce the memory size we are using compared to the baseline by 97.5 for UCF 1.1, and 99.9 .9 for activity net and 87.7 for kinetics. Since actually the videos have hundreds of frames and we just save one frame per video. So one thing also we wanted to explore after like getting the results is whether actually doing the frame selection, we are selecting the frame that we put in the memory randomly. So is there a better way to select this frame? Actually, we try to find a more structured way to do it. Like we use a backbone that actually calculate the features of the video by doing calculate the features of the frame, then average them. So we try to select always the frame that actually as close as possible has a representation that's as close as possible to the video representation using two distance metric, Euclidean distance and cosine similarity. 
But we can see that actually doing this has no clear improvement of random selection. Another thing we wanted to test actually whether having this second cross entropy on the boring video version actually is helpful. And by applying iCarl extended by smile, and we just drop this secondary loss and see the one-on-one -on -one activity net, we can see that actually we always have an improvement whenever we have this secondary loss. So what we conclude. So we already showed that by keeping a single frame in memory, we can achieve a state of the art result. But that doesn't mean that we don't need to store temporal information. So the results we got shows that the current continual learning on videos have not reached a point when you can actually benefit from these temporal dimensions. And maybe we should actually approach continual learning on video data differently because we know already on the standard setup of like supervised approach, we already need this temporal information to get better results. So maybe this should be actually the focus of the future work and continual learning for videos. So thank you everyone. Does anyone have any questions? It's quite interesting, and actually, it's more of a connection to see what your thoughts are on. So, in some fashion recognition paper like last year, they were also showing how when you find the recognized actions. Um, they could remove all of the visual part of the sequence of the video of the okay. So you would see somebody doing sitting up or something. Okay. They would remove all of the image information and only leave thousand more in order to move in okay. the same way to show that um, not always context was the only image of everything. Okay. And I see some connection to your last. Yeah. That you were doing, which is also seen in other cases where the random something seems to be deleted by this thing. And I was wondering if this is kind of a direction that could be seen video where you want to try to introduce concepts like motion and, and, and such kind of things, which maybe are in the boring video of small sheets, but they are very necessary and that kind of So, like, one thing actually we notice about this data set for action recognition, like they have it actually trimmed. And this is actually make the task kind of maybe easy and the visual content can give you a lot about the context. So this is actually one of the reasons might need that we, we actually use single frame, even though like the, like the approaches we have doesn't benefit much from the temporal dimension, we can do very well because actually you ended up storing the whole data set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that might be the reason actually for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, okay, thanks a lot. Um, and so, so yeah, so it's uh, it's time for lunch now. Um, we're um, we're getting back here at at, at one o'clock um, for uh, for continuing the talks. Um, okay. Chris was going to just share his slide. Oh, yeah, Tom. Yeah. Uh, uh, Hi. Since ah. my email, uh, yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Exactly. I, so I need. I, I think I didn't receive your first one, but uh, you got an. Uh, yeah, I didn't receive yeah, the second I one. Yeah. 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 So I haven't tried it yet. And so you sent a PDF, right? So that was, that, but also a demo. Yes. And does the demo sound? Or it's a demo of like. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, but it's a video and it's a sound with the video no no okay okay so it's, it's just video okay okay so that should be 
so that's okay. Should be okay. Okay. Yeah, I haven't tested so, it yet, but yeah, I, I received yeah, yeah. those, and I'll yeah, in the in the break I'll try to download them and then. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I have a just one question. Like, uh, like the, what do you share in Zoom? Is it like desktop or?
Oh yeah, and then um, yeah. Eat me. Uh, yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Let's see. Yes, yes. Yeah, I think this is what we use. Yeah. Let me play a video here. Then that's different. Figure that out. So you can the microphone that I don't. Here, so on the other end. Okay. Um, so I think because I think when we share it and then when both the audio and it seems. Okay. Yeah, it, it, things coming from this room now. If they be fine. Okay. Yeah. 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 Because well, yeah. that's your odd. That's the odd. Whatever's coming through audio on your laptop comes out this hole. You have a little bit. Yeah, and that's and just for the volume. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So okay. and it's it's the one yeah. The presentation yeah. here and, and then, then you I'll grab yeah. thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, you, so we also need to share the screen on Zoom because now currently Lucas is sharing it on so. So this screen. So it's this screen. So Lucas is now showing. Okay. So which screen? So, so at the moment, no. If you share it on Zoom, but when you share, but it's the noise, it's the sound. Yeah. Uh, and so when Lucas, then indeed will. Um, in Zoom. Yeah. Share the screen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You. At the beginning, but then maybe sure of a backup button. Yeah. Are we showing audio already or not? Uh, yeah, yes. But I, th I think, yeah, we will. Um, so, okay, so now, so it's two screens. I don't know about the Zoom. Where is it? Yeah, so, so there. Oh, okay. So it's here. <laughs> well. Arslan is going to have it. Uh, yeah, yeah, makes sense. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, you can come. Yeah. Okay, but, but I think let's wait. Maybe. I can. Okay. Uh, I can. Uh, I can. Uh, I can Almost as far away as possible. Like one side of the reference to your. Uh, if you were the one holding the sign. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I'll just do five of them. Are you? 
Yes. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to, going to start the next uh, series of talks. Uh, the next one is Soft and he's uh, working on generative AI. And now he's a bit more for uh, efficient fine-tuned uh, foundation models. Uh, internet. And um, looking forward to, to seeing his talk. So, Luca. Cool. Thanks for thanks for the introduction. Yeah, happy to be here. I think this is my first uh, in excited about that. So today I'll be talking, and I'm gonna introduce what I mean by representation shift in the context of online uh, class incremental learning experience replay, and mostly one. Done. I'll try to um, essentially this phenomenon, uh, essentially similar phenomena that serve in different, and hopefully with respect to the others. So, so as I'm sure everyone, what online class incremental learning is do a brief overview. So we have this learner. Uh, this learner sees a stream of data. The learner receives a new batch of data. Once in a while, the distribution that's generating this. And when this change occurs, new classes are introduced into the data stream, typically uh, disappear. The goal really here is to learn a class of online fashion that cannot the current state of the distribution, but can also remember how to classify previously seen tasks or class. So I'm sure everyone is also super familiar with catastrophic predictor, but I I love this slide with I think more than 30 years old, which uh, shows the exact same phenomenon, uh, like super tiny connection that works. Whereas as soon as you start training on this new task. Uh, performance of older tasks quickly drops, and at this control workshop, I think forgetting. So, um, yeah. And of course, one forgetting is to perform replay. Training on the current data or the current state of distribution. What we typically do is we're going to data inside that buffer and 
we're learning is new data, you know, you you interleave old and new data, and hopefully your model can learn representation amenable to uh, the um, the previously acquired knowledge and also to uh, to the so replay. Um, I think it's worth noting that these methods that sort of always it's pretty robust. You don't need to do a lot of hyperparameter tuning, and if learning system, it's definitely something I would uh, potentially consider. But that being said, replay is not perfect. Uh, and what I mean by this, after you know many iterations of replay, you can reach a performance pretty good. It doesn't stop, at least in class incremental learning, it doesn't stop the initial dip. Here is that you start to train. Um, if we monitor the accuracy of the first drop in performance. And you know maybe if your buffer is big enough, um, but no matter how you're not immune to this uh, this sudden drop in in forgetting or this sudden drop in performance, and this is uh, I guess the, the why we observe this. What I'll be focusing on for for the next few slides. Take a look uh, under the hood, so to speak, of the model. Um, is the um, hidden representations right? I haven't started training on the second task yet. And the first task is a binary, as we see here. Job, right? If you were to draw a line in the middle, a decent uh, cl classification accuracy. And the those triangles here by class prototypes is if you take your last linear layer and if you interpret that as a collection of vectors one for every class, uh, these vectors that are class specific. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at what gradient does evaluate us on these points from the. Well, it's it's nothing too surprising, right? You know, you get a relatively gradient of small magnitude that um, takes these prototypes and shifts them towards the center of mass. Nothing uh, super. But here, once we start encoding points of the new task with new classes, the thing we notice here is long overlap in representation between uh, the, the classes. So that in itself is not potentially, not necessarily a bad thing, but here is where it gets There's a strong overlap in these points. Model will initially produce simply because, uh, you know, they, sh they share information that was previously assigned to a null label. So because the model made, uh, a somewhat confident and wrong loss evaluated on these new points is going to be high. And now if you look at the gradient, uh, if you look at the gradient of that loss, which is uh, the old prototypes, you get something that looks like this. So in other words, once you evaluate the loss on the, the, the update step that you'll is going to be highly disruptive. And sort of the, the, the gradients of this of new task is what I like to call noisy gradients because I guess because in magnitude they're a lot bigger than the direction in which these of classes three and four, but these aren't even learned. So we're letting uh, you know somewhat arbitrary representation dictate how our you know well established prototypes of the first class that we already spend um, we're letting these things disturb that so um, the hypothesis here is that um, sudden shift in in, in protein so if we uh, propel 
ourselves a few iterations uh, forward. After doing a hundred on the second task, and what I want to highlight here is because we because of the previously seen gradient, now for the old classes are heavily displaced from class zero and one. There are much there are prototypes. And because of this, what we're, what's going to happen that prototypes of classes two and three are much closer to the, the red and blue clusters, the whole point a new label. And this is sort of catastrophic for getting. It's really because um, we're, because there's this miscalibration between the uh, internal representations and the class prototype. The accuracy suddenly and it's also worth noting here that there's a there's still remaining inside the model right we do classes zero and one are still very even though the accuracy is you know relatively bad the internal knowledge is cool so now the model needs and Cover the performance or the accuracy it has on previous tasks, it needs to realign these prototypes and do that, right? Either you put your prototypes back towards presentations. What we see is that the model will address this issue by shifting the representations towards the uh, new positioning of the prototypes, the opposite. Are moving uh, from one time step to the other. So to generate this plot, what we did is before every uh, we forward we do our updates. Internal representations. What we see here is that it's really easy to spot where there's a task boundary because we have this in the representation shift. And so now that we've uh, sort of identified this issue, is there a way that we can enable learning while making sure that we don't see pose to address this thing fancy? All we're gonna do is when we're learning the points from the new task, so when we're learning the, in this example, uh, how to classify uh, or how to learn the representations of uh, classes three and four, in isolation. So yeah, there's a bit of lag, but long story short, gradients, and we're just gonna map Okay, no, it's still there. Cool. So the way we do this, um, so when we compute the loss on the, or the loss on the current task, all we're gonna do is in the denominator, we're only gonna consider classes that are present in the current task. And this is really cheap to implement. All you have to do is mask uh, the logit of classes that are not in the current task. So there's no extra that. And we call our method A's for asymmetrical loss for the, Data and the incoming. So using this loss, you know, does it solve our initial problem of mismatch between representation and prototypes? Well, it seems that it does, like at least partially. We look at the, you know, TC representations, which of course is. Um, we're in this huge mismatch uh, between prototypes and representations, and because we don't have this mismatch, hopefully the network still uh, makes the correct classes for these points. So in terms of representation drift, we do see that at least partially tampered down the, the sudden spikes of representation drift. When we look at whether or not we observe this sudden, uh, we actually see that this method is really uh, new data with 
disrupting the previous representations, which in turn leaves uh, leaves us with no. And yeah, last but not least, you know, uh, this also enables the model to learn overall better representation in a much more stable way. So if you do monitor um, the see or sort of the online C of these methods, better performance, and we also get better final performance. And uh, I just want to point out that uh, it was mentioned before, you know, monitor computational costs of these methods because you know, if your method is 10 times as expensive, you should compare the baseline much replay. So um, yeah, so that's pretty much it for that part. Cool. So um, I'm going to uh, mention some more that we've done in federated learning, drawing inspiration of that I just presented. Um, and we're going to see that in federated learning, federated learning, something similar where a bit different, you do see some representation drift. So really quickly, uh, federated learning um, is, is this following setting where you have a bunch of client devices and, and what you want to do is learn a model on the aggregated data, but you have this constraint of respecting share any data. So what you're going to do is is uh, do the optimization a shared model. This model will be copied across all your clients. And then these clients will do optimization steps to update this model um, towards their own local data sets. And then the, the update is sent back to the server, which then aggregates these models. And then you repeat this process until convergence. So in this setting, the, the bottleneck is really the communication cost between the server and the clients. So typically, we're going to do a few epochs on the low, uh, uh, you know, paying too much in communication costs. Where potentially your your local clients don't have a lot of data, uh, you're much more likely to be in this setting where the distribution of each client is heterogeneous. So in other words. Say you're doing classification, you have maybe you know a thousand classes. If each of your client samples like 50, you're bound to be in this situation where they're simply not present in your in your local data set. So what's gonna happen when you do this? <laughs> okay, if you have any questions, um actually if you have any questions, you can interrupt that, that's fine. Um, so yeah, what's going to happen basically is that it's going to get better on its local data, but it will forget, it will experience forgetting on the other part of the data distribution. So again, we see if a phenomenon that's uh, closer to what we see in digital learning. And this is what I'm showing here. So in this setup, we have 10 clients. And what we did here is we uh, each of our clients and we um, on the 10 different training data sets. So in other words, we did 100 evaluation steps. And what I'm showing here, for example, the corner is how much accuracy, uh, how much the accuracy changed on uh, the local data of for for back up a bit. So you, you have two clients basically uh, in, in this scenario. Once you train on the local data client one, how much has that the accuracy of the other client? And what we see is there is essentially a lot of in this setup in the accuracy after local training uh, drop by 92. percent so there's a I'm forgetting so as this um, actually really similar to the one that we proposed um, in the in the setting that I previously presented which is that we're going to make sure that the prototypes classes that are not in the local data set don't get heavily placed 
So if you think about doing many cross entropy, uh, many gradient descent steps on a cross entropy loss, if you have clients, uh, if you have uh, classes that have no positive samples, the resulting updates will simply push and push away uh, prototypes of this class. And that's a that's not something you want because when you'll try to merge back tools across different uh, clients, uh, it's, it's going to be types that were unnecessarily displaced. So the solution we propose is basically to only update distribution do something a bit fancier where we're going to more the types for which we have more data. In your data, you know, you have 10% of class B. It makes more sense that you're probably updating the prototype of class B. So in terms of forgetting, this really helps if you, if, if you look at this plot where we don't while we do see a bit of forgetting, it's definitely clear across the board. And lower uh, is, you know, is one, is, it also leads to better performance. And one other that's really interesting is that is, you know, usually a bit faster. And I think that's because it's a lot easier to uh, get updates on the server side when the price of each model have, have not been heavily disrupted. So yeah, to recap, in federated learning, we have another flavor of forgetting and applying similar techniques can get some of the way there. Is in transfer. So the, the, the standard paradigm in transfer learning really is to start with a pre-trained model that has hopefully been trained on lots and lots of inputs uh, a fairly general model, and then to fine tune the data you have for that. Uh, for that, I clear in 20 that the standard paradigm of sort of taking your pre trained model, inserting a random, and by head I mean the, the prototype that if you do this and then tune everything. Because the prototypes of that head are, I guess, misaligned with presentations because they're randomly initialized, um, this fine tuning will distort the pre trained feature, uh, which will then uh, in turn lead to worse accuracy. So, what these the authors of this paper propose to do is to simply um, first train the linear head only of that model to make sure that the prototypes are well aligned with the model's representation. And once that's done, you can fine tune the whole model. And when Interesting here is that when you're in a setting where you try to transfer this to, uh, out of the uh, the problem of that uh, greatly helps, and I think it's worth noting that this is kind of we try to adapt whatever its its existing knowledge to get a uh, better transfer to a new task in for, from a potential. So yeah, there's that work and the representation shift that uh, has been discussed previously. Cool. So, you know, to quickly recap here, for the three settings that I've presented, the cause presentations shift stuck trying to adjust the representations to the prototypes of the classes uh, because these prototypes have been misplaced, right? So uh, yeah, so that's sort of the, the global picture. The last few minutes, I will briefly talk about some Problem. At least that's heavily uh, uh, biased, but those are these are solutions. Saw that was pretty, pretty cool. Is to use um, you know image and uh, image better initialize the prototypes. A clip which were 
map uh, descriptions of images and the images themselves to a similar representation. What was done in the, uh, in the paper, Elarco and al, uh, the group at UDA, uh, which does some really cool work on model merging, is leverage uh, the text encoder to types for the new classes. By just giving a description of the class, like an image of a dog or an image of a car, you have really good prototype initialization. What's really cool about that is this is sort of zero shot. For have a task for data, well, you can still kind of uh, still do relatively good inference with this uh, this approach. Uh, I'm gonna skip over you know the detail how exactly it works, but is that proposed? They do show that like as you scale up um, better and better. And moreover, the the use of a pre-trained model is really trying to point towards pre-trained model and a scale that's much bigger on on MNIST. It's really important. To ask yourself of how how these pre-trained models and how to play with um, with the current problems that we're trying to solve. And um, yeah, one last thing I want to I want to present here is how the NLP community has addressed this issue of of doing multitask learning, but without the need to have a task specific. So prior to back what you would do um, in uh, in NLP in computer vision, where you would you know rip out the head of a pre-trained model downstream task of interest but in NLP because you're working in a language rather than inserting proper head you can use a textual description of that task and just prepend that to your input exact same model parameters and model head across all your tasks and I think that's really that's really cool because once you have presentation not only are you you know, preventing any, uh, you know, rep, but it's also much easier for the model to enable. Um, and it here, uh, you know, just um, for for fun. I've talked a lot about representation drift, but I think uh, it's worth thinking. I because this problem of be behind. Some of what we consider catastrophic forget, and because this problem is somewhat inherent to classification tasks, you know, are we as a community focusing maybe a bit too heavily on incremental classification? And I think one thing that's also important is, um, you know, for me, control learn is not simply about venting backwards interference, but it's also for transfer like we want to develop methods as we're learning become increasingly compute and data efficient so much for one question uh in the mic thanks Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, based on, like you mentioned that uh, models generally uh, usually have a and I experienced the same problem. Those are really and solution. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think. The reason we see this is uh, we train these models because when you're doing, at least the way that current replay methods are implemented, you know, maybe you do like a batch of 10 points from your current task. So your current task will be much more heavily represented. So if you want to minimize the loss over this distribution, it's 
to um, over, overly represent the, the current class by correct prototypes. So the signal to bring back these prototypes is much and because when you do while is a signal to bring back the prototype, there's no signal stopping. This is there's no signal to to just simply shift to where the the prototypes are, preventing these back towards uh, where. They, So, so any point uh, kind of has this, it's like a very simple observation, very simple people, that any fine tuning method that has like a, it tries to uh, keep the fine tuning model in the vicinity, like even if you take like an empty distance, that works out well, right. Uh, this uh, mentioned it like in, in keeping like the uh, word that mentioned, I think that might be sort of L2 regularization on the weights. I'm doing something very similar on the prototypes, which are sort of themselves weight. And yeah, I know that. I, I, I think at the end of the day, control what happens on the prototypes, the rest will sort of fall in line. Um, but I think that if you also, you know, or um, if you're a bit more formal, you impose restriction on the other weights, it should hopefully give a similar. Uh, Any other question? Okay. Let's thank the speaker again. But we don't know if it's a speaker or if I. So it's the correct audio outputs that we have in. A... No, no, they're in Zoom. Can you yeah. check if it's in Zoom? Yeah, yeah. Audio um, input? You are there. Could, you, could you do the sound check? Should I go to the bottom left? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, how, how do we do the sound check? I, know. That, okay, you know. I mean, try speaking in the in the thing. External and headphones. No. Amy Lona is this? Yeah. Uh, I mean, maybe. The right thing. What if we use the MacBook microphone and ask if they hear well? That actually would work. Maybe that's better. I I we just better. switch mic. Uh, can someone say in the chat if the audio is better now? Uh, can you hear me well, AGI, AGI? Uh, yeah. Hey, uh, the audio seems to be better, but uh, I don't know if, I, I mean, um, it was just breaking in the middle at times. So, um, yeah, it, it seems to be better, though, comparatively, I would say. Using the, the yeah. laptop. So let's do yeah. this. Yep. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, so we want to share that screen. Do you want to drag this to the other? Yeah, no, okay. So I'm already sharing this screen, so you can just start your presentation and then drag the thing over there. Yeah, and then so this one is, is shared on Zoom as well. So uh, let me just do the slideshow then. Yeah. I... Um, Okay, got it. Okay, hey, got it, got it. Okay. 
No? Yes. Is a scientist at the mind. He did his PhD at Oxford with also many. are on all the methods or uh, continual learning. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to have him here at the workshop. You can start your talk. Thanks. Thank you. So yes, I am delighted to be presenting at this workshop. Uh, I've been following the work of Continual AI for a while now, and it's really um, heartening to see the community that you guys have developed around continual learning. Um, kudos to all the organizers for that. Um, so today I will be talking about the importance of power transfer and learning efficiency in machine learning development cycle. And I think I've, I'm fortunate that Lucas has set up my talk nicely by sort of telling us that we should focus more on uh, power transfer. So uh, specifically, I'll be talking about these two works. Uh, so the first one is the is a new benchmark that we have uh, proposed. It's under GMLR. The second work is um, uh, on uh, inductive biases for power transfer, and that has been accepted at uh, IK. We presented that at IK. So let's first talk about this this benchmark. Um, so this was the joint work by the fantastic set of people uh, from all DeepMind, uh, and they were all these people are from different time zones. So it was uh, it was really nice collaboration across all these uh, across these uh, all these people. So um, if one looks closely uh, at the typical machine learning development cycle, uh, then, um, then, one, then one can see that uh, typically you start with a task uh, that you want to solve. And then for that task, you go and you look for some data. You then borrow some ideas, you try out a few things, and then you solve that task and then you move on. This is a typical machine learning. Uh, this is a typical development cycle, which any machine learning practitioner would, uh, would follow. Uh, now, if, I, if we zoom out a bit, and uh, now one can see that there is a sequence of tasks that machine learning community is solving over time. Uh, these tasks change, uh, data set change. Uh, for example, take computer vision community as an example. Uh, we know that the data sets within the computer vision community has evolved over time. So now one could see that this there is a natural continual learning problem which is happening here, uh, in which machine learning community is almost behaving like an agent, uh, and it is trying to solve these different tasks over time. But the problem is that this process is is manual. Uh, it is not automated. It is not efficient. And each time you try and solve a new task, you almost start from scratch. Uh, I would like to argue that this. Uh, development cycle even holds in this era of foundation models. So if you talk about what is happening these days, so you train a very large foundation model on a huge amount of data. Then you adapt that model uh, and fine tune it on downstream tasks. And once uh, new pre-trained data becomes available, then you almost discard the, the existing foundation model and you train a new model from scratch. And this is quite graceful. Uh, think about uh, when OpenAI has trained GPT-4, they almost discarded GPT-3. So the millions of dollars spent on training GPT-3 has gone to waste. So we believe that there are huge opportunities by considering this whole process of development uh, and thinking about this whole process as a continual learning problem. So specifically in this process, uh, we want to exploit the pre-existing knowledge and improve the generalization performance of each new task as it arrives sequentially. And this is what we call as the power transfer. So this is what an ML practitioner, as I already said, would typically do. Uh, you uh, build on your existing knowledge, uh, your, your current expertise when developing a new, new model for a new data set or a new task. So then a continual learning dream would be to automate this whole process uh, by transferring knowledge from previous tasks to new tasks. 
uh, while keeping in check the computational practical concerns, which uh, other speakers have already also talked about. So this is the continual learning dream uh, that we have of automating this whole machine learning development cycle. Now, continual learning has been started for a while, um, and then the established benchmarks that we have, they have different focus. They are typically very small, uh, they are artificially created, uh, and they lack diversity. Um, so to study this machine learning problem that we've been, or this automated machine learning problem that we've been advocating, we propose uh, sort of a new benchmark, uh, which is over a longer time horizon. It has more natural distribution shift and so on. And Nevis is that benchmark. Um, and this is a benchmark to evaluate sequential learning algorithms uh, that ingest one task at a time. Uh, this benchmark is, we believe, uh, at a more realistic scale, and the, the distribution shifts are more natural. So let's talk about how we constructed this benchmark. So uh, we first gather uh, a lot of computer vision proceedings, almost from the last 30 years. Then we sorted these proceedings in the chronological order from the year 1992 to 2022-21. Uh, then from each year, we sampled almost 90 papers. Uh, then we only kept we only kept the image classification task from each paper to make the problem more uh, tenable. And then we filtered out a few data sets, uh, which did not pass uh, some general criteria, such as the data set availability or the licensing uh, issues. So now if we follow this process for the last 30 years of computer vision research, and we remove the duplicates, uh, then we sort of end up with almost 100 tasks uh, with a total number of 8 million images. And these tasks are diverse, uh, the distribution is non-stationary. Uh, you can see that different domains such as texture classification, satellite imagery, or medical analysis, they appear and they disappear over time. Uh, size of these data sets grow over years. So you can think of this benchmark as uh, sort of data sets which the vision community has developed over the last 30 years, and we just automated the process. So now the benchmark that we end up quite simple, since that we ask, we open source the code, the task selection is unbiased. Uh, this is not split CPAR or split ImageNet. This does not encode any one researcher's biases. Rather, it encodes the computer vision community, uh, and the scale is relatively large. So these are the examples of some of the data sets that we have. So you can see that we have medical imaging data sets, um, text classification data sets, object classification data sets, um, X-ray data sets, and so on and so forth. So quite diverse. So let's talk about the metrics. Uh, so we evaluate two metrics. So one for the efficiency and one for the efficacy. So for efficacy, we measure the error rate, uh, which is uh, quite typical for the image classification models. For the efficiency, we measure the cumulative flocks used by each algorithm. And as different speakers uh, throughout the day talked about that we should consider the computational cost while comparing different models. So we, we think that we also second that opinion. Uh, so how we sort of represent uh, the results. So we, we plot this uh, error compute Perito map and the model which dominates, uh, Perito dominates uh, all the other learners is typically the best learner. So a learner which at the lowest possible compute achieved the best possible error, of course, is going to be the best learner. And not only that, as you scale the compute, uh, the error should uh, improve, uh, and it should improve much quickly compared to the other learners. Um, so the training and evaluation protocol is slightly tricky, so I'll spend some, uh, some more time on this. So, uh, so as I said, so we have a data set consisting of almost 30 years. So we divide and 
So there is a stream of tasks and tasks are occurring sequentially. So we divide this stream into two buckets. So the first 27 years is, uh, is a stream what we call as meta train stream. And the last three years is a stream what we call as meta test stream. And both these streams occur uh, sequentially. So learner can go through the meta train stream as much time as it wants, multiple times, for tuning hyperparameters and whatnot. But the meta test stream will be shown only once because this is where your generalization will be measured. So uh, there are two concepts here. So, so one concept is of a meta learner, and the one other concept is the task specific learner. So the meta learner has access to the whole stream, it has the visibility for the whole stream, which is denoted by N here. And then there's a task specific learner which can. Uh, which only has access to the data set of that task. So the job of the meta learner is to instantiate the task learners for each task, uh, and they can also store some states on the task learners as well. So again, two learners, meta learner and the task specific learner. The task specific learner will only be looking at the specific task, but the meta learner can look at the data set, can look at the whole stream. So since we have two different learners, so we have two different set of hyperparameters that we need to tune. Um, so typically the hyperparameters for meta learner would be the kind of architecture that we're using, ResNet, VGB, visual transformer, whatnot, uh, optimizers, data augmentations, et cetera. And you want to fix that for the whole stream. So these are the hyperparameters for meta learner, and these hyperparameters will be tuned at stream level uh, using the meta train stream. And as I said, meta train stream can be replayed multiple times because you need to figure out the best kind of architecture that you want to use for the meta train for the for this whole stream. Then once the meta learner meta learner's hyperparameters are tuned after replaying the meta train stream multiple times. You fix the meta learner and then you start executing your then you start executing your uh, final training run on both the meta train and meta test stream. Uh, on the meta train stream, you, you tune the task level, task level hyperparameters such as learning date, number of epochs, etc. Um, okay, let me back up. So uh, task level hyperparameters include the learning rate and number of epochs. Uh, during the first stage of training, which is the meta, which, which what we call as meta training, uh, you only you, you you use the validation set of the of each task to train the to figure out the best hyperparameters for the task, but also to figure out the best hyperparameters for the uh, for the meta learner. Once a meta learner is tuned, you start the second phase of training. Which what what we call as meta test stage, and in this phase, you play we play meta train stream once more, and we keep the meta learner hyperparameters fixed, and we report the task performance using the actual test set uh, of the uh, of each task. Not only we play task in meta train stream in this phase, but we also play the task in the meta test stream, and we measure the generalization performance on the meta test stream because that is played only once. So you can see there that the error rate is actually computed only on the test stream, but the flops in this case, the cumulative flops are computed on both the train and the test stream. So you want a learner which achieves the lowest possible error on the test stream uh, while going through as minimum, as low stream as possible. Uh, I know it's slightly con convoluted. Uh, so if this is not clear, I would invite you to go through uh, it. Every time I read the, uh, if I were to prepare the slides or uh, rewrite the paper myself, so I would invite you to go through the paper as well. So I think the the, the key idea that you need there are two different learners, meta learner, which has access to the whole stream, um, and the task level learner, one kind of and so, so this is one, and the other is there are two stream and meta test. 
my friend you can do whatever you want but meta test i'll show you only once and i'll measure your only on the meta test stream but put on both the train and the test stream in the paper we also provide justification for why this is the protocol that we use so now let me share some results so first compare different baseline in the paper so first one is the independent baseline and this an independent model on the data set of the current task only so there is ask about so ever from previous tasks and based on fine tuning from the best encountered model so we found a task which is more uh and for that we use kn based similarity metric and then we take that checkpoint and start fine tuning using that checkpoint so now there is some transfer using the most similar task uh the third baseline that we use is the multitask learning simultaneous to train on all the tasks using and task specific as so here are the results uh, this is the pareto front uh, that i the cartoon uh before explaining the details that represents So first, x-axis is the compute, y-axis is the error. X-axis is in the log scale. Each point basically represents about hundred and seven tasks, about seventeen hundred experiments. So think of each point as uh, running a random search of sixteen hyperparameter configurations for each task, uh, and then some. and the average error rate across all the tasks so uh, if you look at uh, this uh, these pareto fronts so red there there is no knowledge it's not a very really efficient learner even if you increase the compute not uh, decrease as fast as compared to some other learners which knowledge the most Tuning from the most relevant task, uh, task learner, which is which which was a surprise for us. On the are the models which are pre-trained uh, using the large amount of data sets, and if net, we they can align. Uh, it it achieves the best error rate so at the, at a huge computation of cost. So in this case, we. We added the pre-training cost uh, in this in this curve. So while it achieves the best error rate, uh, it is computationally more expensive as well. Uh, uh, this is a very nice. Uh, so you can see that what kind of our fine-tuning algorithm actually ends up. So in this case, um, what these error errors represent is that point I pick for each for each task. And the colors that we represent different domains. So first, you can see that there is a nice clustering around domains, having quite a lot of base tasks, uh, which a lot of other tasks use for uh, for fine tuning. So you can there is a rich structure here. Uh, ImageNet, as you can see, is a hub, uh, which means that a lot of tasks rely on ImageNet, and this is something which as a computer vision community discovered 10 years ago and it is nice to see that uh, a machine learning model magically discovered it as well uh, but surprisingly imagenet is not the only hub there are many other uh, there is interesting cluster by domain uh, so yeah so this shows that there is a rich space for research areas uh, here these are the different hubs which are modeled and as i said like some other uh, hubs here as well uh the uh, image and force is the largest hub uh which is not surprising and you can also see that there is a huge dependence among the tasks uh for example that last task we uh, so our this chain of dependence between different tasks so to get uh we also 
reported the regret of the model, where regret is basically the accumulated error, accumulated error with respect to a baseline and in this case the baseline uh, so you can see that there is zero, zero regret for for independent and ideally if you if you have a negative slope then this means that uh, you is at least mentioned than independent model uh, is accumulating some knowledge and if there is a positive slope then this means that uh, the model is even worse than the independent or even try that one. Uh, and you can see that um, almost all the models that we have tried are in fact better than independent, that there is a clear knowledge you can make. And ideally, learner which, uh, which improves uh, as we add more and more tasks. This is the, this is the dream of, of continual learning, like a better power transfer. Um, since um, we, almost randomly sampled from each year, 20 papers. So there is a chance or some data sets might appear real over time. So for in our data set, there are almost nine data sets which reappear across different years. So then what we want to see is that, is there a power transfer in the these baselines? So let's say if you see ImageNet in 2012 and you see ImageNet in 2016 as well, how, you should, ideally, you should be able to learn ImageNet in 2016 more efficiently than. So we want to see if there is if there is power transfer or not. And the way we measure the power transfer is is basically by comparing it to a reference and and seeing how much we improve over that reference. And uh, what we um, there is a clear if you fine tune from really, uh, people fine tune from the three. But we saw that that did not transfer that much. But if you rather pick relevant tasks, then that improves the power transfer quite a lot. And just to see that this benchmark is is not just giving you trivial results, which you can reproduce with other benchmarks as well. We compare these baselines on split uh, ImageNet, which is the largest benchmark that incremental classification implementing classification community uses. So you can see that, um, um, yeah, so you, if you compare different desserts, so by the way, let me tell you like what, tell you what fine tuning is. Fine tuning curve is basically fine tuning from the previous checkpoint. So actually different from the work from the first, uh, Converge as you in cases. This was uh, fine tuning from previous is actually fine tuning from uh, uh, in, in case we saw that fine tuning from dynamic was actually better. So, the, uh, the usefulness of diversity uh, and that uh, not using those benchmarks may. Uh, end up in, you may end up in some conclusion which might not be robust. So now, uh, um, so to highlight is that efficiency is uh, is our reason. Uh, we should talk about the computation efficiency when comparing different algorithms. Um, otherwise, like we know that we know the no, no free lunch theorem. Uh, any better than any other model. Second, to develop more efficient uh, machine learning methods, we need benchmarks uh, and metrics which can test them. Uh, so we then propose this structure. It um, it can it can even test the foundation model as well. Uh, and the goal is or the trick is to improve the generalization error. Uh, give a certain amount of compute. So that concludes the first part of the talk. Uh, uh, now in the last few minutes, I think is quite interesting. This is the work we presented. Uh, so when I started learning almost like 
several years ago. Uh, my priority of focusing on catastrophic forgetting was uh, somehow if I could reduce forgetting uh, on the previous tasks, uh, then my model will, will have a huge uh, knowledge reserve to rely upon and it should make them the less more efficient. So I for catastrophic forgetting, I was always interested in, in power transfer. And the, and I thought the bias for improving power transfer. Uh, but I knew, uh, so in the, actually, uh, we studied this question more carefully, uh, empirically analyzed it. Uh, and, and I feel that the reason that we start that we did the study more recently and not before was, I guess, some of the recent works which suggested that um, if you if you improve reduce forgetting, you don't need a bit more uh, efficient uh, at reducing transfer. So then, what? So we uh, sort of uh, an auxiliary evaluation measure of continually trained representation, which is a measure of we use, uh, and using that, we then analyze the interplay of forgetting and uh, and power transfer. Okay, so uh, let me first uh, let me quickly introduce the power transfer measure that we use. So, uh, if you think traditionally, uh, power transfer is measured using the learning accuracy, which is the performance of the model after the model is trained using continuous learning algorithm. Now, if you if your continuous learning algorithm is uh, let's say trivially reducing the forgetting uh, of previous tasks by not learning anything on new task, then it is easy to see that there is a huge tension between forgetting and power transfer. Uh, so then what we are proposing in this in this work is uh, is sort of an auxiliary evaluation of power transfer. So essentially what we do is that uh, after a JH task is learned here, so we take the representations and we run an ex auxiliary evaluation of these representations, which is sort of separate from the main continual learning loop here. So in this auxiliary evaluation, we either freeze the representations and do linear probing or fine tuning or fine tuning the whole model. Uh, but in either case, we don't use any continual continu learning algorithm in the, in the auxiliary evaluation loop. So essentially what this would tell you is how easy it is to learn a new task using uh, using the representations which are trained by the continuum learner. And I guess you can now convince yourself that why this auxiliary evaluation does not create a tension between forgetting and power transfer. So if we use that measure, then what we found was that a less forgetful model uh, creates or produces representations which are more transferable. And not only those representations are more transferable, those representations are more diverse as well. So uh, here are a few results, and we can see we can clearly see that a model which is forgetting less is actually leading to here, here on the left the less is better, and on the right the more is better. So you can see that a model which is forgetting less is leading to a model which can transfer more uh, on the right. So uh, some concluding thoughts. Um, so we are in the era of foundation modules uh, and people have been uh, worried about the future of continual learning. What should we focus on continual learning or not? I think that the continual learning is still important in this era of foundation models. Uh, maybe the existing benchmarks that we have are too easy. And even the problem settings that we have, uh, where you always start from scratch, learn one task at a time, is not really suitable for the foundation model era. Uh, but the continued learning problem itself, I think, continued learning as a problem, I think, is still useful. And if the existing benchmarks or the problem setting that we have uh, is not useful, then we should rather develop new benchmarks and a new problem setting, which would be uh, suitable for the for the foundation model era. Uh, I so we know that the foundation models need to adapt to the downstream tasks, uh, and when we adapt them, they there is evidence which, which suggests that if you found if you fine tune a foundation model on a downstream task, then it uh, it loses its general capabilities, and there is a severe forgetting or the generalization of the original foundation model. So not only foundation models need to adapt to the downstream task, 
uh, they also need to adapt to the upstream changes as well. So for example, uh, let's say you want you, you collected a new uh, pre-training data set. Um, so the current practice is you always start from scratch and train on this new pre-training data, a huge foundation model, uh, which, is, which is not very efficient. Similarly, if you, let's say you want to train a new and a bigger foundation model. Uh, so let's say you want to go from GPT-3 to GPT-4. So you always start from scratch. So then this is a continuous learning problem. So you, how you can start from a smaller model and go to a bigger model without wasting any, uh, any of the existing model. No models left behind. Um, so yeah, and I also think that this will make uh, continuous learning can make uh, the development of foundation models more environment friendly by reusing the existing model, uh, exist, existing models. So yeah, so with that, I'd like to thank all of you for uh, listening to me, um, and I would like to thank thank the organizers for organizing this this workshop. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. For sharing such an insightful work. I have a question about the first report. Um, the static static. Because you already have different examples for the past. While your name can. Wait, wait a second. More than find a variable frontier. Would you mind repeating the question? I, I didn't get it. But the most customer in this is only a one action for this large joint data set. So which setting are you talking about? Uh, one epoch, one epoch setting. I didn't get the question. I see. Yeah. So, I think the the metrics that we use here will automatically take that into account. So, if you are using more epochs for let's say for continuous learning, then you will be spending more compute on it, right? So that will all worse than uh, any other any other learning. So I think as long as you are willing to compute in your metrics, uh, if your problem setting changes, then that will automatically be reflected in the metrics. So, over here are the flops using more epochs, then it will have higher number of flops. So, that will automatically make it the worst learner. What I'm saying here is that you can like, think you have numbers for single parts of the yeah. Sure. If you can, if you can come up with such a multitask learner, then you can put it on the on the curve, and then it will be a better learner. We like we don't really came in this paper that we applied all the possible baselines out there. It's just that we tried these three obvious and other baselines in the paper as well. And among them, this particular baseline is more efficient than what we have done. But of course, what you are suggesting can be can be tried. Thanks. Thanks, yes, please. Hi, thanks, sir. With your the data set for more than five years, with the kind of correlated data set style. I don't know whether when you think the results might hold if you were doing it by ordering a different data set, but the way you're talking about something like that, if you think like that. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question, actually. Um, so in the paper, we did try different ordinance. 
So this is the temporal ordering that, that I showed, which is the general, the most general setting that we tried in, the, uh, in, in, in this work. Um, we, we did try random ordering. Uh, we did not try this child based object. Um, so the conclusions were different. Um, and but, but then this again goes on to show that um, whatever conclusion you draw on a, on a certain benchmark will be only will only be true for that single benchmark. Uh, so saying that I have developed the most efficient continual continual learning out there. So yeah, uh, we feel that this temporal temporal ordering makes sense because this is the most ordering. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I want to clear up the frontier. What are the different things that you test when you increase the like the clocks? And like if like from experience, what is a good way of getting a good performance? I I for example I presume hyper parameters would roughly say say same for that. Yeah, so uh, so these different points will represent different uh, uh, different uh, size of the hypercube that we tried, and the hypercube by hypercube I mean the size of the grid over which we search the hyperparameters. So you can have let's say a learner which can which has which has which has the budget of uh, searching over a hypercube of size eight. Let's say you're only searching over learning rate and batch size. So it's, uh, and you can search over four learning rate values and two batch size values. So it's four by two. Uh, if I want to give it larger compute, then I can give it uh, a larger uh, grid to uh, over which it can search. Uh, but again, like this is one way of uh, distributing the compute. You can have another, you can have a different way of distributing the compute. Uh, so this is random search. We also try Bayesian hyperparameter uh, search in the paper as well. And there, there is no fix. Uh, there is no fixed size hypercube that we use, uh, and it evolves over time. Actually, uh, we have a, a basic, the this pink dot is actually the BHP result. But it is up to you. So the by default, the the learning protocol that we have assigns the compute by the size of the grid that we use uh, for hyperparameter search. But you can use other other ways of uh, distributing the compute. Yes. Yeah. So we have. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. 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 So. So yeah. So um, as I said, the the size, the architecture of the model is uh, some. Um, Meta learner actually uh, measure uh, uh, figures out the right uh, right size of the model. Uh, so we use the same size architecture for all of these. Uh, so it's I believe it's resonant sixty four in this uh, for this for this particular plot. Uh, and since it's a shared head, uh, the model size is the same. So um, yeah, so it's basically. If you look at the independent, so it's 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 a single head, and then you have a sorry, you have, uh, the backbone, and then you have a head for each. And similarly, for in this case, you have a shared head, and then uh, sorry, shared backbone, and then a separate head for each. So the model size is the same in both the cases. So for yeah. Like in the case, you, you, store, you keep the data set from, from all the previous. The checkpoint from the previous. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay, I see. So in terms of, okay, uh, in terms of storage for fine tuning, you have to store uh, n different checkpoints. But when training a model uh, in the GPU memory, you only load one, one model, right? So in that sense, the size is the same. But of course, you can yeah, yeah you can store multiple things. 
Any other question? Yep. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I have a more question. So, like I'm curious to see the mutuality in data. This is uh, what people we have cash bandwidth. Like, we, we were thinking about like, uh, like uh, keeping cash bandwidth and uh, focusing on online machine learning, mm -hmm. but still like saying scrap and stream solving. Yeah. Um... I don't ask the computer vision community why they why they had the why they had the task boundaries when they were solving computer vision. Um, I think this like all these different problem settings make sense, uh, but somehow uh, we feel that they encode the biases of of the person who is sort of coming up with this problem formulation. Uh, in this case, uh, we don't have. I mean, this is not encoding our biases. We took whatever computer vision community was doing, and we said, "Let's automate this whole process." Uh, and traditionally, computer vision community has developed vision by using discrete tasks. So that's the more relatively more uh, naturalistic uh, way of describing or defining the problem setting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's And so, yeah, so we'll open the depending on the Yeah, yeah, so I think we'll probably need two or three minutes to set it up. Yes, so I think, yes, if all the time is going to be here. Um, Yes.
I I still have people on Zoom and they hear you. Um, okay. Um, the, for the people on Zoom, is this okay? People on Zoom? I go far so that it doesn't. Yes. Okay. I think uh, it seems okay. And I think, okay. Um, so, so I think I think we can um, go out and, and start the, the panel discussion. Uh, so it's it's going to be a relatively short panel discussion. I think we've got about forty minutes. Um, and yeah. So for the panel discussion, we've got well the the four speakers that we we've, we've already seen. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, Diane she uh, she had to go to another workshop where she was giving a talk as well. Um, but we we do have one new face, um, uh, Chris Kanan. Um, you maybe want to briefly introduce yourself? No, sure. Um, I'm a, a professor at the University of Rochester, and I've been working on continuing learning for uh, a while, and published some well-cited papers in this space. I'm pointing at papers about the topic. <laughs> Uh, great, thanks. Um, and um, and so uh, so yeah, for the, the the panel discussion, so we're going to start with uh, sort of one question that well, the panelists could, could prepare a bit as well. And, and actually, most panelists kind of address this question in, in their talk as well. Uh, and and this question is um, given the emergence of uh, powerful uh, large scale pre-trained models or foundation models, uh, is there still a need for continuum learning? Um, and so I suggest we could just go one by one um, and everyone gets a chance to answer this question. And then after that, um, we basically open up the floor for uh, questions from the audience uh, or, or questions from the Zoom. Uh, you can um, uh, post them in the vocal chat. Okay, uh, anyone wants to start? Uh, I'll, I'll start. Um, so in the world of uh foundation models we would still need continual learning i'm going to argue yes for a couple of reasons one um they can't encode everything so if you imagine an agent you know uh, um, in your house learning about you like a personal assistant that's one of the major things people are thinking about for llms uh, being used in the future it's going to learn about you right it may have learned about the entire internet but it, it may not know anything about you your likes and dislikes and things like that so i certainly see a role there for continual learning in doing that, though, I think we're going to need a lot of much smarter ways to adapt these models to this kind of task because they're going to need capabilities like a lot of low shot learning, which a lot of foundation models already exhibit. But um, like these things really have to be attacked, and especially for thinking about multimodal foundation models, things like that. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with like the mini GPT-4 paper, for example. They just train one layer, right? And then, you know, this layer to glue. The the, um, the like this vision transformer with the LLM, but in doing that, they noticed, and it seemed to do a lot of the GPT four things okay, but then some things it was deficient on. And they're like, well, uh, maybe it's because we want to train that one layer. And what do you do? You're going to update the whole LLM. That's probably going to cause massive catastrophic forgetting. In fact, that's what Google saw in their Palm View paper. They saw massive catastrophic forgetting. Um, but if you just going to, is it just because we update the vision side? Where? Where in that model? So in these giant models, I think for adapting, I think there's an interesting research opportunity there um, uh, for, for that. Another one, another one, another one is, um, and this is specific for language. It's hard for me to envision precisely how applicable. If this is as applicable to the vision side, is um, you know training these models is incredibly computationally expensive in terms of money uh, and computer. Uh, how do we adapt them intelligently to update, keep them updated with the world, right? Uh, Chat GPT, GPT four, a good lot of their training in twenty twenty one. Lots more stuff is happening in the world. It'd be a lot nicer for GPT learning to update them in a much more computationally efficient way. Um, sure, I've got lots more thoughts. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's um, um, I, I totally agree with that. I think uh, one one aspect I can comment on this at two two points. Uh, the first is uh, consider a model, foundation model that was not trained on a subset of the internet, but in fact on the complete internet data, right? Up until 2019, mid 2019. 
how is that model going to have any representations about um, COVID, the intense US presidential elections, uh, World Cup in Qatar, and all the uh, things that come with it? Um, so, obviously, in terms of representations, this needs to be updated. And we should move, in my opinion, to a setup where you have an agent that forever keeps learning on the internet, because also, as the case mentioned earlier, uh, if you want to personalize models, people's personality change over time. Uh, your preferences, uh, maybe perhaps we can predict what you want to do in the next uh, year based on your previous preferences. But it's very hard to do it over the next 15 years because also people change over time. And the key element here is for continual learning, which um, I think was a recurrent theme based on the previous uh, uh, talks as well. How do we do that very efficiently? We just cannot um, afford every time training these models from scratch, these foundation models from scratch, um, just to incorporate one year worth of data as opposed to the, having been trained on century worth of data. Yeah, I think it's, um, I mean, foundation models didn't make any difference in the story. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm going to go to Ali. I think we, um, I agree with the, with the other two speakers. Uh, I think we need to understand the premise of this question as well, right? Like what do we mean by the importance of continuous learning in the era of foundation models? Um, if you're saying that the way we are currently working in continuous learning, the kind of data sets and the problem formulations that we are using are even to be useful uh, in the era of foundation models, um, then I'm not sure. And the reason that I'm not sure is, um, if you typically look in machine learning, the progress has always been driven by, by the benchmarks and the data sets. Um, I remember uh, almost like three, four years ago, Ted Yosha was um, visiting Oxford and he asked me, I was telling him about continuous learning and he asked me, what is your imaginary of continuous learning? What is this one task which when you solve, people will take your problem seriously? And I said, oh, we have to split. <laughs> and I was like, but why are you solving people like the other models have already solved it? And I have I have no answer. And if you continue to do the same in the era of foundation models, then my worry is that people are not going to take continuous seriously. So we need to come up with uh, we definitely need continuous learning, but we need to come up with uh, benchmarks and more important than that, new problem formulation under which we can pose continuous learning, which make it uh, tenable in, in this era. And one such problem formulation, which I talked about in my work is, uh, which I think is, is, is applicable is how you can grow the model, how you can start from let's say GPT-3 or GPT-2 and then go to GPT-3-4, uh, cause that is, it's a continuous learning problem and I, I think it has relevance. Uh, so either either you do that or you come up with a three-year period of foundation models and then you work on it. But don't uh, yeah, just don't do continuous learning for the sake of it and then accomplish Yeah, so you saw my talk, obviously I answered yes, and I, I completely agree. I think we can use this as an opportunity to kind of reset. Um, this is your opportunity to develop new settings that are really relevant and practical and can aid, you know, for example, uh, training of large language models or multimodal models. And again, as I mentioned in my talk, there's a lot of interesting research questions in terms of if you have multimodality, you can have drift in different parts of the model or in the alignment between the two things like that. So I think this is, you know, almost your opportunity to kind of reset and establish really reasonable cool uh, settings. Um, the other thing is, yeah, I think maybe, you know, I think it was Tom Mitchell maybe that had this never ending lear language learner. And so I think rather than doing just continual learning with small sequences, I think we should kind of move more towards the more open-ended, you know, GPT or multimodal kind of settings where, for example, not only is a given labels, but could even retrieve information from particular pieces of data. So if you want to train it on new web, 
maybe continual learning is not just constantly learning everything all the time. It's maybe based on conditions on the query, retrieving appropriate information, and then continuous learning on that. Um, the other kind of along the lines of a assistant, maybe using natural supervision. So rather than just labeled, then we have, you know, if you have a robot agent in your home, how would you train it in terms of provide supervision? It's not going to be, here's a task, a bunch of examples with a bunch of labels, it's going to be your natural supervision. So I think moving to these more interesting open-ended areas, of course, it's challenging to define settings that scientifically control for things, but that's our job. So I think it's a great opportunity to do that. Yeah, so once again, great points by previous panelists. I think we're all on the same boat in terms of, I guess, the, the impact that these models can have and what remains to be done. So to answer the question of, you know, do we still need to learning if we have foundation models? I think that probably, yes, we do, but let me split my answer as in two parts. Uh, the first one is as someone who you know does research in computer learning and assumes that some other entity will give me foundation models, or, or even if you're you know doing some applied stuff and we have access to these foundation models, I think the way you update them continually or the way you adapt them to your control learning problem uh, is much different than it was say ten years ago, right? With foundation models. There's a bunch of ways you can insert your knowledge into it, right? We can do prompting, we can um, you know, describe some, some tasks, we can do uh, adapter-based methods, where at the end of the day, the actual parameters of the, of the underlying foundation models are, are preserved. So the certain question of forgetting becomes a lot easier because you're not really overriding anything. And I think in a lot of applications we also have you know, task IDs or um, we can leverage foundation models to come up with uh, essentially to predict which task we're in. So the problem itself becomes much easier. And one last thing I'll mention is what we seem to, to, to see in terms of optimization is that as we're scaling to bigger and bigger models, essentially we get more transfer cost tasks and fewer interference. So yeah, long story short, a lot of things becomes easier with foundation models, which needs to I guess, change the way we adapt or, uh, yeah, change the way we do tool learning. And the last thing I want to mention is from the perspective of, you know, big companies training foundation models, the question of how to do tool learning and how to reuse uh, foundation, foundation model at time step T minus one to go to time step T, this is still the underlying tool learning question that we're trying to solve this at a bigger scale and I, I don't think we've made significant progress as to how to do that. And this is still a really a crucial question, especially if you look uh, money-wise. Like if we can solve this, I think a lot of people uh, are gonna have a uh, much uh, fuller wallet. Thank you. Okay, um, are there any questions? Thank you for your uh, presentations and uh, the answer to the, uh, the first question. My question is directly related to this. So, uh, you know, even you are doing the continuous learning, and you're saying uh, that you can use it to, ad to adapt to a task or, uh, as you said, to adapt to uh, the person, for example. But uh, well, the way I uh, I see it is, for example, if you have a foundation model, it's uh, there is a lot of privilege uh, there already, so we can directly use it, or even if we not directly use it, we can maybe just adapt it a little bit to the person using maybe a transfer learning or by fine tuning, so we don't need to uh, to do any complex algorithm for transfer learning or uh, I don't know. This is the vision I have, and I want to know uh, what you think about that. Yeah, I think um, it's when you look at particular learning, you uh, 
need to zoom out a bit. Uh, so instead of just looking for this one step or next day adaptation, let's say a foundation model and then a user and then adapting to it to the fine tuning and whatnot. Maybe zoom out and think about, as I said in, the, in my talk, like the development cycle over the period of years. And then what will happen to this foundation model as new data, new kinds of architectures would, be, would become available. So there, this simple um, fine tuning to the next user is not going to be feasible. Um, yeah, I guess the point is you need one short, at least this is how I look at continuous learning. It's it's all about learning efficiency and learning efficiency over a longer longer period. Yeah, maybe I could also add that uh, it also depends on how you're thinking about the applications, how you put down the foundation. For example, if the application is that you want to continuously adapt to a, to a stream of data that changes a lot in distribution, that means it's fine. We, we can do a fine tuning or transfer learning, that, but you have to do it every um, you know, um, three hours. The distribution changes that fast. And continual learning is also important in setups where there is really no clear boundaries between deployment, evaluation, and training. It's all integrated into one single setup where um, you can't just at any given time, you know, pose, train after you have collected some data, train, and then test it out again. And you can think about large industry setups where you need to constantly provide predictions all the time. You can't just wait. But these samples also change in distribution and therefore you need to adapt to them. So you don't have the liberty in these type of applications to say, I will collect the data, wait, and then train for three, four months, adapt to this, and then deploy. Because by the time you did that, probably the new data that have been shown during this period of time has changed in distribution already. And uh, you want to be able to figure out how to do those. Um, so continual learning is doing transfer adaptation also for every single time step, because every time you get data, we assume that it could potentially come from a different distribution. Yeah. You want to know how to do it. Yeah, obviously, you know, continual learning is a type of fine tuning, right? Um, just the idea is not to destroy something from the past. And I think there's clear evidence that perhaps, yeah, if all you care about is that past, that's fine, but, you know, there could be other considerations. So, one example is like, again, bias, fairness and other nice properties that the foundation model might have, fine tuning might destroy those aspects. So in some sense, you could also look at continual learning as you know, continued training over time, not just to dis not destroy past tasks, itself, which you may not care about in certain applications, in some you do, but also not destroying other nice properties of foundation model. But I, I do think that's a great point in terms of like one, one question is, um, you know, there's the current foundation model, then there's the whatever magical emergent properties they will have in GPT-11, right? Um, so I think it is important to think about, well, uh, at some point, you know, there'll be much larger models trained on much more data. What emergent properties will they have? Is, is it really, you know, what they say, which is, the world is going to be the full distribution and there's no such thing as distribution shift, right? I think personalization will always be true. Um, but yeah, there, there's a, I mean, I, I think it is also important to develop algorithms, not just, you know, that are, make sense right now, but also in some sense, hopefully are robust to what will exist in the future. So I think that is a good point to think of. Yeah, trustworthy continual learning. Um, shall we take the next one? Then? Um, what would you say makes the current continual learning approaches inapplicable to large language models? Or since there are so many ways to solve continual learning, let's say for split C500, why is it not applicable to a large language model? Um, well, as far as like existing paradigms, I think most of them are 
toys we constructed to study and then more people then said so and so constructed that toy so i'm going to study that toy but you know none of these problems we're studying like split c for 100 split ms this does not have any real world applicability it's only interesting from the sense of studying these specific uh, uh, properties of the algorithm we're developing, but I think a lot of times people ended up falling into uh, the blue arts law, which is we did designing algorithms for our toy problem rather than designing the algorithms for real world applications. As far as the LLMs go, um, I think it's be really interesting. There, there's some continual learning work uh, by Bing Lu's group on like. Um, uh, uh, um, you know, just extracting embedding with the bird style LLM versus um, an autoregressive LLM, but there hasn't been much work there. Uh, I don't know if there's been any, but but I think the main chair challenges are going to be how do you construct the, the tasks, right? Because these things are going to come equipped, right? And nobody's talking about doing two learning from scratch, building an LLM. And I think that'd be uh, challenging. <laughs> Uh, you can only do it at certain places and those companies would have to get buy-in from their leadership team to try to explore that. So I think we're going to stuck, stuck with people uh, adapting, you know, pre-trained elements. So now how do we figure out new dollars that we want to train in coding and it, that it doesn't already have? And then we down, then need to test it and lose knowledge, assuming you're working with the kind of human learning framework of knowledge acquisition, unless you want to get rid of something. Um, but um, yeah, I, I don't think a, a lot of the learnings we've had so far are going to necessarily apply. Like even methods that we found like are just like work super well, but you know, like rehearsal, for example. I, I you can't I I'm I don't think it would really I don't I can't imagine how if you have several petabytes of text and you're just gonna start rehearsing, you want to learn some new error. And now you're gonna, you know, start going through and mixing all that in. So I'm I'm not sure how much of our stuff our learnings from these toy problems. Are going to necessarily be applicable right now to um, uh, to learning in like large language. Yeah, I can quickly share my my thoughts. So I think uh, what is precluding continual learning algorithms being used in the large model is not the algorithms themselves. It's the it's the problem setting because. There isn't, people have not really found a need to use continuous learning in these large models yet. Uh, so that is one. Uh, but let's say if they, they figured out the need and someone has started working on it, uh, then for a few algorithms, I can see that why they might be problematic because of being computationally expensive. So algorithms like which project gradients and whatnot, uh, I think those would be a Obviously, a no-go area because of the computational complexity. But I think the larger problem is uh, no one feels the need of using continuous learning right now because you know, there is no realistic setup out there for these large models to use continuous learning. Yeah, so I think um, I want to see it the other way where. I think actually doing potentially just general continuous learning for a large language model is probably easier than like doing something super artificial and sort of designed to induce catastrophic forgetting, like like split C far whatever, for example. Um, so it's unclear for me if we, depending on the setting, like we might not even need continuous learning methods. Um, like if you just want to. You go from like you know GPT 3.5 to GPT 4, or maybe that's a bad example because GPT 4 really exists. But if you just want to sort of um, adapt to the last six months of the internet, I think at that scale, and OpenAI definitely knows this. I do not, but you pro could probably go fairly well with like a decent run of just fine tuning to the new data, and maybe you forget a bit of the old stuff, and that's okay. And so yeah. Um, Maybe that's point number one. And the second thing I might want to mention is for LLMs, um, I think you mentioned Bing search. I think that these large language models give us a way to design continual learning systems differently. For example, like Bing, Bing search, you can use a fixed LLM to generate uh, embeddings to do index search. But if you're changing things that are uh, in your database or the things you're indexing, and without updating you know, any parameters, you can sort of do this learning somewhat for free. So 
Uh, for me, it makes the thing, there's a lot of applications where I find it a bit more approachable to work with LLMs than with standard models in artificial settings, so that makes sense. Um, just to quickly add to your first point. Um, so yeah, so if you just fine tune on the most recent data, you definitely, yeah. I mean, you forget. Um, I mean, there's been there's been evidence in our work where we, where we saw that. And then that, that leads to some degradation of the genetic capabilities. But as a solution, what we do is we, we co-train. Uh, we mix the new data with the old one, like the classic experience we take, and that fixes um, the whole thing. Yeah. I mean, just to comment on that, I think the uh, first question would be what does a distribution shift mean for language? And, um, and I guess uh, one of the things is the fact that topics that appear online trending um, changes over time. Um, uh, for example, if people talking about uh, you know, uh, presidential elections and then they speak about the different topic, and you want to have these language models to analyze the specs and be able to distinguish misinformation from hate speech and all that. So the problem is still there. Um, but I don't think we have specifically uh, data sets or setups of that specific interest to see if I fine tune my model on this new trend of topics, how much we're getting is there from the past. Now, you would ask, well, how do people train in language? Um, what you would observe in language is that people collect a large amount of data sets. And in many cases, they don't do more than one epoch in that data, or maybe one point five epochs at most. You look at the data, and the data has clear distribution differences. So you see data set from archive on medical uh, PDFs, and then maybe stack overflow, and then so on. So there are clear distribution differences. But then they train for maybe one point five epochs out of this, and this massive amount of data, but they still do IID on top. But then the question is, if you didn't do that, um, if you train sequentially on those distributed shifts, what would happen uh, on my knowledge that I've collected in the past? Yeah. So I think the first thing to answer the question is to define what the distribution shifts look like in topics and figuring out how we would put up um, a solution. But I think we should move beyond LLMs and focus on multimodality as well. So language and vision together and then continually learn those joint things. So at least we have lots of experiences how to introduce distribution shifts and images, visual things. How would we incorporate that with language? Because sometimes it is very easy, um, it's very difficult, sorry, to, for example, detect hate speech online out of only text or out of only images. But when you put them together, uh, an instance of uh, hate speech or racism appears. And this is why it's important to look into how would you you know, uh, update continually these topics when they are trending uh, or things. Where we could borrow perhaps the security shifts or images to infer something in language or make it perhaps make it more efficient. But I think it's something very important that we just don't know how do we define this distribution uh, in language, security shifts and language. Yeah. Yeah. One more question. Yeah, sorry, I don't think the microphone goes over here. Two questions actually. One is in practice, if I have a model to say that classified for some of the same classes, I have. you speak up a little bit? Yes, let's say I have a model and detect three classes, right? You know, I want to add three more classes, right? Without having access to the training data set, the data sets, and we want to use uh, continual learning uh, to show the new data without the data that's, that's one problem. So the problem is if um, I have a set in classes, uh, but then have new domains of those in classes, let's say uh, with the model training, your data, right? The actual now, yeah, all the right? Uh, does for both of the continual working uh, will be functional uh, at some level, or do uh, you think it's, it might not be functional right now? The future is probably be close, but uh, maybe the next few years will happen someday. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. 
I could just reconfirm the question. Yeah, yeah. So just just to confirm if it's correct me if I'm wrong or not. But your question is, are we we are very good at continual learning plus incremental. And the question is, it could also happen that we also have domain incremental setups. Yeah, yeah that's that's one of them. That's one of them. Yeah. So whether techniques working for class incremental would also work for domain incremental. So that's the yeah. question. So um. I would say personally, um, we shouldn't care much about if it's domain incremental or class incremental. To the best of our knowledge, from an algorithm side, it doesn't know when a domain has happened in, in principle. And all what you should care about is you have a new data, you appended to it from, from a continual learning perspective, at least how so they see it, is that you are able to perform well if you aggregated all the data you have from the past and then you evaluate your model, it has to perform well on this. Now, whether the split comes because the classes are being incremental or whether there's a domain shift, those are just, uh, I think, um, details of the bigger problem. They're more like for me as an ablation study of one specific choice of a distributed of, a, of order of samples in the stream in general. Um, now, the class incremental is very, very specific. And the reason is, you, the moment you receive a new class, you already know it's a class bound. So you start generating algorithms that are very specific to deciding when a task boundary has happened. And I think that's generally could be uh, you know counterproductive in general. And you shouldn't rely on those class boundaries, but class incremental by design is a task boundary type scenario. So perhaps working on domain incremental setups is a little bit more general. Thing than the specific, specific instance of class incremental. Um, but I don't see personally a reason for why domain incremental wouldn't work with class incremental. So, yeah. I, I agree. I, I know that's nice that other people agree about this. Um, but um, I, I think we kind of like in the literature have gotten like way too tied to these specific problems. Who, who needs class incremental learning? When, when is it a real world problem? Like, like when did, when do we see just, oh, I'm never going to see this class again, ever. Um, and that's why we're kind of setting up our algorithms, right? And I think it's a fantastic, like, ablation study, like a way to study, you know, what's the behavior of the algorithm under an extremely adversarial distribution that's going to induce catastrophic forgetting in a conventional method. But then, you know, it'd be great to test the same algorithm on a domain increment, which is another extreme outlier. I would say we just need to have like a battery of different kind of distributions, friendly, unfriendly, very unfriendly, and see how I do under these different conditions. And maybe some mitigation strategies will work better or worse for some of these. But then um, I, I think of it uh, in, in the same way. We just we get more data over time, and there's something about the distribution of that data that could be friendly or unfriendly. And our ideal cat learner would uh, be invariant to that uh, distribution. I mean, we totally agree with this. I think it's just uh, an ablation study. So, what it, when, personally, I think whenever one does an experiment on the toilet, they have to list how it does perform under these choices of this ordering of the data in general. So for me, it's more like an ablation study rather than worrying with this work and this all. Uh, so, totally yeah. agree on that. Strange for me, disagree. <laughs> no, 100%. I think that's because, like, we, we've sort of defined these settings and we started to, I guess, yeah, overfit to these settings. We're designing methods that are so specific to solving the problems that are artificially created or that are um, sort of a side effect of how we decided to do the settings that. Um, you know, it's unclear if, you know, the state of the art in one setting will actually even transfer to the other one. And uh, and it's really nice to have these discussions and to see that the community is sort of ready to, you know, turn the page and start focusing on, on something new. And I think that's a really good first step. Um, so, yeah, exciting stuff. Next year's uh, workshop is going to be uh, even more interesting. <laughs> I, I'm more skeptical than you. Um, <laughs> really, I, I've had I've had I've, I've had been in workshops like this for several years now, 
Where we've said it. things like this. <laughs> I've said things anyway. I mean, it was just me. Just me. Uh, um, but you know, I think we still, I think it's because of such strong publication bias. It's really hard for the field to move past, you know, um, uh, reviewers saying, compared to the very you stand there, they did it that way. You should do it that way. Why do you have this unlimited number thing? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's, it's likely that the reviewers of Get and Future Papers are actually sitting in this room. So hopefully everyone agrees on this. Uh, so what if you would be reviewing these papers? So, yeah. yeah. But, but I do think, I do think to uh, Arzan's point earlier, um, I do think it'd be helpful to, to either think about a grand challenge for continual learning, although the ImageNet isn't, you know, just like how ImageNet was, but it's really hard. You know, it's almost like the world GANs were in. Like there was no grand challenge for GANs. We just sort of get a lot better over time. Whereas continual learning, we kind of, uh, kind of stuck. <laughs> but it, it didn't really, it hasn't really matured in the same way with some of these other fields like pro, but it's hard to define what that is. But I think that would be helpful if we could come up with something like that. Yeah, this is a grand challenge. Yeah. I think one potential difference between this and you know other panels of the last year is that I guess you guys definitely have a much broader um, sense of where the field is going. But like in terms of like the first step really is to accept as publications good work that falls outside of you know your classic benchmarks, and I I do think that's starting to happen more and more. Um, you know, like just at CDPR, and I think in the work that you've done, these settings are definitely a not your not potentially your your standard uh, you know classic mental and. Um, yeah, I do think that people are a bit more open to asking themselves a question, how exactly does this method, uh, you know, yield something interesting in the real world? And this sort of begs the question, well, how actually useful are these benchmarks? And uh, yeah, I'm uh, cautious, cautiously optimistic that we're <laughs> heading in the right direction. Um, okay. um, yeah, thanks a lot, everyone. Um, I think it's, it's time to, uh, yeah, to put an end to this and, and, and go to the poster session, especially because uh, yeah, right. it's a bit of a longer walk to the poster session than we anticipated. Um, but let's thank the panelists. And... Um, and, and, and so, um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go and put up the slide, but it's basically the, the same um, the same deal as uh, last time. So. The, the posters are in, in the West Exhibit Hall. Uh, we've got the same poster board, so 163 to 191. Uh, and we start again at uh, 350. Um, so, so again, there, there won't be an announcement yeah, in the, the poster in the poster hall, but uh, yeah, we'll just have to keep an eye on the time yourself. So the winner is going to see you. Yeah, it's not a yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so I think, in, and in principle, everyone is is welcome to present in both sessions. Uh, yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. One sixty-three uh, to one ninety-one. Yeah. Um, two. Yeah. <laughs>
Hi everyone, my name is Shopper Wong from Harbin Institute of Technology. Thank you very much for inviting me to present here. I'm so sorry that I cannot attend the workshop in person for the visa issue.
Um, okay, okay. Um, I, I think we, we should start again. I think not everyone is back from the poster session yet, but um, but, but yeah, I think we, sh we should get started. Um, it's otherwise we get off our schedule. Um, so um, maybe first to check um, for the people on Zoom. Uh, is it is is can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, great. Okay. Um, okay, so um, so so the next speaker um, is is going to be the, the the last invited speaker of the day, uh, and it is uh, Xia Ping Hong, uh, uh, who is a professor at the the Harbin Institute of Technology in in China. Uh, and so, in in his research, he is uh, uh, he's been interested in, in continual learning for for several years, and he's uh, he's perhaps most well known for for his work on uh, on few shots plus incremental learning, uh, but he has also worked on several other topics uh, within continual learning, and I think he's he's going to talk about those uh, those today. Uh, so, unfortunately, uh, Xia Ping is not able to join the workshop in person uh, because uh, he had issues getting his his visa on time. Uh, but we're very grateful that uh, instead he uh, uh, he has recorded a, a video of his talk for us, uh, which we're going to play now. Uh, and then after his talk, um, he uh, he will try to join us on Zoom for a live Q and A session. Uh, and well, we're especially grateful because I think it's uh, it's very early for him. It's, it's Monday morning already, but I think uh, six a.m. or something. Um, okay, um, so uh, we'll we'll first play the play the talk. Hi everyone, my name is Xiao Peng Hong from Harbin Institute of Technology. Thank you very much for inviting me to present here. I'm so sorry that I cannot attend the workshop in person for the visa issue. And the topic for my talk today is incremental knowledge accumulation from rehearsal to prompt learning. This figure shows the classic machine learning pipeline. When the problem is defined, given a data set, machine learning algorithm is performed to train a model on that data set and later can be deployed. However, when facing continuous data streams in the future, this algorithm is unable to use previously learned knowledge and must start the, pro the learning process from scratch. And that's why we call it static machine learning. To enable continual machine learning, we have to bend this straight pipeline into a loop. So there must be something related to version control. On this basis, we can define continuous machine learning as follows. It's for the case where old data is not visible and the knowledge from new samples can be continuously learned and the model's performance can be improved continuously by accumulating knowledge. Well, I suppose most of you are familiar with the phenomena of catastrophic forgetting when you're attending our workshop, so I just skip this slide. And now I will briefly go through different uh, incremental learning paradigms in the context of image classification or object recognition. The first one is domain incremental learning. For example, we may firstly see pictures of horses taken from the side. Later, we may learn those from the frontal views or with expressions. Uh, the most popular one is the class incremental learning, which learn different categories increasingly. In CVPR 2020, we place significant emphasis on the task of field shot class incremental learning, which aims to make the model learn new knowledge incrementally using only a few new training samples. Compared with normal CIL, it's more practical. And last year, we defined the decentralized class incremental learning. 
So what is big centralized class incremental learning? It's about how to perform incremental learning in the scenario where data is distributed across different local sites, which are commonly referred to as data silos. In that paper, we define decentralized class incremental learning. We also propose a baseline decentralized method to decentralize traditional incremental learning method. We also introduce decentralized composite knowledge incremental distillation for this setting. And more importantly, the source code is released. I'm going to share my categorization of continual learning. I think one most important thing is where the knowledge is stored. In the first case, we may assume that knowledge is carried through network ways and network structures. In the second case, we can assume that knowledge is carried through network functionalities. And finally, with the recent advance of large-scale models, we can also incorporate prior knowledge from pre-trained models. Next, I will introduce them separately. Uh, in the first case, knowledge in network, where the knowledge is carried through network ways and structures to better distinguish continued learning in the era of large-scale models, we can consider it as kind of training from scratch. In this case, we, have, we usually have a base section with a base data set to train the base model. EWC is a typical method for weight consolidation. It updates the model based on the importance of weights for retaining all knowledge. In AANet, there are two substructures, or we call it branches, with different learning rates. The first branch is particularly for learning new knowledge, and the slow branch is for keeping old knowledge. DER provides a new solution. For stability, it fixes the weights of pre-trained or already trained filter extractor. And for plasticity, it acts and reproduces a feature extraction network for each incremental section or incremental task. And to address the network expansions issue, they also introduce a channel level network pruning strategy. Then we move to the second case, knowledge in functionality, where we assume knowledge is carried through network functionality. And one typical way to realize this kind of method is rehearsal. By storing a small portion of data from previous tasks, the model simulates its functionality on all tasks, preventing forgetting of all tasks when updating the model. And for rehearsal, there are two key steps. The first one is how to select or generate the parts of the data. And the second one is how to simulate the network behavior. One way to choose representative samples of all tasks is herding, which iteratively choose the sample most close to the current class mean. And the second method is memory representation. Usually it uses the topology preserving network to map the continuous high dimensional input space to a 2D grid space. It tries to maintain the topology of the original space in the form of a 2D grid. I would like to briefly introduce three kinds of topology preserving networks. The first one is self-organizing map. It's a 2D grid with a fixed number of neighbors. It only updates the nodes, not the edges. 
it can represent a uniform manifold well. And we have applied it to instance incremental learning, which is a simplified version of uh, domain incremental learning. The second one is Mueller guess. It's also a 2D GUI, but it updates both the nodes and the edges. It can well represent non-uniform manifolds. We have already applied to few short class incremental learning. And the third one is elastic herbing graph. It's a modified form of Mueller guess with different ways updating rule. We have applied it to class incremental learning. Hi, demo here. Uh, the demo is comparing self-organizing map and neural guess. The left one is for SOM and the right one is for NG. And we can see that when using them to model a non-uniform manifold, which like a uh, catalyst here, NG is much more efficient. So we can safely conclude that Mueller gas is better to characterize non-uniform and heterogeneous manifold. Besides choosing the anchors, we can also generate them. This slide gives a brief summary of representative methods of a generated replay. It's a long and active story since 2017. However, as I'm not an expert in this field, our coverage of this slide may not be comprehensive. So far, we have already mentioned how to get the old samples. Now we talk about how to maintain the network behavior using this data. One first study is LWF, learning without forgetting. But know that it only uses new task images rather than the old anchors. To better understand how we can stimulate the network behavior, I used this slide to summarize existing method in the umbrella of memory topology preserving. The main focus here is to preserve the important nature of the feature space around the old class anchor points. And here comes two following points. The first one, which property to preserve? The second one, how to formulate it and design corresponding regularization. It can be further categorized into three types. The first one is to keep the position of a single point, which is a kind of hard preservation. The second one is to keep the binary or ternary relation of anchors. And the final one is to maintain the carry relation of anchors. The later two belongs to kinds of soft preservation. Now we first talk about single point consolidation. It fixes the absolute position of anchors at the feature space. When the position shift after the model updating, we penalize it. And there are a few distance functions which can be used to measure the shift like Euclidean Mahalanobis distance, negative cosine similarity, and KO divergence.
I would like to introduce a method that I like very much of this kind, Lucia. It uses cosine normalization. Let's forget constraint and interclass separation to address the problem of class in, uh, imbalance, class central deviation and ambiguity. Now we move from hard to soft preservation. We no longer fix the absolute position of all class anchor points. Instead, we maintain the relative position relation of anchor points while allowing for the anchor shift to some extent when updating the model. This ensures that the feature space are still well separable, but the model can be better to adapt for new classes. In our AAA 21st paper, we notice that traditional class incremental learning methods are usually based on single points knowledge distillation, which we call individual knowledge distillation here. And to address this limitation, we introduce the relation knowledge distillation, which includes two parts. The first part is to maintain the binary relation of samples, that is the distance between samples. And the second one is to maintain the ternary relation of samples that forms an angle. The proposed method performs quite well for future class incremental learning. In our experimental results, uh, we also observe that under the current setting, few sub incremental learning itself poses a long tail distribution problem. And finally, the commonly assumed empirical problem by constraint for class incremental learning are no longer applicable. So, we also propose a graph structural knowledge distillation method, which can preserve the absolute position and also of I mean, it's really, I download, I mean, maybe it went wrong when I downloaded the video, but. Yeah, but 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 on here it's played directly from my laptop, so like it's just to download it. Maybe when I downloaded the video, there was some when when he uploaded the video. No. Relation. The first method puts constraints on the. Before update. Yeah, it, it's not a video because it's. Yeah, let me see if they're hearing it too. Because that's directly playing to the audio. It's not very good. So it's also in the Yeah. Yeah, I do have the, all the other videos that I'm going to play later. Okay, so maybe that's. Maybe. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let me try to close. to some extent when updating the model. This ensures that the feature space are still- uh, I think it's better. It was about here. Should we- Yes, for now. Yeah. yeah, I think it might be because I had the other videos that I'm gonna play already open. So maybe that was the issue. Well, separate both, but the model can be better to adapt for new classes. In our AAA 21st paper, we noticed that 
Traditional class incremental learning methods are usually based on single points knowledge distillation, which we call individual knowledge distillation here. And to address this limitation, we introduce the relation knowledge distillation, which includes two parts. The first part is to maintain the binary relation of samples, that is the distance between samples. And the second one is to maintain the ternary relation of samples that forms an angle. The proposed method performs quite well for few short class incremental learning. And in our experimental results, uh, we also observe that under the current setting, few short incremental learning itself poses a long tail distribution problem. And finally, the commonly assumed empirical upper bound by joint training for class incremental learning are no longer applicable. Moreover, we also propose a graph-based structural knowledge distillation method, which can preserve the absolute position that is the unary, and also the binary relation of anchors at the same time. Now we introduce two methods for maintaining carry relation. The first method puts constraints on the correlation coefficient of distance sequences. The basic idea here is that the samples that were closed before update should still remain closed after the update and vice versa. According to this understanding, we can use the correlation coefficient of sample pair distances for these purposes, and then we design the corresponding loss function. We compare this soft carry relation preservation with those hard unary preservation method, and we found that this soft preservation method outperforms the hard one consistently by at least three percentage on CIFAR 100. Now we discuss another method for carry relation preservation, which puts constraints on the ranking of distance sequences. In our method, we only apply penalties when the neighboring ranking, the neighboring structures between the anchors got changes. Otherwise, no penalties will be imposed. As shown in the figure, before the learning starts, we recall which one is the closest, which one is the second, and so on. And we hope that after learning, after updating, this kind of ranking can still be maintained. Note that the proposed method relies on the ranking function, which is usually not differentiable. It prevents the ranking function being used in backpropagation directly. To address this issue, we propose a differentiable ranking function. The first step is to transform the ranking into a series of binary pairwise comparison. And then the binary comparison can be further replaced by a sigmoid-like function. Okay, now we move to the third category, which we term prompt learning. There are two kinds of knowledge here. One is the prior knowledge inside the pre-trained fundamental models. And the second one is the task knowledge within the learnable parameters added to the input or intermediate layers of network. One method of this kind is Dytox, which uses task-specific tokens to customize the decoder to different tasks. As a famous method, L2P learns pumps using a pre-trained model. As shown in the figure, it just tunes only a small amount of parameters in a model's input domain. The prompts are structured in a key and value pair in the shared pool of prompts. 
acquiring mechanism is designed to dynamically look at a subset of task-specific problems. The problems extend the L2B. It learns two sets of destroyed problem spaces, general problems and expert problems, which encode task environment and task specific information, respectively. It prevents all problems from being disrupted during incremental learning. I'm going to talk about our new EPS paper last year, s -Proms. In this paper, we propose s -Proms for example of free domain incremental learning. We use s -Proms based on image model like VID and language image model like CLIP. We provide an efficient way of tuning the pre-trained model. Let's see from the figure. We freeze the pre-trained model and the problems already learned. The key idea is to learn the problems independently across domains so that the model can achieve the best for each domain. As shown in the figure, we suggest merely tuning the current domain-specific problems and classifiers with all the rest unrelated network components being fixed. This independent prompting is able to generate a feature space uh, with each subspace only spent by one single domain and all the other subspaces are less overlap. We believe this leads to less forgetting. And we also study s prompts using the language image model like Clip. The key idea is to prompt the pair of language image transformer synchronously with a pair of learnable language image prompts at the two ends. The inference steps are detailed in the figure. We use KNN to search for the nearest centroid of a given image to identify its corresponding domain and then choose the right prompts. Experimental results show that the proposed S prompts gets prom promising performance on three large uh, domain incremental learning benchmark like CBDB, Core 50, and DomainNet. There are subsequent progress after S prompts. Uh, at this conference, we have at least four papers related to S prompts. Uh, like Coda Prom, Edge Clip, Construct VL, and A la carte Prom Tuning. I believe you can find them at this conference. Now let's talk about our recent AAAI paper, which focuses on incremental learning without interference. As shown in the left figure, traditional incremental learning methods accumulate knowledge in a classifier of shared ways. Optimizing this ways on new task causes interferences to parse task. Instead, we propose to train isolated classifier for each stage and regularizing this classifier by self-normalization for impartial aggregation. In order to aggregate isolated classifier learned from different strategy, we hope to make their confidence score consistent. To handle this problem, we use an energy self-normalization strategy to align multiple classifier. But due to time constraints, I would recommend referring to our paper and the previous work for detail on how to calculate and normalize the home host free energy. This figure visualizes the free energy distribution with and without the self-normalization, which show that the confidence score become much more consistent after ESN. This slide show that our method performs well on class incremental learning datasets like CIFAR and FI dataset. 
and also our method performs well on cross domain class incremental learning and domain incremental learning task i'm gonna talk about our recent study on continued defect detection as we may know there are more and more test to image generated models which may result in malicious events to address potential issues we establish a deep art detection database called DDDB that include a set of high quality conventional art image and five sets of deep art image generated by five recent deep fake models like DALI2, Stable Diffusion, Mid Journey, and, and so on. Here is the statistics of our data sets. Most of the fake images are from stable diffusion because of the cost and the ease of acquiring images. Examples of images on our data sets are shown here, and we can observe that it's not that easy even for human beings to distinguish which are real and which are fake. We show how to perform the experiments in a continual learning manner and provide baseline results. If you are interested, please find our paper on archive. Here comes a summary. We have introduced a series of rehearsal methods for all knowledge consolidation. Especially, we talk about three kinds of topology preserving networks for uh, choosing anchor points. And we also discuss how to preserve the topology structure for single points or binary ternary relation to carry relation of the memory feature space. And we also talk about methods for efficiently fine tuning the pre trained models for continuous. First, we talk about parameter freezing and efficient tuning based on models like VID and also language vision models like KID. It somehow indicates which models or parameters should be tuned and which ones should be fixed. Secondly, we also introduce a classification head. Yeah, I'll, I'll just restart it again. modules or parameters should be tuned and which ones should be fixed. Secondly, we also introduce a classification head isolation and aggregation method based on energy self-normalization, which enables scalable classification. And we have placed significant emphasis on decentralized incremental learning and few short incremental learning. And we also uh, talk about uh, how to combine continual learning research with deep fake detection. We prepare a GitHub repository for incremental learning with papers, surveys, toolboxes, talks, and so on, with full respect to Xiaolin Liu's awesome repository. To conclude, this NMI paper last year described six key features of lifelong learning. Just in my humble opinion, the first three have been extensively studied, while the later three require further attention. I would like to share with you some open questions in the new GPT and AGI era. First, what are the research directions or points for continual learning in the context of a large fundamental, large multi-model, and large generative models. Second, what is the relation 
between in context learning for large models and continued learning. Third, what is the role of continued learning should play within the new AI architecture? My final message is to thank you. Thank you to my cooperators and thank you for listening. Um, okay. Um, th thanks a lot, uh, Xia Peng. Um, yeah, are, are are you on Zoom and can you can you hear me? Ah uh, yes, here. Ah hi. Ah great. Hi. Thanks. Thanks hey. a lot. For... <laughs> Sorry <laughs> that I cannot attend your workshop in person. Uh, no, yeah. I mean, I mean that it was was not your fault. I'm I'm very sorry you were not able to join. And yeah, thanks a lot for for sending us the video and. Um, and, and, and for joining us on Zoom uh, so early for you. Um, and, and yeah, and our apologies, there, there were some issues playing the video. I think, um, I think yeah, my, my laptop um, had some issues halfway through the talk, um, apologies for that. Um, but Sorry. yeah, so um, are, are there any questions um, anyone has for, uh, for Professor Xayo Peng Hong? Um, okay. Um, let, let, let me um, ask the first question. Um, so I, I had a question um, about um, the uh, the method or the approach uh, as prompts that you um, that you propose um, that you described. Yeah. Uh, so so I was wondering. Um, um, yeah, it, it went a bit fast, but um, the the way I understood it was that 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 basically for for each domain you um, you you learned uh, a, a different set of prompts. Yes, uh, but I was wondering. So, does that mean that that each domain is is learned completely independently from from all of the other domains, or is is and which would preclude any any transfer of information between the domains, or is there is is there actually a way of, of transfer uh, between the different domains that are uh, that are being learned? Uh, well, it's a very good question. Uh, in, in our method, we separate the training of different uh, domains. And the, uh, when we, uh, how can I say this? One minute. Yeah. Uh, when we perform the prediction, we should choose the correct prompts first and then perform the interference for the, for, for the second time. So, uh, I mean, uh, our prediction are two stages. The first stage, in the first stage, we choose the right prompts for that domain, and then we perform interference. Okay. Yeah. Um, th thank you. Um, and um, we've got another question um, coming from Zoom, um, from um, uh, from Hava Siegelman. Um, she, she asks, um, uh, yes, so she, she asks also about, about the prompts. Um, and I, I guess her question is a bit more general. She asks um, whether you can explain um, why prompts um, why prompts well, need lifelong learning, but but I guess why prompts are are needed for for lifelong learning. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a good question. So uh, I think things change when. A big, a uh, large model comes on. So, uh, I think the most thing is to respect the knowledge uh, which has already been learned by pre-trained model. So, uh, the, the the other thing left for us is to uh, efficient tuning the model and without destroying the 
the knowledge already in the model. So I, I think prompts, prompts learning provide such an efficient way of doing this. So uh, I think prompt learning is a, 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 a better way to, to learn, to perform continued learning within the era of a large scale model. So I, I think it's a necessary way. <laughs> Uh, okay, th thank you. And then um, th th there's, an, uh, yes, um, so there's another question on Zoom as well, but uh, I think we've got time for two questions. Um, so, so there's mm -hmm. one more question for Zoom, and then I think yeah. someone in the audience has a question here. So okay. Can I do the Zoom first? Uh, so it's, uh, the, the question is um, about um, ASN. Yeah. Uh, or e ESN. Um, do you think it is possible, do you think it is possible to apply um, uh, this method ESN under a multimodal paradigm, uh, for example, for token classification problem? Ah, yes, yes. I, I think the answer, of course, is yes. And uh, But in multimodal context, we should perform more for a line, multiple or, or different modalities. So I think it is, the answer is yes, but we need more efforts in aligning the information from different modalities. Uh, yeah. Okay, and then so we have a question from the audience here. Yeah. The, uh, yes. Yeah, so, sorry, I think you can't, you can't see him, but you should be able to hear him. Mm, no problem. Uh, since uh, uh, large um, large models and transformers, the complex signal is computationally expensive, and we need probably for computer like not scale to very large scales. Examples to that aspect of computer learning or could you hear the question? Uh, I could not hear it okay. clearly. Oh, sorry, sorry. But do you maybe want to? Sorry, do you want, maybe want to ask it here? Uh, sorry, because I'm I'm not actually sure how the sound is working. Hi. So Hi. Uh, I ask uh, for transformer models. So like when we're prompting a model, the context window is computationally expensive, while uh, your method of using continual learning from prompting uses part of the context window. So have you considered how well that would scale uh, or how well that scales, uh, let's say, for as we learn more tasks? So, yes. Uh, uh, so I, I would like to confirm that your question is about uh, whether we should uh, scale the model before or during incremental learning. During incremental learning, like us, I guess part of the context window, like mm -hmm. if we were let's say to maybe add uh, additional prompts as we learn tasks or as we increase the prompt, that would maybe not necessarily scale very well. Uh, that is kind of the direction my question is going towards. Um, so have you examined that or how well that applies or? Well, well, I, I think it's a very good question. Uh, we, we don't have examined it yet by ourselves, but I think it's a direction worth of a further examining, for further study. I mean, so it's a potential direction. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Yes. Sorry. I, I think um, that's the, the the time. The time. So we need to um, <laughs> move on to the to the next talk. But yeah. Thanks again um, uh, a lot, well, for both for uh, for sending us the talk and for for joining us uh, on the. And, and thanks uh, for organizing the journey. workshop. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Okay. Um, and and oh yeah. And so again, kind of as as with all other speakers, um, if if people still have questions that couldn't be asked um, during this Q and A, uh, you can always post them on on the rocket chat um, or, or or email uh, the, the the presenter directly. Um, okay. Um, I think Amir. And, um, okay. How much time do I
Okay. And then if you need to go to the okay. when do we need to demo? Okay. Um, First, can, this one is like this, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, I yeah. guess, yeah, oh, that's good. Um, yes, yeah, wait, let me. Thanks. Um, okay, I jumped. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, sorry, I was gonna. Um, okay. Um, so um, we've got now the the last um, oral presentation uh, of today, the the first one. Um, so it's uh, it's Amir and Nazemi uh, from uh, the University of Waterloo uh, here here in Canada, uh, and he's he's going to present the paper. Uh, CL POS 23, a long video object segmentation data set for computer okay. learning. A long title. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Amir from University of Waterloo. And um, so last week I defended my PhD on the, with the title of Continuing Learning and Video Object Segmentation. Uh, so um, uh, this is the overall structure of this, this presentation. I'll start the introduction, the proposed data set. A proposed baseline and a wrap up my presentation with um, a conclusion and experiment results. Um, we know who, what is continual learning, and we're tired of hearing about this maybe today. Uh, but I want to, to talk about video object segmentation. So, video object segmentation is like the goal of video object segmentation is to extract an object from the background in every frame of video. And like there, is, there are three tracks for video object segmentation. Uh, unsupervised, semi-supervised, and interactive VOS. So I'm focusing on semi-supervised VOS. When in one frame of video, um, the grand truth is given to the model. Okay. Uh, but uh, I want to mention uh, what I've, 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 I've observed is that all challenges of continual learning are placed in uh, like an online VOS. So first of all is online learning. There are online VOS methods, a solution, and a part of the model is going to be trained on a memory online. So it's online learning, uh, learning with, with limited memory and, and computational uh, complexity. IID assumption is not valid for video data. And uh, the mo most important that like, it is a real world scenario. So we heard about like, like uh, continuous learning scenario are not that much practical, but like, VOS, there are tons of applications for VOS, such as like augmented reality, um, uh, autonomous driving, and robotics. So, so the goal of this presentation is formulating online VOS as a continual learning problem. We'll see how. And uh, provide uh, a, a continual learning uh, uh, based uh, VOS data set for, for, for evaluating uh, Online view online online VOS online video and uh, continuous learning problem, and also I want to uh, propose a baseline uh, on the proposed data set. Uh, VOS uh, data sets are divided into two categories of data sets: short video data set, like many of like solution like current solution online matching based solution are working on short video uh, VOS data set. And what does it mean short? It means that like the average number of frames per video is like 60 frames. And like it, it, it would be like two or three uh, like minutes video each for each video. Uh, so uh, like you see three examples of uh, Davis 2016 data set. Um, and, and like there is a gradual change on the object in the video. However, for long video data set, so the average number of frames per video is like thousands. Like for example, this top two thousand, like four four hundred, and and then you you'll see that, that there are kind of different distribution drift in each video that like makes that problem challenging. Uh, so what I've uh, proposed here a new data set. So I extended the previous data set to CLVOS, it would have nine videos. Uh, and, and also I annotated the video based on the continual learning uh, like concept, because like previously 
they just randomly, oh, no, sorry, uniformly select uh, the annotated uh, like frame for video. But I look at the like sub chunks and distribution drift that happens in video. So I selected the first frame and one frame in the middle of each chunk as a like uh, a, a good like evaluation uh, frame for uh, for 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 evaluating the online viewers. So uh, so this is the, the the data set like the the details of the data set. The three uh, like first. Uh, uh, videos are from long video videos data set. The long video is the name of data set, but I've, I've added like six more videos, double the number of uh, like uh, annotated frames and also number of frames. Let's go to problem formulation. This is the overall structure of online views. So, uh, so this, this structure would be a train offline. Sorry, I'm not there. Uh, uh, on a video in an evaluation time, uh, but uh, 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 sorry, in the in training in training time, but in evaluation time, all part of the model is fixed uh, except the C part that you see there is target model, which is going to be uh, trained online on memory, which is like a sliding window over video. So I have an online learning on the video in the in the evaluation time, and like. And that, that's the loss function that they have for updating the target model. Um, but like uh, inspired from like EWC classic uh, solution for CL, uh, I'm wondering how can I improve the performance of online VOS uh, inspired by like, for example, EWC MAS. So I've added a, a kind of regularization, regularizer to, uh, to this, this pipeline. To, to keep the like uh, and preserve important parameters of model training on. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, previous, uh, 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 previous update. So, so that's, that's what I've added to the, to the pipeline it is not uh, like, up, uh, like I, I haven't changed any part of the model, just adding a regularization term to the last function of uh, uh, target model. Okay. Uh, I've selected LWL as an online VOS baseline and added that regularization. So you'll see it improves the performance of online VOS on the long video data set and the proposed data set. Just adding EWC concept. And it wouldn't like uh, decrease the performance of model on short video data set, but if it, if it doesn't have online uh, like continual learning challenges. Uh, for so for con uh, conclusion, I propose a new data set formulated online VOS as a continual learning problem, uh, uh, which which doesn't like affect like uh, doesn't have a negative effect on short videos. So I'm gonna play. Oh, okay. Uh, a, a demo. It's it's one one of the video. Oh no, it's, that's that one. So it's uh kind of compare LWL with oh, okay with LWL proposed method with EWC, and that XMAM is a state of the art in uh VOS in twenty twenty two. Uh, so that's the given uh, video, and the goal is to segment the auto. And it's a long video, it's not like two, three second videos. Okay, I'm gonna, doesn't show that. So it, it doesn't look so here. Uh, Okay. okay. You want to play now? Yeah. Okay. If, if a model would be like uh, offered from others, it would be placed in a uh, orange rectangle. So you'll see, for example, here uh, the proposed method and baseline, like 
is doing better job at than ASMEM. But, and this is long video with different like distribution drift, like changing camera from like different. Uh, and the only thing that is given to the model is the first frame annotation. So, uh, and then like, for example, here, none of the models can segment the object, but, uh, and then like here, for example, a baseline would fail to, to segment the object, but there is a moment that only the proposed method can uh, segment the object, for example, here. Uh, yeah. And, uh, So that, right? Okay, thank you. And I had a joke about continuing learning, but that's for free, I forgot. Any question? Thank you. Um, Yeah. Um, so, um, so, yeah, you focus on new um, tapes. Uh, new data, yeah. new learning. Um, that makes videos. Um, and um, so I was wondering, in terms of, uh, so this is a lot of realistic or actual model and I was wondering to what extent do your findings um, in terms of what's model? Well, different from. Uh, uh, the findings on, on, on the yeah, so, so, you, so I have to say that, that that's like obviously practical, first of all. The task doesn't have boundary, second. And also it's online continuing learning. And so those are the things that like we were, we were looking for, for, I don't know, for a long time, right? And it has like, this data set has those things a lot. Okay, so, um, uh, I, I I would like I would say that, but I don't know, like what else can you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, but, but what I meant. But, um, so so I can, I can see how the effects are different. Ones. Yes. Uh, in terms of um, so so that's now using this benchmark, what different insights can you get from the insights that we were able to get in the the smaller data set? So actually, like the model, yeah, yeah, God, thanks. Uh, that that's actually a good question. So it's 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 very practical in, in terms of a research also, like because like the the target model that I've I've chosen uh, to add that constant to is just a two layer convolutional neural network, and so it's it's very practical to work on with that, and all. Um, so I haven't uh, my my focus was what on VOS. However, like, like the, the data set is publicly available. So you can provide some metric, the continual learning metric and do evaluation, other terms of evaluation. But, but more, like the, the, the evaluation metric that I've used was like J and F, which are standard evaluation metric in video object segmentation. Uh, so it's possible to, to define um, like other metrics, continue learning metrics, such as forgetting uh, for, for this data as well. We have a question on the way you can see. We have a question from Zoom. Right. Uh, yes. Would it be used to, uh, for target tagging using aerial images from yes. uh, UAV? Like, uh, yes. Like, yes. So what what uh, like in in like my future work I would say this this problem formulation can be extended to um, object tracking video object tracking uh, person re identification uh, yes it is possible because like they are all uh, sharing the same challenges yes once you have an online uh, model training on on those uh, like data set yes. Thank you. No problem. Okay.
Uh, great, thanks, Sophie. Uh, no problem. Just, just Um, okay, um, so um, then we're um, yeah almost that's the, the the last part of the of the workshop and um, so so these are now the uh, the challenge presentations. Um, so the, um, the 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 main organizer of the challenge, uh, Hamid Himati, uh, uh, unfortunately he he was not able to uh, to to join the the workshop in person, uh, but he has um, he has prepared a, a video for us uh, to uh, yeah to sort of introduce and describe the. Uh, the, the challenge um, and then um, so that will be about eight or ten minutes I think uh, and then after that um, so he will just sort of set out the the, the, the idea behind the challenge and the, and the rules uh, and then after that we will have um, four different uh, five minute presentations uh, from the, uh, the the four teams that uh, that performed best on this challenge and they will explain um, what what strategy what approach they used uh, to uh, to perform so well, uh, but uh, but yeah, I need to find the the videos first. Uh, yeah, Okay, uh, there we go. Hi everyone, my name is Hamad Hamati. I'm one of the organizers of this year's Seal Vision Challenge. In this video presentation, I'm going to briefly explain the challenge and also give you some information about the team participation and final results. After this presentation, we will have the presentations of the finalist teams. This challenge was organized by Lorenzo Pellegrini from University of Bologna and myself from University of St. Gallen. The main goal of this challenge was to design novel strategies for a class of continual learning scenarios, which we refer to as class incremental with repetition. The scenario type has two main properties. The first property is that Previously observed classes can reappear in new experiences with arbitrary repetition patterns. And the second one is that each experience can contain new, old, or a combination of new and old patterns. This means that instances that were shown previously can be reused again in a new experience. The stream generator that we use for this challenge has four control parameters. The first control parameter is the stream length, which indicates the number of experiences in the stream. The second control parameter is the experience size, which is the number of patterns or instances in each experience. The third one is the first occurrence distribution, which is a discrete probability distribution over the stream. This control parameter shows in which parts of the stream we have higher probability of uh, first occurrence and in, in which parts we have a lower probability of first occurrence. 
And the last one is the repetition probability, which is a per class repetition probability. This can be fixed or dynamic. Here we can see an example stream generated by the generator. The number of experiences in this stream is equal to 50, and the number of samples in each experience is equal to 2,000. The probability of first occurrence is a geometric distribution with a p-factor of 0 0.3. And as we can see um, on the left side, um, at the bottom, uh, the probability of first occurrence decreases over time as we go towards the end of the stream. This means that at the beginning of the stream, there is a higher probability of first occurrence. We can see on the right side that most of the classes appear for the first time at the beginning of the stream. And the probability of repetition after the first occurrence is equal to 0 0.2 for all classes. One more important point here is that each experience contains a data set. So a strategy is allowed to take the data set and use it as it wants. So it can iterate through the data set for an arbitrary number of times and augment its samples or even remove uh, unwanted samples from the uh, experience data set. As long as the strategy uh, does not exceed the restrictions set for the, for the challenge. In terms of hardware usage, participants were allowed to use only one GPU for training. The maximum GPU memory usage was set to 4000 megabytes and the maximum training time was set to 500 minutes. Since the main focus of this challenge was on designing novel strategies, we set the data set as Cypher 100. The users were allowed to use uh, buffers for for um, storage, however, they were not allowed to use raw samples or the dataset samples directly. They could use other information such as features extracted from the model, and the maximum number of items was set to 200. The base model used for this challenge was set to ResNet 18. However, adding new modules was allowed in this uh, challenge. This means that the users could extend their model as in dynamic architectures, but they were not allowed to use um, different types of models. Using model replicas was also allowed, um, so um, users could also use model ensembles with, with exactly the same architecture type, which was the reduced rest of 18. This challenge had two phases. In the first phase, which was the pre-selection phase, we first gave the participants three different streams with three different configurations and they were supposed to run their strategies over these streams to obtain accuracies over each stream and we used the average of those accuracies on the test set after running their strategies over those streams for ranking the teams. So in the pre-selection phase, we had the pre-selection ranking, which was open from the 20th of March till the 20th of May. After the pre-selection phase, we took the top five teams and asked the top five teams to send us their solutions. We then ran their codes on three novel streams for evaluations, and then we used the uh, average accuracy over, over those three new streams for the final ranking. The total number of registered teams was 98, and out of those 98 teams, 50 teams had at least one solution, one submission. And here we can see the number of submissions and the, uh, the maximum accuracy uh, at each day. And we can see that the number of submissions was almost gradually increasing over time and we had a kind of a performance maximum average accuracy leap at around 16th of May from 30% to almost 40%.
And here I'm showing the pre-selection phase uh, leaderboard and you can see that the maximum average accuracy obtained was 44%. So we took the first five teams in this pre-selection phase and then we ran their codes on the novel streams. And finally we have the final ranking. As you can see the first team had an average accuracy of 62%, the second one 45.2, the third one 41.11, and the fourth team had an average accuracy of 40.91. One of the teams decided not to participate in the final evaluation of the challenge. Each team will present their solutions individually after this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, um, so so great. Thank, thanks, Hamad, for the introduction. Um, so perhaps so so um, I don't think Hamad is is online. I think it's in the middle of the night for him. Um, but yeah, if if there are any questions that people would like to ask, I think I can maybe answer them as well. Um, but if there's not, then we just go to the um, to the presentations of, of the four teams. Uh, and I think we're um, we're gonna start with the um, the, the 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 team that uh, that won the the challenge. So we're gonna start with the first and second, third, and fourth. Um, but but yeah, I, I think for for all of the different teams, I think it's interesting to see sort of the approach they took. Uh, because yeah, so if, so all of these teams were um, um, performed very well. Um, because out of the 50 teams, these four were selected for uh, the final phase. Um, uh, so, okay. Um, oh yeah, um, so can I ask, um, I think, um, so the uh, team from, Mark Masana, um, you're you're going to do the presentation live, um, right? That's and and I think there's um, there was at least one other team that had a representative here as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but indeed, um, you you are representative of the team that that got the first place in the end, right? Yeah. So but so I'll I'll play the audio. Uh, but then if there's questions, um, I think, yeah. Okay, so so indeed, so for the, the, this first presentation, um, so I'm going to play the presentation, but if you've got questions, there's a representative from the team. Hello, and thank you to the host and everyone tuning. My name is Xiaoting Duan, joined by Zixuan Zhao and Fang Pangxia from the University of Chicago. This challenge has been an enriching experience for us, and we are excited to share our work with you. So let's dive right in. Our method involves around HAT, which is a short for hard attention to the task. HAT deals with the issue of catastrophic forgetting by masking the weights that are not assigned to the current task during the back propagation. Essentially, it allows us to divide a model into task specific sub models, each one dedicated to a unique task or experience. In the past, HAT has been deployed with a fairly low number of tasks. Uh, in this challenge, however, we have the 50 tasks, yet the first convolutional layer has only 20 channels. So to deal with this issue, we modify the original hat by altering the initialization and the scaling curve of the masks. We divided our training into two phases for each experience. The first phase is supervised contrastive learning. It's a representation learning with a contrastive loss function that does two things simultaneously. It pulls the embedding of the same class close to each other, and it pushes the embedding of different classes apart. The second phase is class classification. 
but only in the classes of the current experiences are getting trained. All replay samples uh, was classified as out of distribution, and we treated them as an extra class. So our model, given the extra experience ID, can only generate the logics of the class classes that are present in that experience. Therefore, during the prediction, we have to go through multiple experiences to gather the logics of all the classes. Initially, we believe that the latest experiences being trained with more data would give us better logics. But this is not always the case. At times, the logics from the previous experiences are proved to be very helpful. Consequently, we adopted a momentum-based approach that utilizes the last three experiences for every logic of a class. Additionally, since our model has trained with the data augmentation, we also apply the test time augmentation. So far, everything we have covered is single model, no replicas. Uh, our replica approach was implemented on top of the single model approach. It has two types of replicas. The first is called fragments, which is a technique to break down the whole learning stream into the chunks of uh, consecutive experiences. The second type is uh, called ensemble. Ensembles are essentially identical models initialized with different weights. They operate independently, but share the same computational graph. These two types of replicas are orthogonal to each other, allowing us to have uh, any combination of fragments and ensembles simultaneously. Now, here are the results for our ablation study conducted without replicas. The performance of the single model baseline was solid, considering that the head model has very limited number of channels to work with. The original head, on, uh, on the other hand, did struggle with this limitation and performs much worse compared to the baseline. We have also investigated the, the, uh, investigated the effect of replay. The replay embeddings are selected with the k-means algorithm. Unfortunately, their approach had negative impact on the results. Both test time augmentation and the momentum-based approach for collecting logics proved to be very effective. Now let's take a look at the results with the replicas. As you can see, more fragments and more ensembles did to better performance, which is somewhat expected. Especially the model with more fragments performs significantly better. It justifies the hypothesis that the number of training, trainable parameters is the major obstacle for this challenge. We have also tested out the, some of the wider ResNet models and observed significant improvement compared to the baseline. Uh, our team is deeply grateful to have this opportunity to participate in this challenge, which has been an invaluable learning experience. Thank you to the host and all of you who have taken the time to watch our presentation. If there's any question or if you're interested in further discussion, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And thank you once again. Um, okay, so um, if there are any questions for this team, um, there is someone that could answer them. Uh, yes, yes, I think. Uh, for you want to talk out of curiosity, right? Um, I don't know if I did all of it once. Um, did you modify the task because that requires the task ID uh, during the test time? The original task ID and test time require the, the task ID and test time. So, how did you, because it was not clear in here, how we modified it to not need the task ID? Right. And the original paper, something. What was the case? Yeah, in the original paper, um, uh, had was not used for um, task implementation. Uh, so for our um, simulation, um, in that time we don't use uh, that. We instead we just uh, enumerate all the possible task and see which one um, gives us the highest uh, that how um, we determine the um, identity of the task. We also modified the original task in terms of how um, we um, control the learning traits because time essentially is a, has a learnable gating function. 
for these different ways. The problem with that is that they have a, a learning schedule that affects the liquidifying early in the learning um, stage. In our case, we have a cyclical learning way. So we uh, switch and we can replace and we know that the, 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 the common of these kind of uh, lot numbers. The second question would be that uh, if the core of the you were having uh, examples of you have an accurate model ensemble because it was still needed an example of two, and I don't know if I understand that as an accurate model. This is a hundred percent of the Yes, and they keep all in memory at the same time. Right. Um, yeah, so it didn't occur to us at all to use um, so, uh, all the models in the case uh, of uh, So then we realized we are how to do the use of model models. So we just came up with a tip to weather that. So we know that the individual model, um, then the model model is just uh, the regular option. The same model we visualize them to get an average comparison. So we have 50 individual models that we call random and two ensemble ones to get an average. So that is actually a useful way uh, by a hundred votes. I want to use the model performance, but it doesn't seem to be a natural use of that. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, um, okay, so then um, I think we're gonna uh, continue with the, uh, the presentation of the of the the, the second team. Um, so um, so this is uh, I think the, the in the presentation they changed the, the name of that team, but it's uh, uh, in the uh, in the rankings that uh, that Habet um, talked about. Uh, this is Team Lins. Hello everyone, thanks for coming to this talk. I'm Xinjie Yao from Tianjin University. Today, I'm going to present our method called Expansion and Interaction for Class Incremental Learning with Repetition. Our team is from Tianjin University. Currently, benchmarks for continual learning often use a very specific type of stream in which each experience is only seen once and with no overlap between the experiences. They do not reflect the arbitrary non-stationarity that can be observed in the real world. Here are three mainstream types of continual learning tasks, but these tasks do not contain any repetition. To explore the significance of repetition and its relevance for developing novel strategies, class incremental with repetition encompass a variety of streams with three key characteristics. Arbitrary repetition, not all classes appear every time, and a different class number in each task. Here are different examples of generated streams by changing the first occurrence control parameter. To overcome the challenges of class incremental learning, a critical perspective is how to prevent catastrophic forgetting. Replay-based methods are affected by the number and quality of previously stored samples. Regularization-based methods' ability on consolidating previous knowledge is very limited in the case of imbalance class number. Parameter isolation methods dedicate different parameters to each task, which lack the knowledge interaction among different models. We propose EI, a novel parameter isolation method, via expansion and interaction. Here is a diagram illustrating the architecture of our approach, specifically to achieve better model integration, we align the classifiers to maintain the same energy level obtained by the model in different training phases. 
To address the issue of sample efficiency, we propose to use self-supervised learning to capture more general and discriminative representations, thus improving generalization performance. Mixup is also used to improve the efficiency of sample utilization. Additionally, we establish a shared prompt pool to facilitate interaction between different tasks and categories, promoting knowledge fusion. We conduct experiments on CIFAR 100 dataset. We evaluate our method on three configs. Considering the whole model size and training time, we also skip those experiences with few categories and collect 200 samples in the memory buffer for the next training stage. We performed ablation experiments on S1, S2, and S3 based on our pre-designed expanding model. The results show that each component of our method has a beneficial effect on the final performance. As shown in this table, Without allowing classifiers, the accuracy dropped by 1.26% on average compared with our method, indicating that allowing the energy level of each classifier obtained in different training stages can achieve better model integration. Without prompt component, the accuracy dropped by 1.23% on average representing that prompt is necessary for promoting the knowledge fusion of different tasks and categories. Without self-supervised learning, the accuracy dropped by 1.77% on average. This may be because self-supervised learning can help learn more general and discriminative representations, leading to better generalization performance. To sum up, we propose EI, a novel parameter isolation method via expansion and interaction, and the TGU MLDM ranked the second place on the pre-selection phase of the fourth CL Vision challenge. Thanks for listening. Um, okay, um, so we go, uh, we continue with the third team, and that one is going to be live. Oh, that's your slides. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, hi, we are the team that got third place. We are Benedict, who is here. He is a very promising master student. So he has to finish his master thesis by basically submitting this <laughs> as uh, his final report. Um, so if any of you wants to make an offer to him, you can break my heart and ask him to do a PhD. Eduardo, who could not make it here because of the visa. And, and uh, I will talk a bit more general, like the idea that we went into the challenge was uh, basically me offering Benedict for, for trying a couple of ideas uh, within the month that the challenge was available. And our main idea was within this stability plasticity dilemma that we always see in continual learning, we really like zero forgetting methods as the first, um, as the winners of the challenge also, I mean, had this towards zero forgetting if you make the gates completely binary, right? So we liked a lot zero forgetting. So we were trying to balance both 
stability and plasticity, but with a high bias towards stability. And the way that we do it is that the core idea is that um, whenever we receive a new experience, we would try to see if it's an experience worth learning. And if it's worth learning, then we will train a fitter structure to extract the most representative and discriminative features out of it. And I'll explain how in a moment. And if it was not uh, necessary to train uh, the fitter structure, then we will just keep it and we will go directly to the plasticity part, the method, which is the pseudo fitter projection, which I will also talk in a moment. So, how do we choose when do we train a fitter structure? We basically messed around with a few heuristics and the two that seem to be responding better to to our validation tests uh, were these ones. And these are the ones that we ended up sticking with. So whenever we have a new experience, if it doesn't have more than five classes, we would not train, no, we will not try to learn them at the same time. The reason for that was both because of the memory size, like we do not want to end up with too many theater structures. Uh, actually, we end up with very little amount, like uh, in the end and what we expected. And also because of the overfitting, you would have a fitter structure that is actually not discriminative and representative. So in general, we didn't want to do that uh, for those ones. And then we also kept track of which classes we had seen and therefore which classes were already represented in a robust space. So whenever we had seen 85% of the classes, then we would stop getting more fitter structures in because in our experience with sidebar like data sets, and specifically Cypher 100, when you have these super classes and so on, you have enough representative and discriminative features to go by at that point. So with these heuristics, here we see a representation of what would end up being on test time, let's say, um, the experiences in which we would um, learn a fitter structure. So in the end, it's always less than 10 fitter structures. Um, that managed to get representative and diverse enough fitters to solve the task. Okay, we have these feature structures, or we decided to train them. How do we do that? Well, with care, but um, basically, what we do is we um, use the trick that we learned from out of distribution detection. So we do not only have a cross entropy head for the feature structure because that enforces very ortho or to normal um, distribution of the classes on the top space. So what we did is we added a cross entropy head for the current experience, but also a metric learning head, which tries to bring the um, similar images from the same class into n-dimensional balls. And this has a, an extra effect that we will see in a moment, but basically the metric learning was a contrastive learning with our negative pairs. Um, once we would train this feeder structure, we would chop the heads, keep only the feeder structure to get the representation, which is actually what we wanted. And we freeze that feeder structure and don't touch it again. It's good at what it knows. It's non the wiser about the things that it doesn't know. And then what happens is that we end up with a bunch of experts on certain classes, right? So we have a few, an ensemble of fitter structures that are good at certain classes, but know nothing about the rest of the world. So we need to align them all together. And this is what the pseudo fitter projection gets. And we basically got inspiration from Fedril, a, a paper that came up relatively recently. And we extended it a bit because they were doing it in a different setting than this one. So it needed a bit of, of changes. And basically the idea that you can think is that the projection means that whenever you pass, um, yes, whenever you pass um, a new uh, uh, class, you would be able to transform it from that class into hallucinating it into another class. And with that trick, we were managing to align all of the outputs of the ensembles and then these generated uh, a problem with how to calculate the, the means that if you're interested, we can discuss later, but there was one solution that looked better than the rest. And now that we have access to the test data, we even see at which spots was uh, actually offering this benefit. 
And when you put together everything that you've seen, we basically got third place. Um, we are very happy. We are also apparently ambitious on scenario three. So if this competition was only on scenario three, we are also very happy to announce <laughs> our point. Thank you. Any questions? Maybe. Right, because I think we're a bit behind time. Um, so then um, let's let's go with the the presentation of the last team. Uh, and so this was the fourth team in the in the final evaluation. Uh, but interestingly, the the first team in the pre-selection phase. Hello everyone, we are a team from Nanjing University of Aeronautics and Astronautics, and we are delighted to be here to present our strategy. Initially, we tried various methods, including prototype replay and knowledge distillation, and so on. However, their performance was limited. In the last few days, we explored model ensemble. Our approach bears some resemblance to this work called DER, Dynamically Extendable Re Representation. It is indeed a model ensemble architecture that uses replay buffers to show samples, so it is not suitable for this competition. And it also has some drawbacks such as simultaneous prediction by all branches, resulting in excessive computational complexity. To address this, we design sketch units control the activation of each branch. In this competition, we simply added a new branch with, with each new experience and activated it while freezing the model parameters in the old branches. During the training phase, we did not employ any specific loss design. We also did not use any replay buffers. Okay. In contrast, we well, simply I, I don't think this is very useful. To uh, the, model. the only um, noteworthy aspect is that we used AugMix, a special data augmentation method to improve the model's general... Let, uh, let, let me try one more time. But... AugMix combines different data augmentation techniques. Maybe it's my computer again. Hello everyone, we are a team from Nanjing University of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Um, okay, uh, yeah, I propose, um, so so we hope um, that we can put these videos of, of all the different teams on the, on, on the, on the website of the, of the challenge if, if they get permission. Um, so uh, yeah, um, I guess we'll, we'll hope that they're okay with that and then everyone can, uh, can see this video hopefully in a correct way on the website. Um, okay, um, so so then we're at the end of the of, of the workshop. So there's gonna be some um, some closing remarks by by Paul. Uh, but first, um, sort of to, to finish off the challenge, I wanna um, I wanna ask representative of the of the two teams um, that that are here um, to uh, well receive their certificate. Um, and um, and so um, as as we uh, um, said in the beginning of the of the at the workshop um, for uh, the, uh, the 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 team that finished um, uh, top in the in the final evaluation, um, there's also uh, uh, an, an award. Um, so uh, uh, Matrix AI um, at the University of, of Texas in San Antonio um, has has sponsored the workshop and has um, uh, provided uh, five hundred US dollars for. Uh, as, as sponsor money for this price. Uh, I have to say, unfortunately, um, there's a bit of an issue of sort of 
so the money is there, but we can't, they can't pay the recipients directly. And so it has to go in another way. And, and uh, yeah, we're investigating how to do that, but it seems not the entire amount will be payable. Uh, but but it's, yeah, it should be at least a, a few hundreds, a few hundred dollars. Uh, the exact amount um, will be communicated later. Uh, and and so uh, as I said, it's it's sponsored by uh, uh, by Matrix AI from the University of of Texas at San Antonio. Um, okay, so with that, um, uh, yeah, please come. Um, okay, so maybe um, Mark, you wanna you, you wanna you wanna do? Uh, it's gonna be uh, oh, then, yeah, yeah, cool. Come, come. We don't have the champagne in the body. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you're mad, you're mad all you can. Uh, um, okay, so. Okay, uh, congratulations, well done. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, and this one. Okay, congratulations. And, and, and yeah, so, uh, as I said, so we're still working out the details of how to get well, at least yeah. some of the money to you. Uh, yeah, so sorry about that. Yeah, we can be more specific. Well done. Um, okay, and then uh, the well, the final closing remarks are uh, going to be by, by Pau. Um, shall I share? Yeah, share the slides there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, but I'll, I'll I'll just start here. But I yeah, don't know. have some some suspense. Suspense. Okay, so yeah, so you, you okay. go from here, right? So it's, it's, it's on there, so you can't actually see them. Okay, so it's okay. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, they're on the tools now. Okay, so this will be short. Some last words to close the workshop. Uh, we are very happy and impressed uh, by the engagement of the people, the quality of the talks, and uh, also the submissions. It's made it actually par particularly difficult to decide on a best paper award, but uh, we had to choose one and we reached a consensus. So the best paper award, which is uh, sponsored by Apple and it's consists on an iPad, will be to uh, Lama Alston uh, for the work on Joseph Lynch. Can she come to the stage? So remember to send us an email uh, to talk about like the, well, how to deliver the, the iPad. We don't have it here. Yeah, it will be sent by regular, regular mail. Yeah. Um, yeah, and finally, just thanks again to uh, all the organizers that made this possible. I was going to make the joke to put like the picture of like an item organizer. But in the end, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, also thanks a lot for the speakers. Uh, we found all the talks uh, super interesting. And also, uh, some of them made a great panel. So, uh, very happy about that. And that's it. Hopefully, see you all uh, next year in 
I don't know where it will be, <laughs> but in CBP or something. Where? In Seattle. Okay. Cool. Never been there. So thanks. Is the, the Zoom is closed? Uh, no, no, it isn't closed. But I don't find that window. Uh, yes, I heard that we are the Foundation and Models Workshop. Is it this one? The workshop on foundation models.